W.F. Howes presents an unabridged recording of The Secret of the Lady's Maid by Darcy Wilde Narrated by Ruth Redman Prologue A bad business Then it must be treason, and see it I must, by all that's good or by all that's bad. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda London, February 1820 Adam Harkness stood in the shadow of a slouching, half-timbered house. The tiny alley around him, which went by the name of Cato Street, was dark and quiet. The noise from the nearby pubs and gin shops oozed between its close-packed buildings, but no sound rose from the alley itself. Its few soot-smudged houses had all been tightly shuttered against the raw February night, it was easy to imagine the folk inside tucked up in their quilts and sound asleep. He'd had some luck for his vigil. The moon was near full and the sky unusually clear, which meant he had a fair bit of light to see by. But it also meant it was unusually cold and the needle-sharp February air pressed hard against his skin. Adam shifted his weight slightly to try to keep his feet from going numb but kept his attention on the stable across the way. A flickering lantern showed through the hayloft's crooked shutters. Every few seconds, a passing shadow blotted out the faint light. That told Adam that, unlike the rest of the alley, somebody remained awake in that loft. In fact, if he'd counted correctly, roughly twenty somebodies were busy as bees in there. But busy with what? There's the question. They'd each arrived singly. They were all men but other than that they'd been a ragged, varied bunch. One wore a cobbler's leather apron, one was a black gentleman dressed in a frock coat who could have been a clergyman or a schoolmaster, one wore a coat so tattered it hardly deserved the name. They'd scuttled down the street with their collars turned up and their hats pulled low. When they stepped up to the stable door, they looked about carefully before slipping inside. Left to himself, Adam might have decided they were a group of petty thieves and pickpockets. But according to his superiors at Bow Street, the cobbler, the schoolmaster, the tattered man, and all the rest in that shuttered loft were bent on nothing less than high treason. Just this morning, Adam had been called into John Townsend's opulent private office, along with Stephen Lavender, Sam Torton, and Sampson Gautier. Gautier was the only patrol captain present. He was an expert navigator of the tangled world that was London after dark, and the only reason he had not yet been made a principal officer was that Parliament only authorised eight such men to serve at a time. John Townsend's agitation was made plain by the way he had paced for a full moment behind his broad desk before speaking a single word. These men intend to murder the entire Privy Council when they sit down to dinner in Grosvenor Street, he'd said. His Grace, the Earl of Harrowby, Lord President of the Privy Council, was stopped in Hyde Park by a man calling himself Hyden. This Hyden gave His Grace a full outline of their plot. And His Grace believed this fantasy? Gautier had asked incredulously. His Grace had good reason to believe it, snapped Townsend. It is now for us to act on the matter. How could these men even know about a ministerial dinner? asked Lavender. He was a narrow man with a long face and strict ideas about law and order. He and Adam had butted heads more than once. It's published in the papers, said Townsend. One of their number saw the notice. Surely said Adam, the first thing to do is make sure that this Hyden is telling the truth. Where can we find him? But apparently his grace had neglected to ask that. Hyden had delivered his warning and disappeared. He thought, however, that Hyden could be one of the cowmen who pastured their animals on the green. The argument over how to proceed lasted half an hour. Gautier and Sam Torton agreed with Adam that they needed to find Hyden and make sure this report was accurate. Lavender, on the other hand, 
argued that they couldn't waste the time. If we hesitate, we could wake up to a revolution in the streets. We need to arrest these men at once. It'll be safer all around. Townsend had agreed with Lavender, but Adam stood his ground. If it turns out this report is a mistake or madness, Bow Street will look like fools, he said. And when the newspapers get hold of it, they will mock his grace and us for jumping at shadows. The argument worked, at least in part. Townsend saw it as his duty to protect Bow Street's reputation as well as the King's peace. So he reluctantly agreed to allow Adam to find out what he could. However, he also declared no men would be spared for the mission. Adam was entirely on his own. Now, standing in the cold and the dark, Adam had to admit something was happening in that hayloft. But if it was some dread and murderous conspiracy, the participants were remarkably sloppy. The man he'd sent to the stable door to test the waters had walked right in. And that was over two hours ago. Adam had heard no sounds of a struggle or other commotion. In fact, all he heard now was the rhythmic call of the watch. Two of the clock and all's well. Two of the clock and all's well. Christ, I hope it is. Adam let his breath out slowly. The vapour rose in front of his eyes, shining silver in the moonlight. The plan was not anywhere near as strong as he'd have liked, but they had no time to come up with anything better. The ministerial dinner was in two days. At least it would have been if it had not already been cancelled. This particular turn of events, however, had not been reported to the newspapers. The watchman's call faded away. Adam waited, measuring time by the beating of his heart, the shadows passing this way and that in the hayloft, and the slow deadening of all sensation in his toes and fingertips. At last the stable door dragged itself open. Adam willed himself to stillness. His eyes had adapted well enough to the dark that he could make out the shadow of a tall, lean man as he slipped from the darkness. The man glanced at the sky to gauge the weather. Then he hunched his back against the knife-edged wind that sliced through the alley and scurried away. Adam gave himself a count of thirty to see if anyone else would emerge to follow this man. But the stable door remained closed. Upstairs, the erratic shadows moved back and forth just as before. No shout rose. Adam pulled his hat brim lower, stuffed his hands into his pockets and set off after the tall man. Out on the main street he passed the doorway where Gautier kept watch and turned his collar up. That was the signal they'd agreed to. All was indeed well. He would meet them back at Bow Street. Townsend had not authorised any men to assist Adam in his vigil. Gautier and Torton had insisted on coming along anyway. At least if they were asked, they could truthfully say they had never gone into the alley. The further the tall man walked from Cato Street, the easier he moved. By the time he'd gone a quarter of a mile, his conspirator's scuttle had changed to the easy, swinging gait of a man without a care in the world. When the man reached the dappled mare carriage house, he rapped on the door. After a long moment, that door opened, and a boy emerged carrying a lantern. The man handed the boy a few coins and sent him running toward the stables. Some moments later, an enclosed carriage drawn by a pair of matched chestnuts was driven up to the door. The tall man climbed inside, but left the carriage door open. Adam took a last look about himself. Satisfied that he was not followed, he crossed the cobbles, climbed into the carriage and latched the door. The warmth from the footstove enfolded him like a blessing. The tall man pounded on the roof. As soon as the carriage lumbered forward, he drew off his slouching hat and cast it aside. Well, Mr Harkness, Sanderson Folks combed his fingers through his fair hair, I believe I must thank you for a most entertaining evening. When I write my memoirs, which I hasten to assure you will not be published until long after I have ceased to breathe, this will take a prominent place. Adam grinned. He'd made Folks's acquaintance several years ago. Since then, the man had given him some good help during more than one investigation. 
Volks was a confirmed member of the dandy set and made his living buying and selling art for London's upper crust. He also dabbled in money lending and was a merciless card sharp and was the first person Adam had thought of for this errand. Why me? Volks had asked. Because I trust you. Because you are deeply observant, but nobody in the neighbourhood is likely to know you. He remembered how Folks's smile had altered ever so slightly, as if to warn him not to make assumptions. If this lot are habitual criminals, they might spot a Bow Street man, Adam told him. And last but not least, I'm asking you, because if anyone finds out you went into that stable tonight, Townsend can't sack you for it. So, what did you see? Adam asked. Folks returned a thin smile. If the most honourable magistrates at Bow Street believe that hayloft houses a dangerous nest of radicals, they are entirely mistaken. What I saw was a half-deluded, half-desperate congregation of lost men. I walked in without challenge. I kept myself to a corner of the room for several fatiguing hours, and not one of them so much as asked my business. I had one confide to me that he only came to these meetings because there was always something to eat. Relief filled Adam, but it was not enough to entirely ease his suspicions. Why had the Earl of Harrowby been willing to believe that this gathering represented a real danger? Had they missed something? Were they armed? Adam asked. After a fashion, there were a handful of pikes, cutlasses and other such dangerous antiques, I had a look at one of their guns and would wager it would be as likely to blow up in the owner's hands as it would to fire. Still, if not opposed too firmly, they might pose some sort of danger to the residents of the alley. Did they talk at all about their plans? One fellow, Thistlewood, did. He was what passed as their ringleader. He assured the rest that they could easily storm Grosvenor Street and murder the cabinet. At the same time, parties of their men would also steal cannon from various armories and militia posts and throw up a series of barricades around the town. After this, they would form a provisional government, burn all the paper money and distribute the gold in the Bank of London to the poor. With twenty men, said Adam. Well, that point was somewhat in dispute. Thistlewood insisted that this gathering was only one small part of the larger rebellion, he said that another man by the name of Edwards had assured him there were tens of thousands ready to rise up all across London. Was Edwards in the hayloft? No, said Folks. nor did anyone seem to expect him. I don't know that it signifies, but it struck me as an additional oddity. Adam nodded. Thank you, Mr. Folks. I'm in your debt. What will you do now? I'll report back to Mr. Burney and Mr. Townsend. With any luck, what you've observed will be enough to soothe the fears of His Grace and the Privy Council. Then we can round these men up quietly, charge them with being a public nuisance on a cold night, and be done with it. And if you can't? Mr. Folks inquired. Then God help those half-desperate, half-deluded men, said Adam, because the charge on their heads will be high treason, and every last one of them will finish up dead. Chapter 1. Market Day I have nothing worse than folly to conceal. That's bad enough. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda London, April 1820 Oh, not again, muttered Alice Littlefield, as the fresh round of raindrops pattered down onto the market cobbles. I was sure we were done for the day. Wishful thinking, I'm afraid, sighed Rosalind. All around them, the market's patrons put up their hoods or scuttled for shelter. Barrow keepers and stall merchants hurried to pull canvas and oilcloths over their goods. Thankfully, Rosalind and Alice stood under the bookseller's awning. Alice had spent the past several minutes engaged in a spirited attempt to convince Mr. Frazier to reduce the price on his somewhat battered copy of History of a Six Weeks Tour by sixpence. Rosalind's decision to accompany Alice and Amelia on the morning's errands had been largely impulse. London's glittering social season would begin in another fortnight. 
and Rosalind was finding herself increasingly wrapped up in her role as what Alice termed a discreet social consultant for London's haute ton. As a young woman, Rosalind had expected adulthood to bring her a good marriage. This would naturally be followed by a pleasing domestic existence as a wife, hostess and mother. But when her father abandoned their family, all those expectations shattered. With the help of her godmother, Rosalind had cobbled together a kind of existence as what society termed a useful woman, one who helped out her more fortunate friends by arranging their social lives, dealing with their correspondence and helping run their households. Most such ladies endured a depressed and dependent life, but Rosalind discovered she possessed a particular talent for assisting ladies in serious trouble, even when that trouble involved theft, blackmail or murder. What had begun as a haphazard means for an unmarried woman to eke out an existence had turned into a living. Now that living had shown distinct signs of becoming a success. In addition to a gratifying number of social invitations, Rosalind found herself with a thick stack of letters from ladies who wished to consult her about matters that ranged from promoting charitable entertainments to finding missing relatives. More such letters had arrived by this morning's post. It was all very promising, but it also meant a great many decisions needed to be made, detailed plans drawn up and extra help enlisted. It was dizzying. Rosalind found herself in need of a moment's pause, a morning out of doors perusing stalls, barrels and barrows in the market had seemed like the perfect solution. It also brought the possibility of seeing Adam Harkness. She'd sent a note to his mother's house, letting him know that she and Alice planned to be at Drummond's tea rooms at eleven o'clock, should Mrs Harkness and any member of her household care to join them. She had received an answer saying that Mrs Harkness was engaged but that Adam Harkness might well be found in Drummond's at that time. There, that's done. Alice tucked the book into her basket. She saw Rosalind's furrowed brow. Don't worry, she said. We'll be in plenty of time. Yes, yes, I know, said Rosalind hurriedly. It's just, well, I haven't been able to see Mr Harkness very often since... Since Cato Street, Alice finished for her softly. Rosalind nodded. Do you think he's still involved with the investigations? He hasn't been able to say much, but I am certain he is. All the more certain because he has said so little. Alice nodded. Well, whatever his part is, it can't last much longer. George says everyone agrees the trial must be soon and it's sure to be bedlam, she added. Well, that's only to be expected. They did plot to murder the entire Privy Council at dinner. Saying it out loud, the business sounded mad. In fact, Adam believed it was exactly that. Pure madness. However, the Privy Council, the magistrates at Bow Street, and even the Crown took the matter in deadly earnest. Therefore, the trial was going forward, and the charge would be high treason. Adam had been involved in many difficult cases and dealt with dangerous men, but this one felt different. As the time dragged on, Adam's humour had faded, and his silences had grown. So had his absences. I don't see Amelia anywhere, Alice interrupted Rosalind's brooding. Amelia McGowan was their housemaid. She was a stout, cheerful, ginger-haired young woman who had proved to be an able assistant to Rosalind in several of her more unusual consultations. Amelia knows to meet us at the tea rooms, Rosalind said. In answer, Alice wrinkled her nose at the rain. But Rosalind saw real worry in her eyes. Is something the matter? Alice shrugged. Amelia's been off the past fortnight or so. I'm sure you've noticed. Rosalind hadn't. That realisation startled and shamed her. The household she managed was not a large one. Amelia was their only maid who lived in. If there was a problem, she should have noticed, no matter how busy she had been. But then, the relationship between Amelia and Alice had recently developed into something much more than that of employer and servant. 
and even more than that of friends. I've tried to get her to tell me what's wrong, Alice said, but she just smiles and says she had a fight with the greengrocer's wife or her friend couldn't go to the play or something like that. Well, perhaps we'll see her along the way, said Rosalind reassuringly. We can look in at Lorimer's. I believe Mrs Singh, Mrs Singh was their new cook, sent her there for some blackberry cordial. But they found no sign of Amelia at Lorimer's apothecary, so they continued on toward the tea rooms. The rain strengthened, causing them to duck their heads and gather up their skirts in a vain attempt to keep their hems dry. Between the market noise and the drumming of the rain, Rosalind almost missed the shout. Miss Alice! Alice froze. Rosalind put her head up. Miss Alice! Miss Thorne! Help! It was Amelia. Rosalind looked about wildly, but her bonnet's wide brim hampered her view. Alice grabbed her arm and wrenched her around. Now Rosalind faced a narrow lane that opened onto a rain-soaked courtyard. A crowd had begun to gather in the yard, but between the onlookers, Rosalind saw Amelia crouched in a puddle. Beside her, a dark-haired woman sprawled on the muddy stones. Alice moved first. Ignoring the ruts and puddles, she charged down the tiny lane and dropped to her knees beside Amelia. Rosalind yanked her wits together. She spied a young man slouching in the threshold of a shuttered shop, hands in his pockets, watching the excitement. Porter, she cried. The young man started and straightened, reflexively tugging at his hat brim. We need a cab, at once. She held up her reticule to signal she had the money to pay. I miss. He pelted away across the marketplace. That done, Rosalind pushed her way through the swelling crowd that clogged the lane and ringed about Amelia, Alice and the prostrate young woman. Voices rose and fell around her. Poor dear! Get some brandy in her. Who's got a flask? No better than she should be. Either Amelia or Alice must have turned the young woman over because she now lay on her side. Her coat was unbuttoned and her muslin dress was soaked by rain. Everything about her from bonnet to boots was good quality, although now completely spoiled by rain. Cold turned her white face and bare hands blue. As Rosalind bent down, the young woman shuddered and retched painfully, but nothing came up. Amy, she croaked. Hush, Kate, breathed Amelia. It's all right, we're going home. I can't, breathed the young woman. I can't. Never you mind now. Trust Amy and lie quiet. Oh, the poor child! A woman, dressed all in widow's black from boots to bonnet, darted forward and knelt beside the girl, Kate, Amelia called her. Come, help me get her up. The woman reached out with black-gloved hands and grasped Kate's wrists. A dozen well-meaning people surged forward to assist, but a new voice held them back. Bow Street! Bow Street! Shift now! Let me through! It was Adam. Oh, thank heaven, thought Rosalind, as he shoved his way unceremoniously through the milling crowd. Lie still, lie still, my dear, all will be well, the widow kept hold of Kate's wrists. Will you help me with her, sir, she asked as Adam reached them. My carriage is nearby. Amy, croaked Kate, Amy, please. Amelia looked to Rosalind, mute and pleading. Rosalind understood at once. Not everything, but enough. There's no need, said Rosalind to the widow. We are her friends. We'll see she's got safely home. Oh, but surely, the woman began. Gently but firmly, Rosalind drew Kate's hands out of the widow's grasp. We must hurry before she takes a turn for the worse. Mr Harkness, if you please. If you'll forgive me, Adam bent down between them and scooped the young woman into his arms. Rosalind thought she saw a flash of anger in the other woman's eyes and wondered about it, but she could not delay any further. I'm having a cab brought, she told Adam. He should be out in the square. Adam nodded and turned, cradling the girl carefully. The crowd parted reluctantly to let him through. Alice grabbed Amelia's arm and dragged her after him. Rosalind followed them all. It's all right, it's all right, Alice was saying, as much to the onlookers as to Amelia. She's with friends now. We'll take good care of her. God bless the poor soul, someone murmured. Heaven help her. Bad to be some man. 
As soon as they reached the main square, Rosalind spotted the porter waving his arm and pointing to the four-wheeled cab making its cautious way between the stalls. Rosalind beckoned to Adam. The cab's driver jumped down to open the door. Amelia and Alice climbed in and turned to help Adam bundle Kate inside. Rosalind paused just long enough to drop a pair of coins into the porter's hands. As Rosalind climbed up into the cab, Adam stripped off his greatcoat and passed it to her. She opened her mouth to protest, but he just closed her hands with his. She needs the warmth. I'll ride up with the driver, he said. Rosalind nodded and got up onto the bench across from the other three women. Amelia had wrapped her arms around Kate's shoulders. The look on the maid's face was both fierce and frightened. Rosalind felt sure Amelia was willing her own warmth into the body of the insensible young woman. Alice perched on the seat beside her. The cab jostled as Adam and the driver clambered up onto the box. The driver touched up his horses and they lurched forward. Moving carefully, Rosalind laid Adam's coat over Kate and tucked it around her. She stirred and her eyes fluttered open, but only for a heartbeat before she sagged back into Amelia's arms. "'Who is she, Amelia?' asked Alice as she began to chafe Kate's hands between her own. Amelia swallowed. "'Catherine Leviton. She... I worked for her family two years back.' Miss Leviton's breath came in a rattling wheeze. The sound sent a shiver crawling up Rosalind's spine. "'She'll need a doctor,' said Alice. Rosalind nodded. "'There's a man up the street from us. We'll try there first. Amelia, have you any idea what brought her to this state?' Amelia shook her head, but caution flickered behind her eyes. Alice caught it too and frowned. The cab rattled on. Rosalind found herself counting Miss Leviton's breaths. It seemed to her that they were coming more slowly, even as the cab picked up its speed. All the while, Amelia held on to her, stroking her shoulders, murmuring encouragement. Alice's face was stony, but she kept hold of Miss Leviton's hands, offering what warmth and comfort she had to her and Amelia both. At long last, the cab pulled into Portman Square and turned onto Orchard Street. Miss Leviton, who had been lying quiet, shuddered violently and began to retch yet again. Adam pulled the door open. Rosalind climbed down at once. Adam, will you go to number 12 and bring Dr Kemp's head? This young woman is very bad. At once. He pressed Rosalind's hand briefly and then called up to the driver. You stay and help the ladies, Johnson. Johnson touched the brim of his hat in answer. He was a burly, weathered man and had no difficulty carrying Miss Leverton inside and up the stairs. While Rosalind let him into the guest room, Alice ran to the linen cupboard. Amelia disappeared below stairs, hopefully to get a hot brick for the young woman's feet and perhaps some brandy. If she can be made to swallow it. As soon as Kate Leverton was laid on the clean bed, Rosalind dismissed Mr Johnson, telling him that if he went to the kitchen, he could get his fee from Mrs Singh. As soon as the man was gone, she set to work on getting Kate out of her sopping clothes. Kate shuddered. She struggled and coughed. Rosalind rolled her onto her side. She coughed violently and retched yet again. Rosalind's skin crawled in sympathy. Alice shouldered open the door, her arms heaped with blankets and nightclothes. In a matter of minutes, they had got Miss Leverton into a clean nightdress with dry stockings on her feet and a flannel cap over her wet hair. The guest room had no fireplace, so Rosalind laid all three quilts Alice had brought over her. Amelia appeared with hot water and towels and a basin. Her eyes were bright red from crying, and her face was almost as pale as her friend's. Miss Leverton rolled onto her back. Her eyes flickered open for a moment. Her mouth moved. Rosalind thought she meant to speak, but her face contorted and her body spasmed. Alice grabbed the basin out of Amelia's hands and Rosalind rolled the poor girl toward it. But again, nothing came out. The shudders slowed and stilled. Miss Leverton's eyes drifted shut. Her entire body slumped. Oh, no! breathed Alice. Rosalind saw it too. She turned the girl onto her back and leaned close, trying to feel for breath or pulse. 
As she did, she heard heavy feet pounding up the stairs. A lean, grizzled man with prodigious sideburns burst into the room. He dropped his worn valise onto the bed. You! Back! Out! The doctor barked at Rosalind. He dropped his bag and began rolling up his sleeves. You! he pointed at Alice. Get her head up. Put that bolster under her. She can't breathe lolling about like that. You! This was to Amelia. Open those curtains. We need light in here. Alice and Amelia moved at once to obey. So did Rosalind. She backed out of the room and closed the door. She stood there for a moment, her hand pressed against her stomach as she tried to collect her whirling thoughts. She heard movement downstairs. Adam. Rosalind hurried down to meet him. Chapter 2 Sordid Companions It was quite indifferent to me how they got money, provided they did get it. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Francesca Finch sailed into the dingy flat. She looked around her with disgust. The place seemed worse than ever, with its whitewashed walls that were more grey than white, and all the stiff, uncomfortable furnishings. Drab curtains hung where there ought to have been doors. The fire smoked, and the lone window was cracked, so that no matter how many rags they stuffed into the sill, a knife-edged draught still sliced through. What happened, Fran? Jack turned down one corner of the paper he was reading to look at her. He sat in front of their tiny hearth, with his feet propped up on the hob. A teapot and a plate of sandwiches waited on the table at his elbow. Apparently impervious to the cold, he was in just his waistcoat, shirt sleeves and stocking feet. Did you find the girl? Yes, I found her. Francesca jerked at the fingers of her black gloves. For all the good it does us. She tossed the gloves onto the horsehair sofa and sent her black bonnet sailing after them. Can't say I like the sound of that, said Jack. Jack Beecham was a handsome man, in a raw, unpolished way. He still kept the burly frame he'd earned as a prize fighter before he had given up the sporting life to become a thief-taker. His naturally pale skin was permanently bronzed by sun and wind. His hands were scarred and calloused, and his long nose was crooked. His curling dark hair hung about his ears as long as any poet's. The combination gave him a roguish, dangerous look, like a highwayman from the old days. In contrast to broad, dark Jack, Francesca herself was a golden willow wand. She'd the luck to be born with bright blonde hair and lively blue eyes. Her mother said her face would be her fortune. But Francesca quickly learned that beauty, and the men it attracted, were not to be depended on. So she'd set about acquiring a set of skills to add on to her pretty looks. She gained her polish from a lady's maid who had fallen on hard times and was happy to give lessons in exchange for gin money. Now Fran could pass as anyone, from an upstairs maid to the daughter of a baronet. Well, maybe sister of a baronet these days, she thought irritably. It turns out the plaguy little creature managed to run into a friend, some serving girl, and collapsed just as she got there. Francesca dropped gracelessly onto the shabby settee, letting her arms and legs sprawl wide. Before I could get proper hold of her, the girl's mistress showed up and whisked her away. Which was what truly infuriated her. She'd stood there and let the little chit be snatched quite literally out of her grasp. I should have said I was her aunt or sister or any blasted thing. I never should have let them bundle her off so easily. But you followed them? Jack prompted. I didn't need to, Fran said, more to the ceiling than to him. I know where they went. Then what's the trouble? The mistress of this serving girl is the ever so troublesome Miss Rosalind Thorne. Who? Jack cocked a curious brow at her. Fran pushed herself upright. Rosalind Thorne is the guard dog of London's Tom. She specialises in getting our grand ladies out of whatever troubles they may have gotten themselves into. Oh, that Miss Thorne, said Jack. Rumour has it she's the reason Russell Fullerton decided to head for foreign parts. That's her, said Fran. And do you remember the dead man found in Almack's ballroom, or the dead woman found in the courtyard of Marlborough House? 
Jack shook his head. That's because Miss Thorne was there to cover them over. Fran reached for the chipped teapot and poured a cup of dark brew. The woman is a veritable female sextant. She's made a career of burying the worst secrets of the great and not so good. They all run to her when there's some ugly business that might sully their snow-white reputations, and she makes it go away. Francesca snorted. Clever game. I should have thought of it. And now this Miss Thorne has our little Kate. So it would seem. Francesca slurped the bitter tea. Give me a sandwich. She and Jack were in the habit of managing for themselves. Even when times were good, the two of them kept few servants. Servants watched, and they talked, and that would never do for such a household as theirs. Jack passed the plate, which was as chipped as the pot. Do you think Miss Thorne knows what she's got in Kate Leverton? asked Jack. If she doesn't yet, she will soon. It's my understanding she's on speaking terms with half the servants in London as well as their mistresses. Francesca bit the sandwich, then pulled back and stared at it. Fish paste? Jack shrugged. The best I could do today. Why is it there's never any money? They'd brought it in by the fistful over the years, but it always seemed to vanish like a dream. Could it be that Kate's aunt has hired this Miss Thorne? Jack asked. It could be, Francesca munched angrily. Sick or not, the old woman is still sharp. Jack leaned forward and rested his elbows on his knees. Well, I agree this is an unwelcome turn of events, but all is not necessarily lost. How did the girl look when you left her? Bad. Serves her right for trying to run out on me, Fran added. From the look of her, she could peg out before she has a chance to say anything. Jack spread his hands. So, we will watch the house and hope for the best. That's not going to be enough. All right, say it's not. What do you want to do? Now that is the question, isn't it? If the girl lives, we've got to winkle her out of there, Fran said slowly. She still owes us. Jack nodded. And while you're at it, you can remind her that your silence isn't going to come cheap. As he spoke, Fran felt the first stirrings of hope. Maybe they could turn this disaster to good account. Blackmail was much more Jack's trade than her own. But perhaps Kate could be turned into a steady source of income. One they could draw on to get themselves a proper house, all turned out in comfort and style. And proper food, she thought, as she finished the limp sandwich. Jack was getting to his feet. Where are you off to? she asked. He touched the side of his nose. Government job. Stafford wants that radical MP watched. Make sure he pays you this time, she said. No fear, my love. I'll be getting more than enough to satisfy that pirate downstairs. Jack shrugged into his overcoat. In the meantime, you can start working on how to bring Kate safely back into our little fold. Without Miss Thorne querying the pitch, Fran muttered. That will be fun. Jack leaned down and kissed her. Cheer up, my dear. We've been in far worse spots. After all, he grinned, how much trouble could one genteel spinster lady make for the likes of you and me? Chapter 3 Unfortunate Possibilities Cases of obstinacy are always dangerous in proportion to the weakness of the patient. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Rosalind entered her spacious front parlour. She and Alice had only taken the Orchard Street house a few months ago, and sometimes its room and comfort still surprised her. Just now, however, her whole focus was on Adam. He crouched in front of the hearth, the fire had been badly banked and he was struggling to get it lit. His rain-soaked hat and coat had been slung over the slat-backed chair and he had rolled back his shirt sleeves to expose his tanned and muscled forearms. Rosalind watched his careful, patient strikes at the tinderbox and how, when its sparks failed to catch, he paused and adjusted the kindling and tried again. He looked tired. 
There were times Rosalind knew when he did not sleep at night. Instead, he paced the streets, following the routes of the watchmen on duty, lost in thought. If she was out late for some engagement at the opera or the theatre or a party she had helped organise, they might even cross paths. She never asked him if it was deliberate on his part, and he never asked if she looked for him. But when she did see him, she would always watch him for as long as she dared. And no matter how brief the moment or how much of a crowd stood between them, Adam always knew when she was there. He would turn and meet her gaze and smile the small, crooked smile that had always been her undoing. At last the tinder and kindling caught, and Adam was able to straighten up and turn toward her. As soon as he did, Rosalind moved forward and took both his hands. They said nothing, just stood with each other for a long moment. She wanted to kiss him, to hold him close and be held until the tightness in her chest eased, but there were strangers in the house and she could not risk being seen. How is she? Adam asked. Very bad, said Rosalind. However, we've got her warm and dry. If she's strong, she might still rally. Adam looked toward the door and the hallway beyond. Rosalind could tell some grim idea had worked its way into his careful mind. Do you know who she is? he asked. Her name is Catherine Leverton. Amelia worked for her family before she came to us. Ah, Adam knew the story behind Amelia's previous dismissal, or as much of it as Rosalind did. And how is Alice? This cannot be easy for her. One of the things that has always amazed me about Alice is her generosity of spirit. While Amelia needs her support, she'll have it. Besides, it wouldn't be fair otherwise. Adam quirked a brow. Fair? Rosalind felt herself smile in spite of everything. If Alice is going to quarrel, she's going to wait until her opposite is at their best. Otherwise, it's taking advantage. I remember once she nursed George through an influenza for two weeks without a cross word. George was Alice's brother. Before his marriage, they had both lived together and worked for the newspaper The Morning Chronicle. Then she made sure he ate a good breakfast before she spent an hour upbraiding him for running to report on a fire without a coat, which was the source of the infection in the first place. That sounds like Alice, Adam agreed. Some of the weariness faded from his eyes. It was then that Mrs Singh arrived, bearing a tray with the tea things and a quantity of ham and butter sandwiches. Mrs Singh was a tiny widowed Sikh woman. She had come to London from Bombay more than a decade before with her sister and her sister's children. While Mrs Singh hired out as a cook and housekeeper, her sister worked as an illustrator for the ladies' periodicals. Thank you, Mrs Singh, said Rosalind. And will you please go upstairs and find out if the doctor needs anything? At the very least, we'll want hot drinks for Alice and Amelia. It's already in hand, miss, she replied. I'll be taking tea up to them next. When Mrs Singh left, Rosalind sat down on the Holland blue sofa and began the ritual of pouring out the tea. She handed Adam a cup and a sandwich. Thank you. He sat in the round back chair beside her and devoured the sandwich in four huge bites. If Rosalind had been less well acquainted with his mother, she might have wondered if he had been eating properly. What happened with this young woman, Miss Leverton? Adam asked. How did Amelia come to find her? Before Rosalind could make any answer, the parlour door opened and Dr Kemp's head entered. His sleeves were still rolled up and his sideburns positively bristled when he saw Rosalind and Adam seated quietly at the tea tray. How is she, Doctor? asked Rosalind at once. Alive, he snapped, for now. What she'll be in an hour, heaven only knows. Miss Thorne, is it? He squinted at her. Now, I flatter myself I am a modern thinker and a charitable man. I understand that not all ladies are so fortunate as to find themselves caring husbands or are lucky enough to know the shelter of a loving family. But if you allow a young girl in your charge to wander about without chaperonage until... You are mistaken, Dr. Kemp said, said Adam firmly. The young woman is a stranger here. Dr. Kemp's head's mouth shut abruptly. 
She was discovered insensible in the marketplace, said Rosalind. We brought her here and sent for you to see if anything could be done. The doctor bowed his head and took a deep breath. Then I am mistaken in my assumptions. I apologise. He bowed briefly. There is no need, replied Rosalind. Will you sit and have some tea? Thank you. Rosalind had fixed his cup, plenty of sugar and no milk, and handed it to him. She offered him a sandwich as well. Dr. Kemp's head ate like a man who didn't know if he'd ever have time to finish and found it best to get the business done with. She's suffering badly from the cold and the damp, he said between bites. But there's some other underlying condition there. She has a will to vomit, but nothing left in her and no fever. In fact, she's taking far longer than I'd hoped to get warm. I've given her laudanum and we will see what a good sleep may accomplish. Rosalind was relieved to note Dr. Kemp's head said nothing about bleeding or cupping or, worse, that the young woman was obviously hysterical and not to be indulged in her bad behaviours. Can you say at all what may have happened? asked Adam. The doctor crammed the last of the sandwich in his mouth and washed it down with a swallow of tea. I'd say she was healthy enough until recently, and of good family too, to judge by her hair and hands. What can have possessed her people to let her out of the house in such weather and such a condition? I wish I could tell you, said Rosalind, but we know nothing of her. It's possible she came away on her own, said Adam. The doctor pulled a face. He also drained his cup. Well, if she makes it through the night, I recommend continued quiet, warmth and a light diet. Your cook seems a good, sensible woman and she says she has experience in the sick room. Broth, tea and barley water are what's needed until the patient can tolerate anything more. Then it should be calf's foot jelly and gruel. Make sure the windows are kept open during the warmth of the day and... He paused. You have something to say, Miss Thorne? Rosalind realised she was staring. I apologise, Dr. Kemp's head, she said. I am used to more intervention and prescribing from a doctor. Hmm, yes, well, I'm not surprised. Most of our medical men are thinking of their pockets rather than their patients. No, nature will heal that girl or not. In either case, you must contact her people as soon as possible. And when they come for her, I will give them the speech I meant for you. He set his cup down. I'll be back tomorrow. Call me if she worsens. He stood, but when Rosalind and Adam moved to do the same, he just waved them off. Don't bother, I'll show myself out. Good day. The doctor bowed to Rosalind and then to Adam and strode out the door. The door shut. Rosalind raised her brows. So did Adam. I like him, he said. He seems refreshingly sensible, Rosalind agreed. I think our patient is in good hands. She is in your hands, said Adam. There are none better. Rosalind raised her chin to demonstrate her imperviousness to such blatant flattery. Adam smiled and leaned close. A soft scratching sound at the door. It opened almost immediately and Amelia stepped inside. Her hands were correctly folded in front of her and her eyes were downcast. She looked the model of the proper parlour maid, if a bedraggled one, and entirely unlike her usual self. Miss Alice, Amelia croaked and then stopped and tried again. Miss Alice said you'd want to know how things are. She said she'd sit with Kate, with Miss Leverton, while I came down. Yes, of course, said Rosalind at once. Now you sit by the fire. Amelia sank stiffly onto the stool near the coal scuttle. She hadn't changed her clothes, and even from a distance Rosalind could see her hands were white with cold. Nor was the rest of her much better. Amelia's face was sickly grey, and her eyes were bright red from crying. Rosalind poured another cup of tea and added a heaping spoonful of sugar and a large dollop of milk. Adam carried the cup to Amelia and put it into her hands. Amelia sipped her tea, then gulped it. Was Miss Leviton able to speak to you? asked Rosalind. Amelia shook her head. No, miss. She didn't wake up at all, not even when that doctor poured the laudanum down her. Rosalind fell silent for a moment, considering the young woman in front of her and the one who lay upstairs. 
Is this Miss Leverton by any chance related to Mrs. Wilhelmina Leverton? Or Mrs. Mariana Leverton? she asked. Some of your ladies? Adam asked Rosalind. Not directly. Mrs. Wilhelmina has a husband who is on the rise in the business world, and she's an active hostess. Louisa is acquainted with her. As for Mrs. Mariana Leverton, I've only heard rumours of her, Rosalind answered. She was active in the blue stocking set some years back, and she still has a great deal of influence in certain circles. I believe she has a hand in radical politics, or at least she used to. Rosalind saw Adam tense ever so slightly at the word radical. She moved to Bath some years ago, I believe. Those Levitons are Kate's family, said Amelia. Wilhelmina is married to her older brother, and she, after I was... The family sent Kate to Bath to be Mrs. Mariana Leverton's companion. I had no notion Mariana Leverton had returned to London, Rosalind went on. She turned back to Amelia. How did you discover Kate? It was shockingly casual to call a young lady she did not know by her first name, but all the female Levitons in this discussion were otherwise becoming difficult to distinguish. Amelia swallowed and swallowed again. Adam pulled a handkerchief from his coat pocket and handed it to her. Amelia murmured her thanks and applied it to her eyes and nose. I'm sorry, I... She took a deep breath. I'm better. I am. Rosalind let this obvious falsehood pass. I first saw her again a week ago. Rosalind drew back in surprise. Alice had sensed something was wrong, and here it was. Amelia cringed. I'm sorry. I should have told you. I know I should. You've always, you've always treated me decently, and I should not have kept this hid. So why did you? Rosalind asked. It was private, she said. Rosalind nodded and waited. Kate, she was waiting for me on the square when I came back from the market last Wednesday, said Amelia. I brought her to the house. She was very upset. About what? asked Adam. She wouldn't say. All she told me was that she needed to leave Mrs. Leverton's house. She asked, she asked if I could help her for the sake of our old friendship. Amelia flushed crimson. Her hands shook. I said she should talk to you, miss, that you helped women like her with their difficulties, but she wouldn't listen. She left. Amelia shuddered again. And I let her go. I never should have. I should have dragged her back. This is not your fault, said Rosalind firmly. Whatever happened, I know you did everything you could. It was clear Amelia did not believe her, but she did not protest any further. After that, I didn't see her again, not till today. She was outside the apothecary. I think she was waiting for me. She knew this was my market day. I think, I think maybe she'd even been out all the night. She was so sick. I tried to get her to come with me, but she, she collapsed and she could go no further. Amelia, said Adam softly. She looked at him, startled. Amelia, did she have spasms at all when she collapsed, or vomit? She tried, but there was nothing, like you saw. She shook so badly, I thought she'd do herself an injury. I thought it was a, the cold, or maybe some sort of fit. Amelia choked off a sob and pressed the back of her hand against her mouth. Adam nodded, his face solemn. Rosalind felt again that he was holding something back. Now, however, was not the time to press him. Rosalind turned back to Amelia. Do you know where Mariana Leverton lives? She should be told what's happened. Amelia bit her lip. No, I... That is, I heard she has a house in Brook Street for when she's in town, but she never was before this, so now I don't know. It was after... That is... No matter. Rosalind went to the bookshelf beside her writing desk and brought down her copy of Boyle's Court and Country Guide. She looked up the listings for Brook Street. Yes, here she is. Mrs Leverton, 24 Upper Brook Street. We can try there, and if she is not at home, one of the staff will know where she can be found. No, you mustn't, cried Amelia. Please, something's happened to... 
Miss Leverton, I can't send her away until we know she'll be all right. Rosalind expected this protest and understood it. She had her counter-arguments ready. If, as Amelia suspected, Miss Leverton had been out all night, her family was surely frightened and searching for her. They might have some information about Miss Leverton's condition that would help the doctor. But the look on Adam's face and the tiny shake of his head stopped Rosalind from saying any of this. Very well, she told Amelia. We will wait until Kate is able to talk. Thank you, miss, said Amelia. I'll go upstairs and sit with her, if that's all right, she added. Of course it is, but you must change first. You will be no good to your friend if you take a chill. Amelia bobbed her curtsy and left them. Rosalind turned at once to Adam. You suspect something, she said. When you asked Amelia about Kate's condition when she was discovered, you had something in mind. Adam was silent for a moment. I only saw her for a few minutes, he said finally, but her condition reminded me sharply of a bad night back when I was still a patrol officer. A hue and cry had been raised to bring us into the house of a baker. The man was in convulsions and retching and unnaturally pale, very much like how we found Miss Leverton. What was the matter with him? He had been poisoned, said Adam, with arsenic. Chapter 4 This Troubling Work What a treasure to meet with anything like a new heart. All hearts nowadays are second-hand at best. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda It was a long moment before Rosalind felt she could speak. Arsenic was easy enough to come by. It was possible they even had some in the house to help control rats and mice. If it is arsenic, what can be done? Rosalind asked. Adam shook his head, and Rosalind felt her heart sink. If it is poison, she's been removed from the source, and that's the most important thing. Otherwise, it's as the doctor said. If Miss Leverton makes it through the night, then there's at least a chance she'll recover. He paused, and Rosalind read the uncertainty in his eyes. Unless she harmed herself, she said, so he would not have to. In which case, she may try again. He nodded soberly. But if she wanted to die, why would she seek Amelia out? Neither one of them had any answer to that. Uncomfortable and unusually restless, Rosalind set about reordering the tea things. Adam turned away, allowing her a moment to collect herself. Instead, he looked over the tidy line of invitation cards arrayed on the mantel. You'll be busy soon, he remarked. Yes, it's rather surprising, said Rosalind. It was easier to speak of ordinary things just for this moment. I worried that I would be cut entirely once I started formalising arrangements with my ladies. Gently bred women did not work for pay, or at least they did not let it be seen that they did. Rosalind's compensation from the women she assisted had previously been in the form of gifts, loans and practical assistance. But earlier in the year she had hired a man of business to help regularise her income. For Rosalind, it was a step over a very broad line. Well, it looks instead as if you are now very much in demand, Adam remarked. What do you suppose happened? She gave a small shrug. Some is the support of friends. The rest, I expect it is what usually happens in society, someone talked. Then someone else enlarged on the theme and I became a novelty. Novelties are always popular at a dinner party. I hope you don't think of yourself just as a novelty. I don't know what to think of myself sometimes, especially as it seems I cannot stop from dragging you into my troubles. Rosalind paused and met his gaze. I promise you, Adam, when I sent my note to invite you to drink tea this morning, I only meant for us to keep a moment's company. Adam's blue eyes glowed with affection and humour. Rosalind, I have the greatest respect for your powers of organisation, but even you could not rise to this height. Besides, he added, the reason I wanted to meet you was so I could drag you into my troubles. What's happened? 
It's not, she cut him off. You will not insult my understanding by saying it's not important. I wouldn't dare, he replied soberly. But the truth is I don't know whether it's important or not. Adam's eyes went distant, remembering and considering something far beyond her pleasant parlour. I've been asked... He stopped and started again. I've been invited to a meeting with some men I do not know if I can trust. Rosalind waited. It concerns the Cato Street business. The last word sounded thick with bitterness. And the man who issued the invitation has not been entirely forthcoming about why he wants to speak with me. I tell you to take care, but I know you will. His expression turned rueful. If I was taking care, I think I would not go at all. What is it you're afraid of? Rosalind paused. Or perhaps I should ask, what is it you believe you should be afraid of? Adam looked out the window and did not answer for a long moment. I believe that the men taken in the raid at Cato Street are being made an example of. I believe that example will be dramatic and brutal and that it is very likely most of them do not truly deserve it. Despite the fact that they did cause the death of one of your fellow officers. The newspapers had been full of accounts of what happened when the men at Cato Street were taken. The Coldstream guards had even been turned out to support the contingent of Bow Street constables. It had been universally described as a heroic action against a gang of determined and armed radicals. Adam described it as an unholy mess, with no one taking proper charge, resulting in the death of one of the runners. Worse, Adam himself had been actively prevented from joining the raid. Even before it began, his superiors sent Adam running about the city on a series of errands to other policing stations, and to several great houses that were being guarded by squadrons of constables, in case riots should break out. Supposedly this had been to make sure good communication and order were maintained among the guards. If our mad revolutionaries had simply been watched and followed, they could easily have been arrested one by one, and Smithers would still be alive, said Adam grimly. But Townsend and Magistrate Burney wanted to make a grand show of snaring the whole flock of them. Rosalind nodded. The most senior of Bow Street's principal officers, John Townsend, had come to prominence by discovering a gang of dangerous Irish radicals in the heart of London. Through Adam, she knew he longed to recreate that success. Do you really think Townsend would send eleven men to the gallows to burnish his reputation? Adam did not answer that, at least not directly. There is something underneath this that will not let me rest, Rosalind, he said. I should set it aside. I am ordered to set it aside, but it nags at me. Intuition comes from experience. What is your experience with such matters? In high treason, very little, Adam admitted. But these men, they're angry and they're hungry. The leader, Thistlewood, has some history of troublemaking, but he's not very good at it. The same with the rest. I don't think one of them could plan a successful raid on a game preserve, let alone the destruction of public order. Is there any way I can help? she asked. Rosalind watched Adam consider telling her there was nothing. She frowned at him. He raised his brows in answer, she shook her head, and he closed his eyes in surrender. This small absurdity sent a slow warmth spreading through Rosalind, but that vanished as soon as Adam brought out a letter folded and sealed with wax and stream. This contains the name of the man I am to meet, along with a copy of the letter he wrote to me. He handed it to her. If you do not hear from me or Captain Gautier tomorrow, make sure this gets to Sam Torton. It took all the careful training of Rosalind's lifetime to keep her face still as she set the letter carefully beside the tea tray. He'd never asked such a thing of her before, London's coroner might ask Rosalind to assist in a matter that touched an aristocratic family, but Adam tried to make sure Bow Street business stayed at arm's length from her. Until now, it seemed. What is the supposed purpose of this meeting? she asked. I am told there is a committee for the defence of the Cato Street men, 
and that it or they hope for my assistance. That will not make Mr. Townsend any happier with you. No, it won't, especially if it's genuine. Bow Street officers could be put at the service of any gentleman who requested them, providing that gentleman was willing to pay the fees. However, due to the small number of officers, it was up to the magistrates to choose which requests got answered. The magistrates and Mr. Townsend. While Rosalind considered this, another unbidden thought slipped into her mind. She frowned. What's troubling you? asked Adam. I've had an idea, but I don't like it. Tell me. Amelia says our Miss Leverton has been living with her aunt, Mrs. Mariana Leverton. I have been racking my brains for some excuse I can use to call on Mrs. Leverton without letting her know we're sheltering Kate here. However, she's involved in radical politics. And here, she held up the letter, are a group of radicals working for the defence of the Cato Street men. And you wonder if you could represent yourself as raising funds or awareness or some such for that defence, Adam finished for her. Which would mean I was using your work for my own ends. Which would be a problem, agreed Adam, if I had not had a thought of my own. Rosalind smiled. Tell me. Since I first heard the story of the Cato Street plot, there's been one thing that made no sense to me. Why on earth would the head of His Majesty's Privy Council be willing to believe a random stranger he met in the park about a murder plot? He paused, and Rosalind waited. One possibility is that he was expecting this news. Do you actually suspect the whole business was orchestrated somehow? It sounded nearly as mad as the Cato Street plot itself, but Adam's face remained serious. Again, I don't know. But as the matter has been described, his grace was alerted to the plot when a man came up to him in Hyde Park and gave him a note. Now why would his grace instantly believe some stranger? Were you thinking that there might be some gossip among our political hostesses that would help explain his grace's actions? Yes. Then we may help each other in this. As we always have. Rosalind met Adam's gaze. He said nothing, but he came to sit beside her and he kissed her. The gesture was slow, gentle and deeply reassuring. When it was over they stayed close, hands clasped, enjoying this moment together, when there was nothing to do and nothing to hide. This moment when she could be simply, fully in love, no matter what might happen next. And what happened next might be dangerous indeed. Because Adam had made it perfectly clear that he could be walking into a trap. Chapter 5 Causes and Consequences Love quarrels are easily made up, but of money quarrels there is no end. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda After Adam left, Rosalind took her time. She had another cup of tea. She ate another sandwich. She listened to the crackle of the fire Adam had lit and the silence of the house beyond it. Finally, she rang for Mrs. Singh to come clear the tea things. She also considered that one way or another they needed to afford at least one more housemaid. Then, as composed as she could be, Rosalind climbed the stairs. No sound came from the spare bedroom, but the door was slightly ajar. Rosalind pushed it back. Kate Leverton lay under her quilts, her pale face turned to the side. Whether she was asleep or unconscious, Rosalind could not tell. Alice and Amelia, on the other hand, were sound asleep. Both slumped in slack-back chairs, leaning head and shoulders together, their hands clasped. Alice snored a sound Rosalind remembered very well from their time together at boarding school. Amelia shifted a little closer. Rosalind let out a long, slow breath. Rosalind had no name for her relationship with Adam Harkness. She loved him and did not doubt this. That he loved her in return was an unshakable fact. But there the matter rested. 
Whatever the wishes of their hearts might be, they remained ensnared by the labyrinth of law and custom that governed the personal relationship of two individuals. Rosalind could not marry a man from the working classes and keep her own closely guarded gentility. Her place in society would inevitably and irrevocably follow his. As for Adam, he already supported his mother and his younger siblings. His erratic pay as a Bow Street officer did not permit him to add a wife to this list, never mind the child or children that would follow. But as frustrated as she might become with her curtailed choices, Rosalind did realise that for her and Adam at least there existed some precedent. Society acknowledged that such love as theirs did happen, whether it was a good idea or not. Alice and Amelia and poor Kate Leverton did not have even this much. Just as Rosalind moved to close the door, Alice's snore cut off and her eyes opened. Alice had always possessed an uncanny talent for becoming fully and instantly awake. Her gaze met Rosalind's without any confusion or embarrassment. she just eased her way out from under Amelia, setting the maid back so she was propped up by the wall and the bedside table. Her hand lingered on Amelia's shoulder for just a moment before she moved to join Rosalind in the corridor. What did the doctor say? Alice pulled the door shut. He said Miss Leverton has every chance if she survives the night. But? Rosalind drew Alice further away from the door. Adam thinks she may have been poisoned. Alice swayed slightly but betrayed no other hint of her shock. How? she asked. Arsenic. Fear took Alice, but only for a moment. Her instincts as a newspaper writer were too strong. Odd that the doctor should miss something like that. He may never have seen such a case. I suppose. Well, should we tell Amelia? What do you think? asked Rosalind. Alice wrapped her arms around herself as if she felt a sudden chill. Obviously we need to talk with her about Kate, but she's in a state, Rose. She's trying not to show it, but she's halfway between fear and fury, and she doesn't know what... Before she could get any further, a muffled thump sounded from the bedroom. Alice, one step ahead of Rosalind, ran back to the room and threw open the door. Amelia was at Kate's bedside. The chair had fallen over onto the hearthrug. Kate's eyes were open, and she looked wildly about her as she struggled to rise. Where am I? she croaked. You're in Miss Thorne's house, Kate, said Amelia. It's all right. Look, here she is to see how you do. Rest yourself, Miss Leverton. Rosalind stepped up to the bed where she could be more easily seen. You're among friends. Kate's gaze swept the room again. What happened to me? You collapsed in the market, Amelia told her. I don't remember. Do not task yourself, said Rosalind. It does not matter. Kate clearly did not agree. She struggled to lift herself out of the bed. I need... I have to go. This was too much for Alice. Fiddlesticks! She strode forward and firmly pressed Kate back onto the bolsters. You're in no state to go anywhere. How long have I been here? Less than a day, said Rosalind. How long have you been away from your home? Kate turned her face away. Amelia shook her shoulder gently. Come on, Kate. It's all right. I left last night, Kate told them. Rosalind nodded, unsurprised. Amelia says you live with your aunt. She is sure to be worried. She should be told where you are. No, rasped Kate. No, please. Why not, Kate? asked Amelia. What's happened? Kate closed her eyes. We're not going anywhere, said Alice, so you might as well look at us. Alice, murmured Rosalind, but Alice's words had the desired effect. Kate opened her eyes. If you're in any trouble, said Rosalind, we will do our best to help you. Kate's gaze fastened on Amelia. Something intense and unspoken passed between the two women. Kate had met Amelia a week ago, Rosalind remembered. What did they talk about then? What were they holding back now? I can't, said Kate at last. I just can't. Please, 
I just need to rest a little. Then I'll be on my way. Nonsense, snapped Alice. You can't even stand up. Just tell Miss Thorne what happened, Amelia urged. Did you quarrel with Mrs. Leverton? asked Amelia. No, no. Kate's voice was harsh but emphatic. She's never been... She's always been kind to me. Then what? demanded Amelia, plainly exasperated. Kate closed her eyes again, but the way she sagged back onto the pillows told Rosalind that this wasn't just stubbornness. What little strength she'd recovered was ebbing quickly away. Miss Leverton, Rosalind said, you are welcome to stay until you are better. If you want to leave after that, we cannot stop you. But you say your aunt has always been kind to you. Surely she's worried that you haven't come home. Let me at least tell her you're alive and safe with friends. Tomorrow, Kate said weakly, if I'm still here, tomorrow. Very well, Rosalind told her. We'll let you rest. I'll stay until you're asleep. Amelia looked anxiously to Alice and Rosalind. If that's all right. Of course it is, said Alice. Come along, Rosalind. She pulled Rosalind out of the room, shut the door, and moved them both out of earshot. Well, what do you think? asked Alice softly. I think that girl is frightened, Rosalind answered, and I think we should probably lock her door tonight. You think somebody might try to get in? More likely that she'll try to get out. Alice wrinkled her nose. She wouldn't get far. No, but she also might tumble down the stairs while trying. Hmm, yes, I hadn't thought of that. Alice. Rosalind hesitated. Has Amelia told you anything about... about the Levitons? said Alice. Very little. It's a delicate subject, as you can imagine. Yes, I can see that it would be. She did say they were not a happy family, and that there were a lot of quarrels, usually about money. Rosalind found this to be entirely unsurprising. Rosalind? Alice stopped and started again. You've never questioned my particular friendships, and I have always been profoundly grateful for that. Please believe I never meant to bring trouble to our house. I never thought... I didn't ask to... Alice. Rosalind touched her friend's hand. Do you love Amelia? I think I might, Alice whispered. Does she love you? Yes. She spoke the word without hesitation, but her eyes betrayed a greater uncertainty. But now I don't know if she loves me enough. Rosalind nodded. She understood that particular dilemma all too well. Perhaps I should break things off before this... Alice's gaze strayed back towards the door of the spare room. Whatever it is gets any worse. We do not have anywhere near enough information to determine if such a drastic step is required, said Rosalind. Alice sniffed and pulled a handkerchief out of her sleeve. Of course you'd say that. It is entirely like you. Would you rather I said something else? No, you are perfect. Hardly. But Rosalind smiled at her friend. Will you do me a very great favour and try to get some sleep? Alice's expression turned rueful. I don't think I can. But that's all right. I'm still working on those page proofs Mr. Coburn sent. If that doesn't put me to sleep, I'm past salvation. I'll leave you to it then and see you in the morning. Rosalind started towards her own room, but Alice stopped her. Rosalind? Yes? Rosalind turned to meet her gaze. Thank you. Rosalind embraced her friend and said good night. It wasn't until she was safe behind her own door that she allowed her calm expression to melt under the weight of the worry inside her. Poisoned, Adam had said about Kate Leverton. With arsenic. A shudder crept up Rosalind's spine. Under other circumstances, she might have wondered if the girl had attempted to end her own life. But Adam was right. She was not likely to have taken poison and then spent the night waiting for a friend to find her, especially such a friend as Amelia. Whatever this business was, it was not some lover's impassioned drama. She felt sure of that. Someone else had decided Kate Leverton should not live.
Chapter 6. A Private Meeting I cannot depend on any of these honourable men. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda It was one of the world's many contradictions, but the best place for a man to hide was in the midst of a crowd. This being true, the Cocoa Tree Coffee House was one of London's best possible sites for a clandestine meeting. The Cocoa Tree was an immensely popular place to drink coffee, hear the news, conduct business and argue politics. It carried all the London papers and the walls were plastered with notices of auctions, sales and labourers needed. One notice in particular caught Adam's eye. It had been partly torn and other more recent bills crowded up against and partway over it. Nonetheless, it remained legible. London Gazette Extraordinary Thursday, February 24, 1820 Whereas Arthur Thistlewood stands charged with high treason and also with the willful murder of Richard Smithers, a reward of £1,000 is hereby offered to any persons or person who shall discover and apprehend. The rest of the bill had been plastered over with an announcement of an auction taking place in three days. One thousand pounds. An entire family could live out their days on that much money and still have something to leave to their children. Such a sum would tempt any man. But even as he thought about that, Adam noted the date on the handbill. The Cato Street raid had happened in the small hours of the morning that same day. This notice must have been published at breakneck speed. Adam tucked this thought in the back of his mind and turned to find the person he was there to meet. His letter informed him the man would be at the table in the back, furthest from the fire. The coffee house was perhaps half full, but the noise was twice as loud as it should have been. Each patron seemed to be determined to outshout his neighbour as they argued business, politics, horses, stocks, schemes and rumours. As Adam shouldered his way over to the battered table, he glimpsed Samson Gautier, lounging in the chimney corner, listening with amused interest to two men arguing beside him. Gautier did not so much as glance up as Adam passed. As Adam reached the rear of the coffee house, a man rose to his feet. Mr Harkness. Adam greeted the man with a slight bow. Sir Richard. Sir Richard Phillips returned his bow. He was a short, neat man with a keen eye. He wore the buff breeches and blue coat that had been the preferred uniform of radicals since the days of the American War. Adam had the sense that this was a man used to trusting his own judgment, and that judgment might be very sharp indeed. Sir Richard gestured to a chair. Adam sat, and when Sir Richard held up the coffee pot, he nodded and accepted the cup that the man filled for him. Do you have my letter with you? Adam took the letter from his coat pocket and handed it across. Sir Richard perused it briefly and then tucked it away in his own pocket. Forgive me if I seem overly suspicious. It's important to be sure of whom we're dealing with in this business. And exactly what is this business, Sir Richard? asked Adam. It is as I indicated in the letter, he said. The men of Cato Street are unjustly accused. I represent a committee formed for their defence. Adam was careful to keep his face still. They were found with a cache of weaponry. Their leader, Thistlewood, has already admitted that he planned to take an army into the streets. When the Coldstream Guards and Bow Street came to arrest them, they fought back with deadly result. All of what you say is true, but there's another fact to be considered. What is that? Have you heard of a man named George Edwards associated with this business? I have. His name was included on the warrant and mentioned in the prisoner statements. Sanderson Fawkes had also mentioned it, but Adam did not feel the need to say so at this time. Do you know who Edwards is? Sir Richard asked him. Do you? returned Adam. Sir Richard smiled, an expression without warmth or humour. He is a spy, Mr Harkness. Adam arched his brows and waited. Sir Richard leaned forward. Surely you know he attempted to claim a reward for informing on the Cato Street men. Adam did know it. Several of the men, including Arthur Thistlewood, had named Edwards as the chief instigator of the plot. Instigator and financier. 
Thistlewood claimed this Edwards had given him money to buy the arms stored in the hayloft. But then, if he was found guilty, hanging was the least of the punishments Thistlewood and his fellows could face. Such a bleak future might easily tempt a man to try to shift the blame. Edwards never got that reward, Sir Richard was saying. He vanished the next day. No one knows where he is now. His face grew thoughtful. Unless you've heard something. Adam did not bother to answer that. Sir Richard, forgive me, but what is your interest in this business? Sir Richard drank his coffee. Well, I could say it's to see justice done and uphold the rights of man and subjects of the crown, but I dare say you wouldn't believe that. It's a fine sentiment, said Adam. The corner of Sir Richard's mouth twitched. These are not savoury characters, Mr Harkness. I've spoken with Thistlewood. Once he may have been a great orator and agitator, now I'm afraid he's quite mad. Are he and his colleagues a threat to public order? Probably. But, Sir Richard raised one finger, if they are telling the truth, they did not come together on their own. They were egged on, lied to, and paid. Now that finger stabbed the table by a man who is not on trial. This man might have orchestrated the whole business out of simple greed, or, Sir Richard leaned forward, he might have been put up to the business by men in power in order to suppress a public demonstration of public will. That is our interest. Sir Richard sat back and raised his cup. It is not to say these men are innocents, but it is likely that the one who really created this public danger did it because he was promised payment. That man should be in the dock with the rest of them. They deserve to have the fact of this external involvement, whatever its origin, taken into consideration when they are tried. Adam sipped at his coffee and found it strong and harsh, but flavourful. He considered the man in front of him. Public rewards and private fees were used daily to discover information about all sorts of crimes. As a system, it was ripe for abuse. Bow Street's officers and runners alike were barely paid enough to survive. They depended on the fees from private individuals to make up their meagre salaries. Adam had seen arrests made simply to collect the payment. The practice was even worse among London's small army of thief-takers – some of whom worked hand in glove with the thieves they were supposed to help capture. Knowing all this, it was easy to imagine someone egging on a set of madmen and then turning them over to the crown, all for the sake of the reward. Especially if that reward was a thousand pounds. Sir Richard eyed him shrewdly. You're wondering whether you can trust me. No offence, replied Adam. None taken. You should be wondering. For all you know, I could be another Edwards, intent on luring you into a trap. There was no need for Adam to answer that. What do you want from me? he asked instead. Simply put, we want you to find Edwards and let us know his whereabouts, said Richard. That's all. It will be our job as the Committee for the Defence to make sure he's brought to court. It sounded perfectly reasonable and simple assuming that locating a man who did not want to be found was ever a simple task. Adam took another swallow of coffee. Why me? Your reputation precedes you, Mr Harkness. Your recent actions in Manchester and elsewhere have gained you a great deal of credit among those of us who are reform-minded. Sir Richard spoke sincerely, and it might have been the truth. Adam wondered if the man understood what a double-edged sword such regard might be. I very much doubt the magistrate will agree to assign me to assist your efforts, said Adam. Yes, I'm aware of Mr. Burney's leanings and Mr. Townsend's. We were hoping you might agree to do what you could in an individual capacity. The committee's backers have agreed to put up a reward for bringing Edwards to us. Adam arched a brow. We're matching the amount for Thistlewood. One thousand pounds. Adam felt himself go very still. So, that same incentive that might have driven this Edwards to send eleven men to the gallows was being used to induce Adam to help save them. Before, he'd thought how it was an amount that might tempt any man. Now that it was presented to him, 
Adam felt keenly aware how much temptation it really was. He stood up. You'll have my answer tomorrow. That's all I ask. Sir Richard did not stand, but he stretched out his hand. Adam clasped it, reclaimed his hat, and elbowed his way through the crowd that spilled out the door and into the street. He walked to the corner and stopped as if to stretch his shoulders. Something itched at the back of his neck, and he did not like it. He looked up at the low clouds and made a fuss of turning up his collar. All the time he listened, trying to tease out each stray sound from the clamour of the midnight street. A man's silhouette detached itself from the shadows. Captain Gautier. They didn't bother to acknowledge each other. Adam began to walk, and Gautier simply fell into step beside him, the big man walked with a steady, measured stride that was an artefact of his years with the foot patrols. Well? Gautier asked. What was it all about? Sal gave me an earful for being out late. Reminds me I promised to give up nights. My apologies to Sal, said Adam. As to what it's about, I've been asked to find this Edwards character. By that toff. Adam nodded. His shoulders would not relax. Something was still wrong. That toff used to be the sheriff of London, he said. His hands remained loose at his sides, every inch of him on the alert. He's gone into politics since, and stands with the radicals. Seems he and his friends are keen on proving this Edwards is, or was, a government spy, and that the Cato men would not have gone so far in on their plot if he hadn't urged them all into it. Gautier considered this. He also rolled his shoulders. That was enough to tell Adam that Gautier felt it too. The sense of something out of step in the cold, crowded dark. Seems to me I heard you say something like that yourself, Gautier remarked. Seems to me I heard that too. Adam walked on in silence for a few steps, his ears still straining and his nerves still on the alert. Then he caught it. Seems to me that's not all I heard, he said softly, conversationally. Gautier glanced towards the heavens as if they were discussing the weather. Me either. They walked on. The way in front of them bent and narrowed. The windows in the buildings on either side were shuttered and the doors locked. There was nowhere to hide or to get away. They walked on. An alley opened on Gautier's left. It was as black as pitch and barely wide enough to let a man through. Well, here's me, said Gautier. Good night, Harkness. They clasped hands. Gautier turned down the alley and vanished into the dark. Adam continued up the street. Now that he was on his own, there was no mistaking the sounds behind him. A rustle of cloth, the scrape of a boot sole against the cobbles, he picked up a footpad. Adam kept his stride even and slow. The way in front of him curved toward the high street. He stepped out onto the cobbles and immediately had to dodge a couple of hardy souls who were amazingly still awake and sober enough to stand. Up ahead, at his right hand, was a shop with shutters covering its bowed windows. There was his chance. He walked past the window bay and then leapt backwards flattening himself against the shop's wall. A man's lean and slouching silhouette trotted right past him. Adam lunged. His fingers closed on the stranger's coat collar. Adam whirled around, swinging them both about and tossing his footpad straight into Samson Gautier's waiting arms. Gautier grabbed the footpad in a bear hug and lifted him off the ground. But the man had managed to keep one arm free. He grabbed Gautier's ear and twisted hard. Gautier cursed and held, but his grip must have loosened just enough. The footpad slithered to the ground. Adam grabbed for his coat again, but the man dodged. He landed a hard kick at Adam's ankle and then planted a fist in his stomach hard enough to double him over. Gautier grabbed at the man and shouted. Adam jerked upright. Gautier was scowling in pain, and their footpad was herring off down the street. Had a knife, grunted Gautier. His left hand clutched his right. There was just enough light for Adam to see the sheen of blood between his fingers. Damn, Adam cursed. He also pulled his kerchief out of his pocket. Here, let me see that. 
A scratch, said Gautier, but he held his hand out anyway. I'll get far worse from Sal when I get home. Did you get a look at him? Not a good one. Adam tied off the knot. He was muffled up to his eyes. I don't like this, Harkness. Gautier eyed the street uneasily. Not after that little meeting you just had. Nor do I, said Adam softly. Nor do I. Chapter 7 Family Matters He would have started with horror at the idea of disturbing the peace of a family, but in her family, he said, here was no peace to disturb. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Morning brought with it two pieces of good news. First, Kate was visibly improved and sleeping peacefully. Second, there was a note from Adam beside Rosalind's breakfast plate. All is well. I will call as soon as I can. Rosalind read the words and told herself she had never doubted it would be so. At the same time, she was conscious of breathing easier and finding that she had more appetite for Mrs. Singh's delicious milk and oat porridge than she had initially believed. She was also aware, however, that her day still contained significant challenges. Usually, when Rosalind had to pay a call on a lady she had not previously met, there was a great deal of preparation. She would write or call on mutual acquaintances to learn about the lady. She would review accounts in the newspapers of dinner parties or other entertainments to see where the lady's name appeared on guest lists. But there had been no time for her usual researches, and Rosalind arrived at the door of 24 Upper Brook Street, feeling unusually nervous. The church bells had just finished tolling the noon hour when Rosalind paid off her cab driver. The time for paying social calls began at 11, but to present oneself exactly as the social hour began could smack of desperation. Marianna Leverton's neighbourhood was not the height of popularity, but the house facades, as well as the uniforms and liveries on the servants who came and went, signalled wealth and fashion. The street itself was quiet. Only a few vans made their way down its well-maintained cobblestones. A manservant scrubbed the stairs at another house, a nurse pushed her pram sedately down the walk on the far side of the street. Two carriages waited in front of number 24 as Rosalind approached. The first was driving off, and a stout woman bundled in a blue coat and bonnet was hurrying down the steps toward the other. Mrs Leverton was having a busy morning. The house itself was not the largest in the street, but it was still substantial. Built of pale stone, it had the graceful colonnaded entrance and curved brick steps that had been the fashion a generation ago. The brass on the knocker and lamp had been well polished. Mrs Leverton might hold radical notions, but she nonetheless employed a staff that was diligent about the traditional housekeeping details. A footman in a neat, slate-blue uniform answered the door. Rosalind presented her card and asked whether Mrs Leverton was at home. I'm sorry. The footman glanced discreetly at her card. Miss Thorne, neither Mrs. Marianna Leverton nor Mrs. Beatrice Leverton is at home to visitors. This was, of course, merely a polite code for denying a person admittance. Mrs. Beatrice Leverton? This was not a name Rosalind had heard. She was again conscious of arriving at a disadvantage. My business is with Mrs. Marianna Leverton, said Rosalind, and I am afraid it is of a somewhat urgent nature. The footman remained unmoved. I am sorry, miss. I apologise for the inconvenience, said Rosalind, but perhaps I could leave my name in the visiting book. Many ladies kept a visiting book in their hallway. This practice allowed visitors to leave a note as well as their card. The footman bowed and stepped back, allowing Rosalind to enter the house. When she did, Rosalind was hard-pressed not to stare. The tiled and panelled foyer was filled with flowers. The house might have been celebrating a wedding or a funeral. Baskets of hothouse fruits waited among the flowers. The salver on the mahogany table beside the visiting book overflowed with cards and letters. Rosalind felt her brows inch upwards. She had just picked up the pen provided when a woman descended the polished oak stairs. Kinsley, the woman began, but stopped when she saw Rosalind. Miss Rosalind Thorne to call on Mrs. Marianna Leverton, said the footman, Kinsley, at once. 
Rosalind curtsied. I must apologise for intruding. I understand Mrs Leverton is not at home, but I had hoped to leave a note. The woman stepped closer. She was older than Rosalind. Grey streaked her dark hair. Her fine boned face looked wan and tired. Her black dress accentuated her naturally pale complexion. A widow. Rosalind realised there was something in the shape of the woman's jaw and the set of her eyes that reminded Rosalind sharply of Kate. Miss Thorne, the woman said. The Miss Thorne who is Lady Jersey's friend. I have the honour of the acquaintance, replied Rosalind. Lady Jersey was the leader of the board of patronesses for Almack's assembly rooms and one of the ruling powers among the Auton. The woman hesitated, clearly torn, but only for a moment. I am Mrs Beatrice Leverton. I don't wish to presume, but if you have a moment to spare, I would like to speak with you. Certainly, said Rosalind. Thank you. Beatrice Leverton turned to her footman. Kinsley, have some tea brought into the morning room. Kinsley bowed. Beatrice showed Rosalind through to a sunny room with curved walls painted green and decorated with plaster rosettes and wreaths. The bowed windows looked out onto a muddy, walled garden. Tentative shoots had just begun to poke through the sodden earth. It was a scene of fragile hope. A similar hope seemed to flicker behind Beatrice's dark eyes. You will forgive me if I seem importunate, Miss Thorne. I recognise we are not acquainted. However, I have heard something of your... She hesitated, searching for the correct word. Talent for assisting women with certain private difficulties. I hope I have been able to help my friends, Rosalind murmured. Having strangers recognise her name was still new to Rosalind, and not at all comfortable. Yes, your friends, echoed Beatrice, which I am not. I am not even the one you meant to call on, but the truth is I was just this morning planning on writing to you, and now you've arrived. It is as if I've been handed a gift. Despite her curiosity, Rosalind made sure to keep her expression calm. Is there something you wish to consult with me about? Very much. I... Her words seemed to choke her. Her hand strayed to her throat. My daughter is missing. Her words jolted Rosalind. Was this exhausted widow Kate's mother? I am very sorry to hear this, said Rosalind evenly. When was she last seen? Tuesday. We thought, I thought she was attending a private concert with friends. She spoke in a rush, voice and fluttering hands betraying her agitation but she did not return for dinner, or indeed at all. What steps have been taken? asked Rosalind. What do her friends say? Her friends say there was no concert, and they did not see her at all yesterday. Beatrice choked again, and Rosalind realised she was fighting to keep back a sob. Catherine must be found, Miss Thorne, said Beatrice. I must know that... She got no further. The door opened. Rosalind turned, expecting the tea, but instead... Two gentlemen entered. A single glance told Rosalind the first of them was related to both Kate and Beatrice. He looked to be perhaps thirty years of age and shared the family's dark hair and eyes as well as their delicate features. But for him, that fine boned face had a slightly dangerous cast, suggesting a cutting wit and unyielding opinion. In contrast, the second man had a round face and a ready smile. Combined with his wide-set blue eyes, it gave him an open, cheerful appearance. His dress was precise, but not the edge of fashion. The entire impression was one of a simple, plain-dealing sort. Rosalind rose to her feet. She felt the slender man's eyes drinking in her dress, her features and movement, and judging each thing he saw. Marcus! Harold! said Beatrice. What are you doing here? I came to hear how Aunt Mariana does. Marcus, the first of the men, kept his attention on Rosalind as he spoke. Has the doctor been? Not yet, replied Beatrice. However, the nurse says she is rather better this morning. This is Miss Rosalind Thorne, she added, gesturing toward Rosalind. Rosalind made a curtsy. Both men returned polite but brief bows. Miss Thorne, my eldest son, Marcus Leverton, and Mr Harold Davenport. Miss Thorne came to call on Mariana she told them. Mr. Leverton narrowed his eyes ever so slightly. We have not met, I think, 
he said, and I don't believe I've heard your name from my aunt. Meaning she was intruding and not to be trusted, at least not by him. I am sorry to inform you my aunt is not at home to visitors, Mr. Leviton went on. I trust you will be able to call again at another time. It was a complete dismissal. The only correct response was for Rosalind to take her leave. But the door opened again. This time it was the footman, Kinsley, with the tea tray, which he set down on the table. If you please, ma'am, he said to Beatrice, Mrs. Leviton is awake. She heard that Miss Thorne came to call and asks will she come up. She's awake, said Mr. Davenport, a trifle too brightly. But this is excellent news. I felt certain she would rally for us. I was just saying as much to Marcus. Mr. Leviton did not seem to share this sunny assessment. You may tell my aunt that Miss Thorne has already left, he said to Kinsley. You will excuse us, he added to Rosalind, but my aunt has been ill these past weeks. It is extremely inadvisable for her to tax her strength with visitors. I am sure Miss Thorne will stay no more than a moment, said Beatrice crisply. Nonetheless, said Mr. Leverton, I cannot allow... Beatrice, however, was not prepared to hear him out. I should not like to have to tell Aunt Mariana that you sent her caller away. The resulting agitation would not be good for her. Mr. Leverton's face tightened. Rosalind suspected that if she had not been here, he would have shouted. What's the harm, Leverton? inquired Mr. Davenport. If it will give your aunt a bit of distraction. Good for her, surely. And as your mother says, it will only be for a moment. Ever the diplomat, Davenport, said Mr. Leverton, and Rosalind suspected it was not meant as a compliment. If I am to be overridden, I suppose I can only beg that Miss Thorne will keep in mind what I have said. I assure you, Mr. Leverton, said Rosalind, I will stay no longer than necessary, and if Mrs. Leverton appears at all fatigued, I will leave at once. With that, Mr. Leverton stood back but there was no concession in his dark gaze as he watched Rosalind and his mother pass. As they left the room, he fell into step behind them, almost as if he felt they might break and run if he were not there to watch. Kinsley led the three of them back through the flower-filled hall. A woman in a feathered bonnet and silk cloak looked up from the visiting book. Beatrice, she cried and surged forward to grasp the widow's hands. Marcus, how does dear, dear Mariana? I thought she was not receiving today. She eyed Kinsley and Rosalind with equal suspicion. Marcus bowed stiffly. She is still very ill, Mrs. Shreveport. Miss Thorne is here on a matter of urgent business. Well, the lady had dark, bird-like and intensely curious eyes. Then I must not detain you. You will tell her I asked after her? Of course, replied Marcus coldly. Mrs. Shreveport took the hint and withdrew, allowing the little procession to continue up the stairs and into a dim boudoir. The fire had been built up high, and Mrs. Leverton huddled close beside it in a deep, comfortable chair. Layers of embroidered shawls wrapped her shoulders, and more had been piled over her lap. Netted, fingerless gloves covered her hands, Despite the fact that Mariana Leverton was seated and hunched, Rosalind thought she must be a tall woman. A grey flannel cap covered her snow-white hair. Her complexion was very pale and clear. She was also bone-thin, not merely slender but emaciated. Her eyes were sunken back into her head, but they still shone bright and fierce with her determination. An odour of sickness hovered around her, as thick and unyielding as the London fog, and Rosalind felt certain that nothing but force of will kept her upright in the chair. Rosalind remembered the grim tone of Adam's voice as he pronounced the word poison and felt a deep, slow chill creep up her spine. A woman in a nurse's grey daydress and white apron stood beside Mrs. Leverton's chair. Rosalind recognised her, but she had no chance to say hello. "'You are Miss Rosalind Thorne,' inquired Mrs. Leverton. Her voice was harsh and raw. Rosalind's skin prickled in sympathy to hear it. I thought you were acquainted, said Marcus. I apologise if there was any misunderstanding, Mr. Leverton, said Rosalind. Mr. Leverton was not placated. This is ridiculous. You must... Beatrice moved to protest. But it was Mrs. Leverton who spoke first. 
Marcus, she rasped. Be quiet or leave. I don't care which. Aunt, you are not well, Mr. Leverton declared. You cannot, Mrs. Leverton ignored this. Beatrice, if you cannot make your son keep still, take him out of here. My head is aching beyond endurance. And no, she added as the nurse stirred, I do not want a powder. I want to talk to Miss Thorne while I am still able to do so. But, began Marcus, get out, she shrilled. Marcus wavered, but evidently decided that the fight was not worth it yet. He returned a bow of extreme dignity and held open the door so his mother could exit first. No, she said, I'll stay if I may, she asked Mrs. Leverton. The old woman made a gesture of assent. Marcus's glance was equal parts measuring and a warning to his mother and to Rosalind. The door closed. Rosalind felt it like the closing of a prison cell. She called on her years of training to keep her face composed and placid. It must have been sufficient. You do not appear shocked by us, Miss Thorne, Mrs. Leverton sagged back in her chair. I can only assume that in your perambulations among the great and good you've seen worse. Illness and worry constrain the most patient families, replied Rosalind, and was amazed at how calm her voice sounded. She knew there were a hundred reasons Kate and her aunt might be ill, but the grim possibility of poison had settled deep into her mind, and she was having difficulty seeing past it. She took refuge in everyday courtesy. Mrs. Hepplewaite, said Rosalind to the nurse, how very good to see you here. Miss Thorne? Mrs. Hepplewaite curtsied. Mrs. Hepplewaite nursed a friend of mine, Rosalind told the Levitons. You are in excellent hands. I'm in God's hands, snapped Mariana. As are we all, replied Rosalind. <clears throat> a shudder ran through the older woman. She began to cough. Mrs. Hepplewaite moved instantly, leaning her back in the chair, putting a glass of water in her hand and helping her drink. Beatrice twisted her hands but made no move to help or to interfere. Rosalind did not let herself move or speak. She could barely breathe. When Mrs. Leverton recovered, she leaned back in her chair, her breath rattling and her throat straining. Sit down, Beatrice, she gasped harshly. You'll make yourself ill. I'm already ill. Beatrice snapped. My daughter is missing and nothing is being done. She was in your care. You promised you would watch over her. You promised. Sit. Sit. Mrs. Leverton's hand flapped impatiently. Beatrice sat. Another gesture from Mrs. Leverton indicated Rosalind should do the same. Rosalind obeyed, choosing the chair as far from the roaring fire as she could. Did my sister-in-law tell you of our missing girl? wheezed Mrs. Leverton. She told me her daughter has not been home since Tuesday, replied Rosalind softly. And I assume Marcus still won't approve any kind of search. Mrs. Leverton directed this question to Beatrice. Tears shone in Beatrice's dark, tired eyes. He says Kate's made her bed and can lie in it. He would. The man has raised disapproval to a high art. Beatrice pulled a crumpled handkerchief from her sleeve and held it to her nose. Anger coloured her pale cheeks, and the tears that had been building silently now began to fall. I am glad Beatrice contrived to send for you, Miss Thorne, said Mrs. Leverton. Rosalind did not correct her. Kate is reckless, but she is not a bad girl. We need her found. Without fuss, if that can be managed. May we count on your assistance? You may apply to me to cover any expense. Beatrice turned her distraught face to Rosalind. If there's anything you can do, please. Rosalind found she had to swallow a large portion of guilt. She reminded herself firmly that Kate was also in distress, that she had run from this house and her life could well be in danger. So could Mrs. Leverton's. Rosalind took a deep breath. It is my experience that young ladies who run away seldom go far, she said. Usually it is a gesture resulting from some intense but temporary discontent, and they are found safely lodged with friends. That is, if they have not eloped. 
Rosalind was unprepared for the effect the word would have on Beatrice. The woman blanched dead white and gripped her chair arm as if she might topple over. Kate did not elope, said Mrs. Leverton firmly. Have her rooms been searched for letters or other clues as to where she might have gone? Has she friends to whom she could apply for help? We did look, said Beatrice, but we found nothing. As for friends, Beatrice twisted her handkerchief. Kate has been living with me in Bath, said Mrs. Leverton. She has no acquaintance in London. In this, Mrs. Leverton was mistaken, but Rosalind could hardly say so. Mrs. Leverton's breath had begun to rattle in her throat. Mrs. Hepplewhite moved forward, and Mrs. Leverton clutched at her arm, her whole body shuddering. Rosalind got to her feet at once. Perhaps I could be shown Kate's rooms. I may be able to find something useful that was missed. I'll take you, said Beatrice. Beatrice took her out into the corridor and closed the door. Both of them pretended to ignore the sounds of distress that followed them as they walked on. Chapter 8 A Question of Responsibility We joined forces and nothing could stand against us. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda the sun had barely touched the rooftops when Adam descended the stairs of his family home. He was, however, far from the first one awake. The whole Harkness household rose early and got straight about the day's business. Adam's mother and his sister Meg were invariably up well before the sun. Adam was generally woken up by the sounds of the two of them, throwing open the shutters, feeding the hens and geese, gathering in the eggs and calling out to the neighbours as they came into the common yard for water from the pump. Then the kitchen fire must be lit, the porridge pounded and set to boil. Meg must take her basket to market, or, if some of the birds had been sold, meet the carter who would deliver them to the purchaser. Then, of course, Adam's two younger brothers must be roused from their beds. This was his task when he was home. The pair of sturdy boys were fast growing into gangly, sharp, loud youths with bottomless appetites. Once awake, both of them would be downstairs in an eye blink to polish off porridge, bread, cheese and butter before running out to their apprenticeships. The boys lived at home to save the cost of bed and board that would otherwise have to be paid to their masters. Adam's third brother, the only one of them who proved to have any patience for books or writing, was a warehouse clerk now and had his own rooms. Three months of the household egg money had gone to purchase Davy's black coat. Meg's two children were now old enough to dress each other. They came tumbling down the stairs along with the rest of the Harkness pack and climbed up on the benches at the long table. They joined in the talk and the teasing while his mother ladled scoop after scoop of her hot porridge into their wooden bowls. Eventually, his other sister Jenny would come across the yard to join them all, probably with her newest baby in her arms. Jenny and her husband had the house on the other side of the poultry yard. Tom was home from sea just now, but was as busy as if he was away. Like a number of ex-sailors, he'd found work in the Drury Lane Theatre, shifting scenery, doing carpentry work, rigging the ropes to fly the big flats in and out. This was the height of his theatre season, and he might be away twelve or more hours at a stretch. It was loud and chaotic. It was home. His family's cheerful madness never failed to lift Adam's spirits. For much of his life, he'd assumed he'd find a wife from one of the nearby streets, and they'd take another of the nearby houses and set about adding to the Harkness flock. Then he'd met Rosalind Thorne, and everything had changed in an instant. Now he did not know what his future would hold, except that it must somehow hold her. With the memory of Sir Richard and his thousand-pound reward lurking in the back of his mind, Adam sat down to bread and porridge, and to listen to his mother and Meg cheerfully berating all and sundry for their manners, their dress, and their failure to chew their food. The one thing Adam's father had handed down to his family was this house. It had belonged to Harknesses for generations, and it gave them the sort of safe haven too many of their neighbours lacked. But despite the house, money was always precarious. Even when his father was alive, there had been times when they'd gone hungry, and they might have to scrabble to find something to burn in the hearth. His sisters had gone into service for a time, 
and he'd been sent to relatives in the country. He'd been told it was for his health, but even as a boy, he'd known it was also to save the cost of his board. A thousand pounds could give his entire family a security they had never known before. It could also destroy the man he tried to be. A knock sounded, and the door to the street pushed open a moment later. Samson Gautier ducked under the low lintel, taking off his hat as he did so. Good morning, Captain Gautier, called Mother genially. Sit yourself down and have some breakfast. Thank you, but I've already had mine. Gautier did take a seat at the end of the bench and accepted the mug of tea Mother deposited in front of him. Since Gautier and Adam often worked together, Gautier would frequently stop by of a morning so the two of them could walk to the station together. Meg asked after Gautier's wife and infant son. Gautier settled comfortably into the noisy banter as Adam finished his breakfast, claimed his own hat and kissed his mother. Outside, the two men wove their way through the crowded streets and alleyways that defined Adam's neighbourhood. Here, houses were small and families were large, so much of life was lived out in the open. The streets were filled with women at work, children at play, and men passing to and fro, on their way to their own jobs, or to drink away what they'd already brought home. Adam noticed Gautier rubbing a spot behind his right ear. His wounded hand had been expertly wrapped in clean gauze. You all right? Adam asked. Poof! Gautier snorted dismissively. I've taken worse. I was surprised, that's all. Getting soft. He chuckled, but his eyes were serious. If I'll catch that fella again, we'll have words, him and me. I pity the fella then, said Adam easily. Decided what you're going to do yet? No, Adam admitted. Not really. I'm going to look at the statements again, see if I can pick up any hint that what Sir Richard says is true, that this Edwards engineered the business at Cato Street. And if it turns out he did, then I'll find him. You... One of Bow Street's most respected officers are going to expose a government spy, said Gautier. Mind if I ask why you'd do such a fool thing? Because I don't like the smell of this, said Adam. Siding with radicals now, Arkness. I don't know. Gautier shook his head. I don't understand you, Arkness. You've been tapped by Townsend as his favourite. The prince... The king knows your name and asks for you personally when he's got a job that needs doing, and you're getting ready to dance with their enemies. I know, said Adam. It makes no sense, man. I know. You're going to keep saying that? I don't know. Gautier barked out a laugh. Well, if I was you, I'd figure it out in a hurry. Straddling the fence is not safe. A man stays like that too long, he gets his balls caught. He paused. I hope you know at least you're being used. This Sir Richard and his friends, whoever they turn out to be, came to you because you can get into Bow Street's records and they can't. It's worse than that, said Adam. I'm being used and bribed. Gautier pursed his lips. How much? They're matching the reward for Thistlewood. A thousand pounds. Gautier swore. That's a sum to make a man think twice. Yes, breathed Adam. Yes, it is. So, that's what this waffling is about, then, said Gautier. You're trying to talk yourself round. Make sure you're not doing it just for the money. Adam said nothing. Gautier nodded. It's hell of a question. It is. Adam sighed in frustration. It's down to this. Sir Richard and his lot, they look at Peterloo, at Cato Street, and they say something's wrong here, we should try to fix it. His Honour, Mr Burney, and Townsend and their supporters all take a look at the same events and say we should punish these men until they're too broken to do any such thing again. Which side would you rather put your hands to? Gautier shook his head. This is your Miss Thorne's doing. What do you mean by that? said Adam more sharply than he'd meant to. But Gautier just arched a knowing brow. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing but respect for Miss Thorne. She's an amazing woman, but she has protections and privileges that you and I don't. 
There's those who will look out for her because she's one of them, born to their class. That's not something we can say. It rankled Adam to hear Gautier say as much so openly, but he couldn't argue. He knew full well that Rosalind belonged to a different class from him and had been raised to far different standards and expectations than he had been. She knew it too. He remembered one day she had come to visit his house. She had met all his madcap family and fit in among them cheerfully and easily. His sisters liked her, his mother did as well. The children adored her, and not just because she brought presents and sweets. She would laugh with them and run about the yard in games of chase and tell them stories and patiently answer their thousand questions. At the same time, he caught her surreptitiously watching his mother and all her work, especially her constant doings in the kitchen. He'd seen the dismay in her eyes then. Not that a woman should have to do so much, but in understanding that she had no idea how to manage a house, a family, without servants. And although she knew it was merely a matter of how she was raised, rather than a demonstration of worth, it had still stung her and left her with a strong feeling of being an outsider. He'd felt the same way the times he donned a black coat and white breeches and stepped out among the haute ton. There had been a thousand tiny rituals and silent understandings that he was not a part of. He'd also felt keenly how he was an object of curiosity and not a little disdain. He was also aware that Rosalind's own position was suspect just because she was too near to him. Oi, said Gautier, you still with us? Sorry, wool gathering. Gathering something, that's for sure, Gautier chuckled. Let me tell you what I know, Adam Harkness. Those in power plan to stay there. They're not going to tolerate tuppenny hateny revolutionaries. And you may have stood before the king, he may have praised your name, but if the men in charge decide you've betrayed them when they've been so very condescending to you, no member of parliament is going to be able to save your righteous arse. If you'd rather not be seen with me... Gautier regarded him soberly. What? I missed my chance to find the fellow that knifed me. Not a chance. He smiled, but the expression quickly faded. But just be careful, all right? I don't want to be explaining to Sal that we're going to be up and moving down to Botany Bay. You have my word. Well, there's a comfort, said Gautier blandly. What will you do in the meantime? I want to talk with this man Hyden, he said. He's the one who turned up in the park with a note about a mad conspiracy and was instantly believed. There's something going on there, and I want to know what it is. And then... And then we'll just have to see, said Adam, because whatever is there, it's got someone worried enough to murder some men, hide some others, and pay out a lot of money to make sure all goes their way. Chapter 9 The Contents of a Single Room Now he suspected her of artifice in every word, look, and motion. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Kate Leverton had plainly been allowed to decorate her own rooms. Rosalind could not imagine that Mrs. Leverton would have chosen so much rose pink, nor such a quantity of ruffles. Beatrice drifted to the vanity table and rested her fingertips on its surface, as if it could offer a touchstone to her daughter. Rosalind's guilt swelled. She abhorred secrets. She had watched them destroy her family. But Kate had asked for Rosalind's confidence and Rosalind had given it. She was not ready to break that promise. Not even while she watched Kate's mother struggle to control her grief and anger. Mrs. Leverton, why was Kate sent to live with her aunt? She asked. She knew the answer, of course, but she wanted to know what Beatrice would say. There was some trouble with the servant, Beatrice told her. She did not look at Rosalind. Instead, she straightened the mirror and the hairbrush on the table. It was thought better that Kate not be in town for a while. Mrs. Leverton seemed quite settled in Bath, so we thought... But she did not finish her thought. Do Kate and Mrs. Leverton get along? Beatrice glanced towards the door. 
I did not have much contact with her after she went to stay with Mariana. I believed her to be happy enough. Mariana can be a hard woman, but she is not cruel. She was very willing to take Kate into her care. At the time, I thought it would be better than keeping her at home. She looked to the door again. Her father, my husband, he was very angry at her conduct. As was Marcus, prompted Rosalind. Yes, Marcus was already married at the time and had his own establishment. I only went to live with him and his family after my husband died. She smoothed down the skirt of her morning dress. But, well, he takes great care of his reputation. I understand. Do you? Beatrice's voice sharpened. You have no children, Miss Thorne. Do you understand what a blow it is to find you were entirely mistaken in their nature? And to discover that what you've tried to do for them has only made matters worse? This last word hung in the air. Beatrice drew back, biting her lip. I'm sorry. You will forget that, if you please. It's only that it has been so difficult. Think no more of it, said Rosalind. I had better go make sure of Marcus, Beatrice said. Will you be all right? She stopped. How ridiculous of me. I... I shall be perfectly all right, Rosalind assured her. But may I ask a favour? If it will help anything, can you ask Mrs. Hepplewhite to come speak with me? Beatrice frowned. The nurse? But why? It is possible Mrs. Hepplewhite saw or heard something that could help us. And as she knows me, she may be more willing to speak in confidence than, than one of the other servants. Beatrice finished for her. Yes, of course, I'll see to it. Rosalind closed the door behind Beatrice. She stood there for a moment, willing herself to breathe calmly. It was not easy. Her hands trembled, and the unwelcome sensation of tears prickled behind her eyes. She swallowed to clear her throat, and swallowed again. Sitting and speaking calmly with Mariana Leverton may have been the most difficult thing she had ever done. A lifetime's training had given her the ability to set aside her feelings, no matter how violent, and maintain that polite and disinterested facade required of a gentlewoman in a social setting. But this was different. Mariana was obviously ill to the point of death, and the cause of it might well be a slow and deliberate act of murder. And she might already have spoken with the perpetrator. Rosalind was not a cynic. She had seen for herself the good inside most people. Still, she knew that resentments within families could grow intensely bitter and that there was no easy way to escape them. Rosalind closed her eyes and drew in another breath. I must be calm. I must think. Rationally, she knew she could be putting too much weight on Adam's words. It was possible that he had been wrong and there was no poison. Kate, reckless and distracted by something, had succumbed to a girlish impulse, left the house and wandered the streets until she'd found Amelia in the market. Her illness could simply be the result of exposure and exhaustion. Mrs Leverton's poor health could be the unfortunate consequence of age and infection. She wanted it to be true, but she needed to be certain. Rosalind turned to face the pretty boudoir. Where does a girl hide what's important? Her gaze swept the room. Not under the bolsters or mattresses. The maids would find anything there when they turned and aired the beds. So where? Rosalind sat down at the writing desk. It was a delicate, spindle-legged affair. The writing area was covered in leather. An inkwell, pens and a letter opener were all laid out, ready for use. The body of the table had three drawers. The central drawer held paper, quills, pen knife and shell pink sealing wax. The left hand drawer held a quantity of stationery, printed with an elaborate curling C. Kate might have been sent here in disgrace, but Mrs Leverton had not hesitated to spend money on her niece. The right hand drawer held correspondence, bundled in ribbons of various colours. A quick glance suggested they were missives from various friends. Rosalind was not yet ready to read Kate's letters, although it might still come to that. She had not, however, really expected to find anything there. If Kate was so cavalier with her secrets, they would have already been discovered. 
Like the writing desk, the jewel cabinet was unlocked. Rosalind pulled out the drawers. There were some very nice pieces, but nothing of enormous value. She closed these as well and turned to face the room, a frown furrowing her brow. Then she spotted the work basket by the chair at the window. Rosalind opened the lid and rummaged through it. She found reels of thread, a half-completed bit of fancy work, a glove with loose beading and a silk reticule with a torn seam. Rosalind plucked the reticule out of the basket and paused. It crinkled stiffly in her hand, like there was something inside. Impatiently, Rosalind picked at the knotted drawstring until it gave. Two paper slips slithered out onto the floor. Rosalind picked them up and was instantly assailed by memory. She had been a girl, searching through her father's desk. Father had abandoned the family. Mother was in her room, insisting that nothing was wrong, and she cried herself into a collapse if anyone suggested otherwise. Rosalind, with the help of the family's housekeeper, was looking for any clue as to where her father had gone, or, failing that, any money or notes he might have left behind. What Rosalind had found instead was an entire drawer of receipts, very similar to these two. They were pledges from a pawnbroker, from several pawnbrokers in her father's case. The ones in Rosalind's hand now both came from a single shop, Temple and Trigg. According to the tidy handwriting, the first slip was a pledge against a gold and topaz necklace. The second was against a matching bracelet. Well, Rosalind slid the receipts back into the bag and re-knotted the cord. The fact of the pledges made sense. If Kate had been planning to run away, she would need money. Still, it seemed odd that Kate would seek a loan against her jewellery rather than try to sell it outright. But if she had been planning to leave and thought far enough ahead to get herself some money, then it made no sense that she would be found alone, ill and destitute in the market. The most naive schoolgirl could not expect to get very far on foot without luggage and travelling clothes. And why, of all things, would she decide to just wander about on the chance of meeting Amelia? Rosalind's thoughts halted in their tracks. Amelia had told Rosalind and Alice that Kate had come to her a week ago. What had she said? Rosalind frowned, trying to remember. I brought her to the house, she'd said. She needed to leave Mrs. Leverton's house. She asked... She asked if I could help her. I said she should talk to you, but she wouldn't listen. She left. What Amelia did not say was whether or not she had helped Kate. Rosalind's frown deepened. Was it possible Kate had left something behind at the house, such as a box or even a trunk? Could Kate have arranged to meet Amelia in the market to retrieve it? Had this plan been complicated by the fact of Rosalind and Alice impulsively deciding to accompany Amelia that day? Amelia had certainly not been in the best mood that morning, oddly snappish and distant, Alice had remarked that Amelia had been off lately. Rosalind, preoccupied with her own business, had set this aside to be dealt with later. That was beginning to seem like a mistake. A knock sounded on the door. Rosalind, on a moment's impulse, tucked the pawnshop receipts into her sleeve. Come in, she said. The door opened and Mrs. Hepplewhite walked in. I was told you wished to talk to me. Yes, thank you. Mrs. Hepplewhite carefully closed the door. When she turned again, she stood ramrod straight, her hands folded in front of her. I never had a chance to say so, Miss Thorne, but I always appreciated the care you took over Julia Oslander. It wasn't fair what happened to her, and you tried to do right. Julia Oslander had also been a nurse. She had died of violence, and Rosalind had a role in discovering the perpetrator. A number of Mrs. Oslander's fellow nurses had attended her funeral. Mrs. Hepplewhite had been among them. Thank you, Mrs. Hepplewhite. That means a great deal to me. Rosalind knew a moment's indecision. But she pushed it aside. The consequences of inaction were too dire. She could risk a bit of embarrassment. I have something to tell you, but I confess I have no idea how to begin. Rosalind paused. 
This is for the moment in confidence. Mrs. Hepplewhite raised her brows. To begin with, I know where Kate Leverton is. Mrs. Hepplewhite's face betrayed not the least surprise. You'll pardon me for saying so, Miss Thorne, but her aunt and her mother would like very much to know that. Yes, I haven't said anything because there is a very real possibility that the young woman has been poisoned. Mrs. Hepplewhite's face remained impassive. Rosalind supposed that as a nurse she'd heard a great deal of speculation and suspicion in the sick room. Has she had a doctor? Mrs. Hepplewhite asked. Indeed she has. Does the doctor agree with this possibility? He has not yet rendered an opinion, said Rosalind. I would not have spoken at all if it were not for the possibility that the same poison is being administered to Mrs. Leverton. That finally caused Mrs. Hepplewhite to draw back, startled into an expression of affront and anger. What manner of poison is this supposed to be? Arsenic. She waited for Mrs. Hepplewhite to protest and was prepared for her shock and her rejection of this possibility. But the nurse was silent. Her eyes flickered back and forth, searching her own memory and experience. I've never seen a case myself, she said at last, but I have heard of it. It... it could be. But it also could be any of a hundred other things, and no one else in the house is ill. Except Kate, said Rosalind. She was near to death when my maid found her. Mrs. Hepplewhite's face hardened. This is a very ugly thing you're saying, Miss Thorne. I hope you've no intention of telling my patient. I would certainly like to avoid it. Mrs. Hepplewhite did not seem at all reassured by this, and Rosalind could not blame her. And I am aware I am prying. But could you tell me if there is anything Mrs. Leverton eats or drinks that is not shared by the rest of the house? Mrs. Hepplewhite was quiet again. Rosalind held her breath. The nurse could refuse to answer. She could declare that Rosalind had no business making such accusations. No, said Mrs. Hepplewhite at last. The barley water, perhaps, but I prepare that myself, so there can be no question it is wholesome. The rest is prepared by the cook, and that means the servants might share in what's left at any time, and any broth or stock might be made into other dishes for the house. She paused then. Something had occurred to her. Rosalind's heart thumped once. There's the tea, Mrs. Hepplewhite spoke slowly, as if making some reluctant confession. Rosalind waited. Mrs. Laverton is particular about her tea, the nurse said. She has a special order standing with Mr. Twining, and she keeps it in a locked caddy. You know how some ladies are. Rosalind shared a look with Mrs. Hepplewhite. They both did indeed know this. Most days she's had me make her a cup. Mrs. Hepplewhite clamped her mouth shut to keep the next words from escaping. No, I wouldn't credit it. That would mean someone in the house, which is why I don't like to say where Kate is just yet, said Rosalind. I won't believe it. This is a respectable house. She spoke firmly, waiting for Rosalind to contradict her. I could very well be wrong, Rosalind admitted, but it is also true that since she has been with us, Kate has improved. And you say that no other member of the house has become ill, which would argue against an infectious complaint. Rosalind knew she did not need to say this. She could already tell that Mrs. Hepplewhite had thought it. Mrs. Hepplewhite drew herself up. I won't believe it. With all due respect, Miss Thorne, you're wrong this time. I sincerely hope so. Rosalind put every bit of feeling she had into the words. All I ask is that you help me eliminate the possibility. Mrs. Hepplewhite said nothing, but at least she was not refusing out of hand. Will you stop giving her that particular tea, for a week only, to see if she grows stronger? If she does not improve, then I am indeed wrong, and I will not importune you with my suspicions again. If she should improve, however... That would not necessarily mean you were correct. No, agreed Rosalind, but isn't it worth the attempt? Mrs. Hepplewhite was silent for a long time. Rosalind put all her energies into remaining calm and quiet. 
If she pressed too hard, the nurse would simply turn away from her. The knock sounded like a thunderclap. Both women jumped. The door opened and a man leaned in. Harold Davenport. Hello, Mr Davenport smiled tentatively. Miss Thorne, was hoping I might have a word. You'll excuse me. Mrs Hepplewhite made a brief curtsy and was gone. Rosalind struggled to keep her hands from curling into fists. Do please come in, Mr Davenport, she said. Thank you. Mr Davenport did come in. He also left the door wide open, as propriety demanded. Rosalind again noted his round, open face and cheerful blue eyes. His hair and clothing were very neat. It was clear he took care of his appearance. She was particularly struck by his hands, which were scrupulously clean, with carefully trimmed and polished fingernails. I was wondering had you found anything. Family is all in a twist, and nothing I say seems to calm them down. Not good for anybody, especially not Mrs. Mariana. Pardon me for asking, Mr. Davenport, but what is your relation to the family? Mr. Davenport chuckled. No one's thought to mention it to you, have they? His expression shifted to one of self-deprecation. You see, Kate and I were, are, I hope, engaged to be married. Chapter 10. The Boundaries of Friendship No, secrecy is my first object. Nay, do not reason with me. It is a subject on which I cannot, will not, reason. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda How does our patient? asked Mrs. Singh as Amelia entered the kitchen. Amelia blinked heavily at her. Mrs. Singh tusked and pushed a cup of tea to her. Amelia drank gratefully. She was used to long nights and longer days, but just now she felt like she'd been put through a mangle. All those hours just watching Kate breathe, finding herself full of all her old feelings one minute, but filled with nothing but fury the next, and not knowing what to do. Miss Alice knew she'd been lying. She was sure of it. And what Miss Alice knew, Miss Thorne knew. She's awake, said Amelia belatedly. I was hoping there might be something I could take her. Certainly there is. I've been keeping it warm for her. Mrs. Singh turned to the pot on the stove and ladled out a bowl of her special porridge. Mrs. Singh had opinions about gruel and English cooking in general. They tended to range from inedible to unspeakable. Thank you, said Amelia extra politely. Now was not the time to risk one of the cook's lectures. I'll take the tray. You've enough to do. Thank you. Mrs. Singh set the bowl of porridge in place. Make sure she eats it all. She needs her strength, poor thing. I will, Amelia promised. Mrs. Singh added the teapot and cup to the tray. Then she paused and looked Amelia directly in the eye. Our missus are very kind, she said. I would be very sorry to see their good hearts leading this house into trouble. Amelia wanted to scream, or at least snap back. But it wouldn't make anything better. Mrs. Singh had eyes and ears of her own. What's more, the cook had become protective of this job and this house, where she was fully respected for her skills and experience. Mrs. Singh would fight to protect what she had, and there were plenty of ways she could make Amelia's life miserable if she chose. I'd be sorry too, Mrs. Singh, believe me. I do believe you, said the cook, but we may believe and still be sorry. Amelia tried to muster her temper. She'd been looking out for Miss Rosalind and Miss Alice far longer than Mrs. Singh. Who was this woman to suggest Amelia didn't care for them, or for this house? but making trouble was the last thing she could afford. So Amelia swallowed all her feeling and took the tray. Upstairs, she shouldered the door to Kate's room open without knocking. She turned around and froze. Kate, shaky as a newborn lamb, stood beside her bed. Amelia gaped. You bloody idiot! What are you doing? Kate gasped, lost her balance and collapsed back onto the bed. Amelia dropped the tray onto the table and rushed to her. Do you want to break your silly neck? 
She rolled, shoved and generally manhandled Kate back under the bedclothes. I'm sorry, Kate gasped. I'm so sorry. So you keep saying, fumed Amelia. If you was as sorry as all that, you might try doing as you're told. Will you help me? Kate whispered. What have I been doing? Amelia demanded. You're here, aren't you? Instead of dead in the gutter, which I'm starting to believe you deserve. Kate turned her face away. Maybe I do. Oh, stop it. Here. Amelia grabbed up the tray and set it over Kate's lap. Eat your porridge and get some of that tea in you as well. Amelia dropped into the bedside chair and folded her arms. And I'm staying right here until you finish. All of it. Kate eyed the bowl uncertainly. Amelia nodded. If you don't, I'll have Mrs. Singh after me, so you may as well get started. Remembering Kate's sweet tooth, Amelia had included a bowl of sugar lumps on the tray. Kate stirred three into her porridge. She ate slowly at first, and then with more appetite. Amelia felt her anger soften, at least a little. It felt a bit like old times. Back then, Amelia would bring Kate her breakfast in bed, and then they'd sit giggling about whatever party Kate had been to and how ridiculous everybody there was. Eventually, those giggles would turn to whispers of their dreams, their feelings, and what they'd do as soon as they were able to run away. A slow warmth stole over Amelia, followed fast by anger at herself. How could she let her mind linger over those times? She already knew how that story ended. Didn't she? Kate poured herself a cup of tea, added two more sugar lumps and drank. Amelia, she said softly. Yes? What? What did you tell them about me? Treacherous warmth faded away, smothered by other, colder memories. You mean about us? Well, yes, and about my coming here. You know what I told them, said Amelia warily, that you asked for my help to run away. They want to know why you came to me. I want to know why. But you didn't tell them, asked Kate. I mean, you've still got my bag and everything. Amelia sighed. Yes, I've still got your bag. But if you think I'm going to help you leave this house before you can even stand up, no, no, I just, I just wanted to know it was safe. I'll behave, I will. Look. She took another big spoonful of porridge. Mmm, I feel better already. She smiled so sweetly that for a moment Amelia forgot to be annoyed with her, but only for a moment. What's going on, Kate? Why did you come? Why'd you come bother me? When I'd gotten over you, when I'd found a situation I'd never imagined, when I'd found someone real. Kate's face fell. I thought you'd be pleased to see me. Amelia made herself ignore that woe-begone look. I've seen it before. Why would I, after what you did? You said you loved me. And you said I seduced and threatened you. I didn't. That was my brother cried Kate, but Amelia glared at her and she stopped. I had to go along, Amelia. You know I did. Papa threatened to put me out on the street with just what I stood up in if I didn't swear whatever it said was true. Did you even once think what they do to me? Did you even look out of the window to see me in the street? In the street, turned out without a character or my wages? It's easy for someone like you, said Kate. Amelia felt her jaw drop. Easy, she sputtered. Is that what you think? Of course it is, Kate snapped. You can always get another situation. I was the one who was stuck with them. She jerked her chin towards the door, as if her family waited on the other side. Just what do you think you know about it? Amelia demanded. You've never had to face a night without a roof over your head. Never had to wake up in the morning with no idea how you were going to live. I spent a month not knowing where my next meal was coming from and none of the registry office would touch me because I had no reference. If Miss Thorne hadn't come along, I'd have had to... She stopped. She wasn't going to say it. She didn't want to remember that she'd been hungry enough to think of going on the game. But she had. Kate was staring. 
I thought I was giving you your freedom, she whispered. More freedom than I'd ever have. Well, you were wrong. Amelia slumped backward in her chair, suddenly exhausted. Kate stirred her spoon through her porridge. Finally, she asked, Do you love her? That Alice Littlefield? Amelia looked away. I saw the way you looked at her. That is none of your business, muttered Amelia. Kate set her spoon down. I still love you, Amelia, she whispered. I never stopped. I tried to find you. The second I got back to London, I went to every registry office I could, trying to find where you'd gone. You're just saying that because you need me. I'm saying it because it's true. Kate leaned across the tray. Amelia made the mistake of looking into her earnest, pleading eyes. Listen, things have changed. I've got money now. When I leave here, you could come with me. Amelia felt her heart clench hard. What are you talking about? Kate clasped her hand and Amelia felt a rush of treasonous warmth. Come with me, Amelia, she said eagerly. We can go to Paris like we talked about, or Italy, Geneva, New York, anywhere. You're serious? Yes. I love you, Amelia. Please. Kate squeezed her fingers hard. Come with me. Amelia stared at their hands. Every inch of her remembered Kate's touch. How warm it made her. How strong and daring she'd felt when they were alone together. I... I'll think about it. Will you? Will you really? Yes, I promise. Because I can't help it now, can I? Kate smiled the sunshine smile that Amelia remembered so well. All right, then. She took her last spoonful of porridge. There, she said triumphantly. You can tell Mrs. Singh you saw me eat every bite. Good girl. Amelia stood and picked up the tray. I'll leave you the tea. You get some rest now. Yes, ma'am. Mischief sparkled in Kate's eyes. You'll come back soon. Amelia promised and tried not to look like she was hurrying out the door. Amelia took the tray back down to the kitchen and reported to Mrs. Singh that Amelia had indeed eaten it all. In return, Mrs. Singh reported that Miss Alice had asked to see her. Amelia swallowed and said she'd go at once. She turned away before she had to watch Mrs. Singh's eyes narrow. Miss Alice had claimed the back parlour as her own. Amelia knocked on the door and went in. The parlour was a riot. Occasionally, Amelia made an attempt at tidying, but there was no keeping up with it. Books and papers covered every surface. No fewer than three stacks of newspapers teetered on chairs and footstools. Miss Alice sat at her work table, bent so low over the typeset sheet she called page proofs, that her nose all but touched the paper. Did you need something, miss? asked Amelia. I need Mr. Coburn's typesetter to get a new pair of spectacles, Alice muttered. How can one man make so many mistakes? She drew her pencil through a line and wrote a note in the margin. Then she tossed her pencil down and sat back with a sigh. How's Miss Leverton doing? she asked. She's much better, said Amelia. I think the doctor will be pleased. Well, that's good. Did she tell you anything about why she's run away? Amelia shook her head. I tried to get her to talk, but she's stubborn. The second part was true. The first, a bit less so. The truth was, she'd been so wrapped up in the fact of Kate asking her to run away too, that she'd forgotten to ask why she was running at all. Or maybe it was because Kate had been wanting to run as long as Amelia had known her. Well, we'll have to trust to Rosalind's wits then. Alice got up and poured herself a cup of coffee from the pot that waited on the hearth. Miss Thorne! Amelia felt a cold knot of fear forming in her stomach. What's she? Alice drank the coffee and made a face. Probably she found it too strong. How long had it been sitting there? Knowing Miss Alice, it might well have been from yesterday. Don't say anything to Kate just yet, Miss Alice told Amelia, but Rosalind's gone to see her aunt. The knot of fear tightened sharply. But Kate... 
Miss Leverton, she doesn't want any of that lot to know where she is. It's all right. Alice waved her cup. Rosalind won't give the game away. She's got a plan. She always does. That was true, and usually it was a good plan. But the fear remained. Miss Alice, of course, saw something was wrong. Amelia, she said, and the gentleness in her voice cut straight through to Amelia's battered heart. It's just you and me here. If you have something, anything, you want to tell me, you know I won't say a word if you don't want me to. Not even to Rosalind. Those eyes. Those beautiful brown eyes. She could just drown in them. Every time Amelia saw even a little bit of disappointment in Alice's eyes, she wanted to cry or to fight the whole world just to make Miss Alice smile again. Everything was so different with her. Miss Alice listened when Amelia talked, and she understood what she heard. She'd been knocked around a bit, Miss Alice had, and she knew how much it meant to have something real to hold on to. Someone real. She didn't spin daydreams about Paris and Geneva. She talked about a little house, maybe, in Cheapside, a bit of garden, books for her and a job outside service for Amelia. They'd already spent so much time together. All those hours, just the two of them, as Alice patiently taught Amelia to read out of the newspapers and novels from Mr. Clements's circulating library. Amelia had tried to repay the favour by teaching Alice to sew, which only led to the pair of them laughing in despair at her attempt to alter her own frocks. They'd even gone out walking in the park together, and to the theatre, and fireworks display, and the panorama in Hyde Park. Just two friends having a day out, not hiding a thing. Well, maybe hiding something. Amelia bit her lip. Alice set the coffee cup on the mantel, and instead took Amelia's hand. It'll be all right, Amelia. Whatever it is, we'll work it out together. I know. Amelia closed her fingers around Alice's. Such a tiny hand, but so different from Kate's. Miss Alice's hands were rougher, ink-stained and stronger. Clever. Capable. Amelia wanted to believe. She didn't want to be bothered by old feelings and old dreams, but they were inside her, and she couldn't let them go. She made herself smile, and made herself mean it. Alice leaned in and swiftly kissed her cheek. I'll let you go. We've both got work. Amelia smiled and blushed and hurried away, and tried not to see the flicker of doubt in Miss Alice's eyes as she closed the door. Chapter 11 The Best Laid Plans He is not a man whose whole consequence, if he were married, would depend on his wife. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda I'm sorry, said Rosalind to Mr Davenport, whose smile had not shifted one iota. I had no idea Kate was engaged. Well, the thing hasn't been formally announced yet, Mr Davenport told her, but I proposed and she accepted and we have Mrs Leverton's approval, which is the important thing. He rolled his cheerful eyes toward the door. We'd thought to wed quickly, you know, he went on, so that Mariana could be there. At least I thought that was the plan. He rubbed his hands together uneasily. Kate, it seems, had other ideas. Despite his polished nails, Mr Davenport's hands were rough around the edges, Rosalind noted. This was a man who had done hard work in his life. Forgive me, Mr Davenport. Rosalind found herself struggling to catch up with the new ideas and fears that this sudden announcement raised in her mind. But I don't seem very upset about losing my bride, Mr Davenport suggested. Just so agreed Rosalind. She appreciated his plain speaking, but at the same time she wondered at it. Well, I know Kate, you see. Rosalind prepared herself to hear that Kate was headstrong and reckless and needed to be taken in hand. Again, she was surprised. Kate's smart, Mr Davenport went on. Like her aunt, sharp as a new pin, if truth be told. He paused and then smiled genially. I've surprised you, haven't I? 
I'm not like other men, Miss Thorne. They may want a pretty, docile little thing to decorate their dining table and dither over choosing a dress, but I prefer spirit and intellect. Rosalind permitted her brows to rise. I've tried to tell Marcus that Kate's too smart to be bullied about, but the man will simply not listen. Mr Davenport shook his head. Miss Thorne, I know everyone is worried. I'm worried, but I'm not frightened yet, and I won't be. Not without reason. It's my opinion that if Kate's left us, it's because that's what she wanted. And if... He stopped and took a deep breath. If you do find her, will you tell her that if she ran away because of me, there's no need? If she wants to cry off the engagement, I'll take the blame, and there won't be any trouble. This was quite generous, and frankly as surprising as anything he'd said yet. Not many freshly jilted men would be prepared to consider a nervous fiancé's feelings, let alone be willing to take the blame. Rosalind found herself impressed. Or she would have, except for the memory of Kate, lying so very ill in her bed, possibly poisoned, and that of Mrs Leverton upstairs, probably dying. These facts cast a cloud over the whole of the house and all its occupants. If I may ask, Mr Davenport, said Rosalind, how did you come to know the family? I worked for old Mr Leverton, Mrs Mariana's husband. He took me into the business when I was a boy. Mr Davenport chuckled, practically raised me if the truth be known. I spent some years as a mining engineer and then became a foreman. I'm head of the business now. We've got twelve shafts open and... He stopped, suddenly aware he was running down a tangent. But that's not what you want to hear. I used to visit Mrs Leverton in Bath and give her reports on how the mines were doing. Do you mean to say Mr Leverton left his business in his wife's hands? This was past unusual. It was shocking. Oh yes, lock, stock and barrel. Only fair, you know, she ran the whole concern almost from the day she married him. Rosalind felt herself staring. Mr Davenport nodded. From what I've heard, old Leverton was running things straight into the ground when he married. Don't get me wrong, Miss Thorne, he was a good man and an excellent engineer, but he had no head for business. Talk of money just made him impatient. Anyway, as I heard the story, just when all looked lost, Mrs Leverton took the reins. She sacked all the fellows who were skimming off the cream, hired new crews under new terms and kept the books herself. When there was finally some profit from the mines, she took that money and poured it into London property and other businesses. There's two breweries, if I recall, and a carting business and a stagecoach line, and I don't know what else. When she's in health, she runs it all herself. I just look out for the mines. And what does Marcus Leverton do? Runs through his income and fumes that his aunt ought to have handed him all businesses when her husband died. Wears it like the proverbial crown of thorns. He smiled, indicating he knew that might be taken as a pun on her name. She smiled in return to let him know she had heard all the possible puns and was more than ready to ignore them, thank you. May I ask why Marcus doesn't approve of you marrying Kate? Mr Davenport arched his brows. Should have thought it obvious, Miss Thorne, especially to a woman of your experience. I'm not of their class, am I? He held up his rough hands. Orphan boy, parents are God knows who, marrying a gently reared lady like Kate Leverton. Not to be thought of. He chuckled again. Rosalind returned a polite smile and hoped he hadn't seen her wince. Then there was the money, of course. Mrs Mariana planned to gift us with the mines when I married Kate and a good share of the profits from her other businesses to go with them. She surely knew that would make her family angry. She didn't care. They'd never welcomed her, she said, no matter how hard she tried. Hectored and hounded her after Leverton died. Saw that for myself, he added, and some of his habitual levity dimmed. At any rate, after years of that sort of thing, she does not now see it as her particular responsibility to look after them. Then, Mrs Mariana Leverton, began Rosalind, is old Mr Leverton's second wife, said Mr Davenport. I see said Rosalind. Yes, I rather expect you do, said Davenport gravely. Were you aware of Miss Leverton's and Mrs Leverton's quarrels with the rest of the family? Oh, yes. 
Kate made sure I was. Yelled at me, actually. He rubbed his hands together again. I'd scared her a bit, you see, with my proposal. She couldn't believe I meant what I said and tried to frighten me off. But I'm not like other men, Miss Thorne. A girl has as much right to her past as I have to mine. Marriage is a fresh start for all concerned. That was the second time Mr Davenport had declared himself unlike other men, Rosalind noted. He clearly valued his own unique qualities. She had to admit, however, that his was a refreshingly candid attitude. Did Mrs Leverton urge Kate to accept you? She told me confidentially that she hoped Kate would. She wasn't going to insist on it or threaten to cut her off or any of that sort of nonsense, but she did hope. She has always taken an interest in me, you see. Maybe, he glanced toward the door, because she's never had a son of her own. And how did Everett feel about the match? She had not yet met Kate's second brother, and she wondered which side of the family divide he stood on. It's hard to know what Everett feels about anything, said Mr Davenport. His goal in life is to smooth things over and make everybody happy. Unfortunately, Mr Davenport sighed, he's not very good at it. Always seems to think a big dramatic gesture will do the trick. Like the dinner the night before Kate ran off. Dinner? echoed Rosalind. Oh yes, Everett got Marianna's permission to borrow her dining room for a supper party. Me, Kate and a few friends. But what he didn't tell anybody was that those few friends were Marcus and Wilhelmina. The idea was, if we'd all sit down together with Marianna, if she was strong enough, we could all talk through our differences. And it did not work. Mr Davenport looked towards the ceiling for patience. Utter disaster. Marcus refused to speak at all. Poor Wilhelmina tried to keep up the conversation, as did Everett. Kate seemed determined to give everyone a piece of her mind. When it was time for us fellows to settle down with the port, Marcus spent a good quarter of an hour abusing his brother for a fool. I thought it was going to come to blows. And Kate's mother? Beatrice retreated early, pleading a headache, I think. Rosalind remembered Beatrice's despairing words about her children's natures and found she could well understand that she might prefer solitude to watching yet another quarrel between them. But did Beatrice approve of your proposed marriage? Oh yes, she was all for it. Thought it would settle Kate down, he chuckled. Usually what they say about the man, isn't it? It was. Mr Davenport did not seem to need settling. But neither did he seem to have much depth to him. The way he talked, the smile on his face and in his eyes, they all left Rosalind feeling that she was missing something. Or that he was. Anyway, Mr Davenport continued, I've said more than I should and not a lot of it to the point. What I meant to tell you was, if there's anything I can do to help, you've only to say the word. Beatrice knows where I can be found. He hesitated. Unless there's anything I can do now, of course. Rosalind considered. Can you tell me anything about the time before Kate left? Whether there was any change in her or in the family's attitude toward her? Or if she seemed preoccupied or anything of the kind? Well, she was worried about old Mrs Leverton, of course. We all were. And moving back to London wasn't the easiest thing for her either, I think. Having her mother in the house was worse. Rosalind felt her brows arch. Beatrice is living here. Oh, yes. Came to help out, as they say. Came to get away from Marcus, I should imagine. His mouth puckered. Beatrice had been staying with Marcus and his family since her husband died. That would be a bit over a year now. I'd imagine that would be plenty, and then some. Anyway, she's been trying to mend things between Mrs Leverton and Kate, but it was slow going, even when Everett could resist shoving his oar in. This time, Rosalind felt there was a real bite in Mr Davenport's words. And this was before Mrs Leverton became ill. Mr Davenport scratched his chin. Happened about the same time, I think. Mrs. Leverton blamed some bad oysters initially, but the thing never seemed to clear up. Kate was ill too, I believe. Oh no, slightly bilious here and there, but never really sick. Not as long as I've known her. Which argued for a strong constitution, and not one that could be destroyed by a single night out in the rain. But neither did it fit with a speculation about Marianna being slowly poisoned. If there was a poisoner... Why would they disguise one attempt as lingering illness, but not the other?
If I can ask one other thing, Mr. Davenport. Anything you like. Did you ever hear Kate complain about money? Her hand wanted to stray to her sleeve and the pawnbroker's receipts she had hidden there. She kept it still. Money? echoed Mr. Davenport. Good Lord, no. Mrs. Mariana kept her well supplied, instructed the tradespeople to send the bills to her and all such, said she couldn't bear it when a woman's companion was kept looking like a drudge and living like a nun, especially when they were family. He paused, taking in Rosalind's expression. Again surprised? Rosalind found she was not, at least not about the money. The room around her said that Mrs. Leverton had decided to be generous with her niece. Kate may have been sent to her aunt in disgrace, but Mrs. Mariana had made sure she was comfortable and relatively free. But if Mrs. Mariana was so generous, why was Kate visiting a pawnbroker? And was that jewellery even hers to pawn? Chapter 12 Leading Questions If some people had distinguished themselves a little less in the world, it would have been as well. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda When Adam and Gautier reached the Bow Street police station, they parted ways. Gautier went immediately to the patrol room to meet with his men and the other captains. There he would hear both the news and the business of the day. Adam made his way around the edges of the crowded, noisy lobby. Most of the actual peacekeeping in the city was done by the militia units, as directed by the magistrates and Parliament. Murder and violent loss of life was the business of the coroner. Smuggling was the province of the customs offices and the river police. While Bow Street and its sister stations might bolster these other powers, they existed primarily to break up brawls, recover lost property and find missing persons. But this was London, and that meant there was more than enough of all these things to keep the lobby full and the officers and runners busy from dawn until dusk and beyond. The clerk's job was to record any complaints and concerns brought to them, to direct people to the courts or out the doors, and generally try to keep some order among the steady stream of human beings that came and went from the most famous station of London's fragmented fraternity of police offices. Today, as on most mornings, Mr Stafford, Bow Street's chief clerk, sat on his high stool, helping bring order to the crowds that inevitably gathered in the lobby of the police station. But this was only a small part of his duties. He also recorded statements from witnesses and prisoners, managed the station's vast library of files and papers, and oversaw the transcription of records for the trials in the magistrates' court. Stafford fit the ideal most people carried of a senior clerk. A pale, lean man with stooped shoulders and a crooked neck, from years of leaning over books and papers. His cuffs were always clean, but his fingers were permanently stained with ink and dust. He ruled his junior clerks with a firm hand, insisting on sobriety, reliability and discretion. At the same time, he did not make any demands of those under his supervision that he did not adhere to himself. In the days immediately following the Cato Street arrests, Stafford never seemed to leave the station. He was constantly busy taking statements from witnesses and prisoners and making sure all the officers involved were carefully deposed. Adam had seen Mrs Stafford more during those few days than he normally did in a year, as she kept coming by with hot meals for her husband. When Stafford saw Adam standing at the edge of the milling crowd, he nodded and signalled to one of his junior men to come take over his station. Mr Harkness, said Stafford as he reached Adam, his voice calm, but there was a certain tightness around the edges. How can I help you? I was hoping to see the witness statements from the Cato Street arrests. Adam was unsurprised to see a hint of irritation in the man's eyes. Stafford guarded his papers like a dragon guarded his gold. But there was something else there, too, an unusual wariness. To what end, if I may ask? Several men escaped arrest that night, Adam replied. They need to be found, before the trial if it can be done. Stafford blinked. Has Mr Townsend approved this? 
This was a question that required a very careful answer. Mr Townsend has agreed that the men are a danger and should be found, which was true. I want to go through the statements again and get a list of whom we should still be on the lookout for and see if there are any hints as to where they've gotten themselves to. Adam expected Stafford to refer him to one of the junior clerks and be on his way, but the man in front of him shifted uneasily. In the ordinary way, I'd say, of course, Stafford told him, but as the trial is sure to be soon, many of the papers are with the magistrate. I couldn't possibly retrieve them without Mr Burney's permission. Well, I'll have a word with his honour then, said Adam, but you do still have some. Yes, a few officer statements and so on. Good, I'll have those. Stafford plainly wanted to refuse. Adam felt an unfamiliar disquiet growing inside him. Mr Harkness, Stafford said, you have my deepest respect, you always have, but you seem to be under the misapprehension that this is some ordinary inquiry. It is not. These men committed treason. Extraordinary precaution must be taken for all aspects of this matter. These men are accused of attempting to commit treason, Adam corrected him, and if that is proved true, it is vital that the facts of their attempt are fully understood and that all the men involved are located and brought to heel. Adam waited. It was known that Stafford had other men under his control beyond the clerks. There were only eight principal officers to cover the whole of England. In order to do even a fragment of the work it was charged with, Bow Street made use of its own network of informants. Even thief-takers could be co-opted. Those persons had to be interviewed when they had information to give, and they had to be paid. That job also fell to Stafford. Indeed, if George Edwards really was the spy that Sir Richard claimed, Stafford might well have been the one he contacted about the budding conspiracy at Cato Street. Adam could simply ask Stafford if he knew Edwards, but he held his tongue. That wariness and tension in the clerk's expression told him he needed to know more before he asked direct questions. He did not like his access to information being determined by Stafford's judgment. Normally he would have gone to the prison and spoken to the accused men himself. In this case there was an additional impediment to that. As accused traitors, the Cato Street men were being held in the Tower of London. For all Adam could get to them, they might as well have been on the moon. At last, Stafford sighed. Very well, Mr Harkness. The words and the bow were more exasperated than polite. Thank you, Mr Stafford. Adam returned Stafford's bow and left him there to go join his fellow officers in the wardroom, at least the ones who were in town. A principal officer might be sent anywhere in England at any time. Just now, John Sayer was off in Penzance, and Daniel Bishop was up in Colchester. The remaining six of them sat around the long table with strong mugs of tea. Mornings such as this were a relaxed and informal time. The men exchanged ideas and information, much of it sprinkled with rough humour and highly spiced observations. Adam was finishing off his second mug of tea and listening to Stephen Lavender talk about a housebreaking ring that was giving him particular trouble when John Townsend swept into the room. A word, Mr Harkness, Townsend said as he breezed past them all and headed straight for his private office. Sam Torton rolled his eyes. Adam took another quick swallow of tea and followed Townsend into his sanctuary. Technically, John Townsend was simply another principal officer, which put him and Adam at the same level. But in truth, Townsend ran Bow Street. This office was full proof of that, it was the only private room in the station, and it was filled with Townsend's collections, clocks and snuff-boxes, paintings and figurines, all from grateful patrons, many of them connected with the royal family. Townsend had personally overseen the security for the Prince of Wales before he ascended the throne, and even in winter he constantly wore the broad-brimmed white hat the Prince had given him. Townsend settled behind his desk and laid a stack of folders and papers in front of him. 
Adam closed the office door and waited. Townsend leaned back in his chair and folded his hands over his considerable paunch. I just met Mr Stafford in the hallway, said Townsend. He represented to me that you had been asking for some of the records from the Cato Street arrests. He nodded at the stack of papers in front of him. Adam said nothing. It was better to let Townsend talk. Townsend cocked his head. Mr Harkness, would it surprise you if I admitted this Cato Street raid is a bad business? It would, truth be told, but Adam still said nothing. Oh yes, Townsend went on, a bad, uncomfortable business. These men, they're not provocateurs, not serious ones at any rate, he added. Ah, now we have that famous inscrutable face of yours. Yes, I admit it. I had hoped that at K.O. Street we would be breaking the back of a dangerous and hardened gang of criminals. I was anticipating being able to report to His Majesty that we had swept away a great and terrible threat to the King's peace. Instead, what do we have? He waved his hand over the papers in disgust and dismissal. A botched arrest and around a dozen ill-assorted vagabonds with a handful of pathetic weapons and a dead officer. But, he held up his index finger, just because they were not formidable does not mean these men were not and are not dangerous. If they are allowed to roam free, then who is to say they won't try again? And what then? Another raid? Another debacle? Another dead officer? Or worse, they make use of those weapons and we have dead innocents. And if they were deluded into action by a provocateur? asked Adam quietly. They permitted themselves to be deluded, said Townsend. They could have walked away at any moment. They did not. They were not merely ripe to be used, Harkness. They were ready and eager to be used. And that is what the magistrates and we ourselves must consider. So, if there was a provocateur, he bears no blame in leading eleven men to their deaths. Townsend raised his brows in surprise. Why should he? Because they might not have acted but for him. Might not? Townsend leaned heavily on that word. We do not deal in mights or maybes. We deal in plain facts. They did act. They have confessed. Not all of them. Enough of them. Harkness, if the law is harsh, it is still the law and it is not our business to question it. He laid his hand over the files. We are subjects of the Crown, Mr Harkness. Our loyalty is proved by our obedience and our firm faith that those whom the Almighty has placed over us know better than we ourselves can. Then it is our duty to find all the men responsible for the plot, said Adam. If some are still out there, they could continue to prove useful to those who wish to cause more mischief. Surely it is our duty to eliminate what remains of the threat to the king's peace. Townsend looked him directly in the eye. And that is what you intend? Adam met his gaze. That is precisely what I intend. Then I wish you good hunting. Townsend lifted his hand off the papers. Keep me informed what you find. Adam picked up the files and made very sure to remember to bow. Chapter 13 A Private Consultation That may be a useful secret in my profession. Pray impart it to me. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Mr. Stafford did not like clandestine meetings. Secrecy invited suspicion and inspection. It was far better to do things out in the open and keep to form and routine in all aspects of business. Therefore, he had made it his habit to leave the station at precisely noon every day. After that, his routine varied. He might seek a luncheon at the Brown Bear public house, or he might run an errand for Mrs. Stafford, or if the weather was fine, he might take a brisk walk, possibly stopping at the post office or booksellers. Every day he would be back at his post by half-past one. 
His junior clerks claimed they could set a clock by him. Today, after a stretch of cold and rain, the weather had broken. Mr Stafford left the station as the bells tolled noon and set out toward the booksellers. Mrs Stafford had asked him to pick up the latest volume by Mrs Gore and he was happy to oblige. On the way back he decided, as he often did, to pause for a drink at the Black Crow. The public house was a haunt of the city's army of government and bank clerks. Every profession needed a gathering place, and theirs was no exception. Now then, Mr Stafford, the landlord greeted him as he entered. Hello, Mr Phelps, Stafford returned. A pint of the lager, if you would? Of course, sir. Stafford took a seat in a back corner. The chatter and complaints flowed around him. The landlord arrived with his beer and left with coins in his hand. Stafford drank and waited. A few minutes later, a man wearing the black coat that was the uniform of all those who made their living with a ledger and a pen walked in. The new man surveyed the room casually. Just as casually, he stopped at the bar to collect a mug of beer and came over to Stafford's table. If anyone cared to look, they might see that the man's face was unusually sun-bronzed and his shoulders were broader than was normal for a clerk. They might also note he wore his dark hair tied back in a sailor's queue. Perhaps they'd think he clerked in the naval office, if they thought of him at all, which they would not. There was nothing unusual in his presence here any more than there was in Stafford's. Mr Stafford, said the man. When he called himself anything, he was Jack Beecham. This was probably not the name he had been born under, but he had never given Stafford a reason to care about that. I trust you've no objection to my joining you. None at all, Stafford gestured with his tankard to the other chair. Beecham sat, taking off his round, crowned hat and hanging it on the peg on the wall at Stafford's back. He raised his tankard. Your health, sir. Stafford's lips twitched into a thin smile. They both drank. What have you learned? Stafford asked quietly. This and that. Beecham smiled brightly. Stafford was careful to keep his face expressionless as he fished the wallet out of his breast pocket and laid it on the table between them. In the next eye blink, it was gone. Even though he sat right in front of the man, Stafford had barely seen his hands move. Now then, said Mr Stafford over the rim of his tankard, what have you learned? The man smiled, dramatically sly and conspiratorial. Stafford suppressed a grimace. Your Sir Richard is a busy man, he said, and he does keep some interest in company. Once he left Parliament yesterday, he made himself a tour of no less than four coffee houses and chop houses up and down the city. Name them, said Stafford, pulling a small notebook and pencil out of his coat pocket. Who did he meet with? Beecham reeled off his list of names. Stafford jotted them down in his particular script, half shorthand, half personal code. He was aware that Beecham watched him the entire time he talked. And then he finished up at the cocoa tree, Beecham was saying. Met with one more fella. Seems that this committee for the defence of the Cato Street Coves is getting up a reward. For what purpose? For finding some fella named Edwards. They think if they can lay hands on him, their friends sitting in the tower will slip the noose. Stafford snorted impatiently. There's nothing Edwards can do for them. I don't know. Sir Richard seemed very intent on finding him. Sir Richard and his cronies are fools, Stafford snapped. If they weren't, they wouldn't be wasting his time on a covey of dead men. Who did he meet at the cocoa tree? If you can't name them, describe them. Beecham eyed him for a long time. Hatchet-faced fella, yellow hair, quiet bloke. Listened more than he talked. Beecham, I advise you to think very carefully. Are you sure about this man? Sure as I'm standing here, he proclaimed. And that's all? Stafford prompted. That's all, Beecham nodded. Beecham was lying. That was not the problem. The problem was that Sir Richard and his committee of radicals were serious about unearthing Edwards. That did not sit well with Stafford. 
especially coming as it did on the heels of Adam Harkness requesting the records and statements from the prisoners and witnesses. Stafford pictured Harkness's calm face as he talked. Several men escaped arrest that night. They need to be found, before the trial if it can be done. Several men. They need to be found. The words repeated themselves in Stafford's mind. Could he have meant they needed to be found in order to help kick holes in the government's case? Because the man Beecham just described as meeting with Sir Richard could easily have been Adam Harkness. Stafford had watched Harkness since he had come to Bow Street from the highway patrol. He was scrupulously honest and had a first-rate mind. His association with the unusual Miss Rosalind Thorne caused a bit of a stir, but Stafford was no moralist. What did concern him was that Harkness also made no secret of his sensibilities. He had, in fact, come within a hair's breadth of being sacked because he would not or could not understand that order and stability should be Bow Street's primary considerations over and above the letter of the law. Harkness had an expensive lady love. Harkness had radical sympathies. Harkness had arrived at the station this morning looking like a man who had stayed out too late. Beecham was lying to him about Sir Richard's last meeting. He knew who this hatchet-faced man was. Perhaps I am jumping to conclusions. Perhaps all these things were entirely unrelated. But then again, perhaps not. Stafford tucked his book away, finished his beer and got to his feet. He tossed an extra coin to the landlord to cover the cost of the other man's beer and turned his steps back towards Bow Street. Mrs Stafford would have to wait for her book. He had work to do. Chapter 14 An Introduction to the Peacemaker He could be all things to all men and all women. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Rosalind finished her search of Kate's room without turning up anything else remarkable. After some consideration, she removed the pawnbroker's receipts from her sleeve and tucked them into her reticule. She might show them to Kate and ask her about them, or if the girl proved uncommunicative, she could send Sanderson Folks to make inquiries after the pledged items. Hopefully, however, Amelia and Alice would help Kate trust that she was among friends, and the young woman would be willing to tell her story. Rosalind found herself feeling unusually awkward. It was seldom she was left alone in a house where her position was so ambiguous. She rang the bell and inquired of the maid where she might find Mrs Beatrice Leverton. Beatrice, it seemed, was in the first-floor drawing-room and had let it be known that she hoped Miss Thorne would come speak with her there. However, when Rosalind entered the airy and pleasant room, Beatrice was not alone. A brown-haired man sat with her, holding her hand. The man rose as Rosalind stepped forward. "'Miss Thorne,' said Beatrice. "'Everett, this is Miss Rosalind Thorne. Miss Thorne, my youngest son, Everett.' After everything Mr Davenport had told her, Rosalind found herself observing Everett Leverton with a great deal of curiosity. Everett took after his mother in looks— they had the same open face and wide-set eyes. His hair was a middling brown, worn just long enough to brush his shirt collar. He cultivated a healthy pair of sideburns. Like his mother, he had an anxious air, but where she was worn to the bone, he was full of energy, all of it tightly but imperfectly reined in. He bowed politely to Rosalind, who made her curtsy in answer. "'Miss Thorne is here at your aunt's request.' Beatrice motioned Rosalind to a tapestry-backed chair. She may be able to help find Kate. Really? Everett looked again at Rosalind, as if he could not believe such a statement. Well, that would be a relief. I must say, I've been out scouring the streets and racking my brains as to where she could have gone, but I've come up a complete blank. Have you seen your sister since she returned to town? Well, not until recently. Everett resumed his place at his mother's side. I did see her once or twice after Mamma came to look after Aunt Mariana, and I was there when she let us know Davenport had declared his intentions. 
That's what's all so surprising about this, he burst out. It seemed like things were all coming back together. Mr. Davenport seems to be a great friend of the family, Rosalind remarked. Oh, yes, began Everett, but then he seemed to think the better of it. Well, he's a friend of mine. Marcus is hard to make friends with, he added with an uneasy laugh. He's a good man, don't mistake me, but he's very private, very reserved. People sometimes mistake that for pride. It can take a good deal of time to get to know him. But you tried to make a bridge between them, did you not? I understand you arranged a dinner for Kate, Harold and Marcus and his wife. Yes, well, Everett's eyes cut sideways to his mother. Beatrice's shoulders sagged as if she could not bear the weight of any more failure. It seemed like a good idea. Get everyone to the table and talk, you know. Unfortunately, Marcus and Kate are both very stubborn people. Harold did his best, Wilhelmina too, but he just shook his head. Over the port, Marcus made it very plain he did not appreciate my efforts, which was a much milder description than Harold had given her. I thought it was going to come to blows. While the men were at their port, Wilhelmina and Kate would have been drinking tea in the sitting room. Rosalind itched to know how that conversation had gone. I should have stayed, said Beatrice. I should not have left. I knew Kate was upset. I knew she would not talk sensibly with Marcus. I should not... Everett cut his mother off. How do you plan to go about tracing Kate? She hasn't exactly left a note. Or has she? We looked everywhere we could think of. From the description I've had of Miss Leverton's last few days at home, I think she decided to run away for reasons of her own. Rosalind spoke calmly hoping her words would, in some measure, give Beatrice some reassurance. I do not believe she eloped, or was otherwise pressured or persuaded, as girls can sometimes be. If she is not with London friends, she has most likely returned to Bath. Everett's eyes lit up. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yes, you're sure to be right. Don't you think, Mamma? I certainly hope so, murmured Beatrice. You'll surely want to be off at once, said Everett. What can I do to help? Can I drive you somewhere? Not at present, said Rosalind. I had hoped for a few more minutes. He smiled and did not wait for her to finish. And I'm in the way, am I? Story of my life. Ask anyone, especially Marcus. He winked. Is Davenport about? He asked his mother. I'll just go have a word. See if I can shake loose anything he might remember. And hear how Aunt Mariana does. Of course, poor old thing. Strong as an ox, usually. He shook his head, his clear eyes clouding over in sympathy, but only for a moment. Then he kissed his mother's cheek and bowed toward Rosalind and strode for the door. Beatrice smiled fondly after him before turning back to Rosalind. I must apologise for Everett, she said. Gravity does not come naturally to him, much to his brother's despair, she added. It must be difficult to have two sons with such naturally different dispositions. Beatrice winced. Marcus could never learn to appreciate Everett's temperament. Neither could his father. Her gaze was distant, remembering something, and her fingers knotted in the black skirt of her morning dress. My husband was a stern man, Miss Thorne. Marcus took his example very much to heart. When it was determined that Kate must be sent away, he took his father's side. And Everett? asked Rosalind. He urged Catherine to apologise and to explain that she had been coerced. When she would not, he went to Marcus and my husband himself and told them what had really happened. What really happened? echoed Rosalind. Amelia McGowan corrupted my daughter, Miss Thorne, said Beatrice bitterly. She found the weakness in Kate's nature and took shameless advantage. Rosalind bit her tongue. And Everett told her father and Marcus this. He urged them to talk to Catherine and to remember she was only a girl, really. She paused. He was always like that ever since he was a boy, always trying to make peace, to get everyone to get along and not fight. Rosalind wondered if Beatrice realised how much this revealed about her uneasy family life. Did Catherine also say she was coerced? She did, in the end, at least. And I am glad she did, because it was only that that kept my husband from ordering her from the house immediately. Beatrice spoke these last words in a whisper. 
Rosalind got the impression that she could not have lifted her voice then, even if she had tried. I am sure my husband's heart would have softened, but he was not granted the time, Beatrice went on. Rosalind could not tell whether she believed this, or whether it was simply pious hope. After the funeral, I thought Marcus would be ready to make some gesture of reconciliation, but he seems to have taken Kate's exile as a deathbed wish from their father. Beatrice glanced away, her face strained. If I may ask, how did you view her engagement to Mr. Davenport? Beatrice looked surprised. I was delighted for her, of course. It is true his origins are not all that might be wished, but Mr. Davenport is a solid man. He is sensible but not grim, and he is also a man of the world, without too many romantic notions about women, if you understand what I mean. Rosalind thought that she did. Beatrice meant that Mr. Davenport did not expect a pure and perfect wife without a past, ideas or opinions of her own. And that he has Mariana's trust is, of course, priceless, Beatrice went on. Indeed, I have wondered if there might have been some matchmaking going on there, but of course I could not ask. Of course not, agreed Rosalind. A question occurred to her. Guilt wrestled briefly with curiosity, and it was curiosity that won. Mrs. Leverton, may I ask, where do you think Kate has gone? Beatrice sighed, and for a moment Rosalind thought she would begin to weep. I don't know. I haven't really been near her for nearly three years. She'd grown so independent. When I came to stay when Mariana became ill, she was very quiet and kept her distance. She was polite to me, but I could not convince her I was genuinely interested in reconciliation. I tried to be patient. After all, she had reason to be disappointed in me. Beatrice paused obviously debating whether to say what was truly in her thoughts. What I'm most afraid of is that the girls returned. The girl? Amelia McGowan. She may have returned and kidnapped her, or convinced poor Kate to run away with her. Rosalind concentrated on keeping her mouth firmly shut. This is why we need you, you see. Beatrice clasped her hands on her lap. We could never raise such a possibility with a Bow Street man. I cannot even convince Marcus to consider it. That's what's behind his anger, Miss Thorne. He wants to find Kate, but he's afraid that the search might bring her shame to public notice. Everyone knows that those Bow Street men take bribes from newspaper writers to gossip about respectable families. I certainly know that is widely rumoured, said Rosalind. Like most rumours, I believe it contains some truth and a great deal of exaggeration. I dare say murmured Beatrice, but it is not a risk I can take. Not with... She paused. Mr. Davenport does not know why Catherine was really sent to her aunt. If he finds out, he may cry off. Rosalind did not reply. Mr. Davenport did know. At least he thought he did. He'd never actually given her any details about what exactly Kate had told him, and it had become painfully clear that Kate was not above lying to save herself. If Kate can be persuaded to return, Beatrice was saying, if she, if we, can say the whole incident was nothing more than a girl's nerves or even a delicacy of feeling, since she was still not fully reconciled with her brother. Beatrice let her sentence trail off, hopefully. She also glanced at the door. Then she tucked two fingers into her sleeve and brought out a paper. I have this. Beatrice handed the paper to Rosalind. It's the name of the agency through which we hired McGowan. They may have heard from her. Yes, of course. Thank you, murmured Rosalind. She opened the note and read and then tucked it inside her own sleeve. I shall certainly add it to my inquiries. In the meantime... I found a number of letters in Kate's room. This seems to show that Kate does have some acquaintance of her own in town. It might help if you were to write and ask after her. Beatrice looked at her blankly for a moment. Oh, no, I couldn't. There might be talk. Marcus. Rosalind looked at her quietly and steadily. Beatrice's words died away. She rubbed her brow. 
You must think me very stupid. I think you are very distressed, and that you have been estranged from your daughter for a long time. Rosalind also thought that Beatrice was a very conventional woman, who found herself dropped into a situation that she was unprepared to deal with. Most women were not encouraged to consider their own private lives, let alone those of their children. Indeed, Beatrice was already blushing, and clearly wishing to hide it. Yes, well, if it will help us find her, I will do as you suggest. I believe it will help, said Rosalind. It would ease the helplessness that so clearly threatened to overwhelm Beatrice, and it might produce some detail or confidence that would help her understand what had led Kate to run away, or whether she might have tried to poison her benefactress, or herself. Well, Beatrice was attempting to sound brisk, but the truth was her tone seemed more than a little desperate. I must not keep you any longer. How did you come? By cab, answered Rosalind. I know my mother-in-law will not object to your using her carriage to return. She reached for the bell. Thank you, said Rosalind, but that will not be necessary. I have several calls to make in the neighbourhood. Oh! Beatrice plainly wanted to ask where and what for, but etiquette forbid. A fact that Rosalind had been counting on. Very well, thank you very much for your time, and... She hesitated again. If... If you do speak with Catherine before I do, please tell her that I miss her, that I am sorry, that I love her, and I ask only to know that she is safe and well. Rosalind touched Beatrice's hand. I will. I promise you that. I will call again soon, if I may. Thank you, said Beatrice. That would be greatly appreciated. A few minutes later, Rosalind stepped out into the afternoon sunshine. The street was beginning to fill with evening traffic, carriages returning home in time for their occupants to change before emerging again to go to dinner or the theatre. A nurse in neat grey pushed her pram on the far side of the street. The day remained fine, if slightly cool. Rosalind found herself sighing with relief. Despite what she'd told Beatrice, she did not really have any calls nearby. She simply wanted some time out of doors, to walk and to think about all that she had learned, including about the pawnbroker's receipts that she had found hidden in Kate's room. What was clear was that the Leverton family's resentments did not begin or end with Kate's relationship with a member of the household staff. If what Mr Davenport had told her was true, questions of money and of pride haunted the family. In truth, Rosalind found herself wondering if the chance to strike back at Marcus was what spurred Kate into accepting Mr Davenport. With the marriage, Kate would gain the fortune Marcus felt was rightfully his. If that was the case, she might have come to regret a decision made in haste and anger. Under normal circumstances, that would have been reason enough for a young woman to run away. These, however, were not normal circumstances. Mrs. Leverton might be being slowly poisoned. That cold and dangerous fact changed everything. But Rosalind could not know if it was fact. Not yet. Not unless Mrs. Hepplewhite agreed to help her. And there was no way of knowing if she would. At least not yet. And if she does refuse? Rosalind asked herself. Then I will simply have to find another way. If there's time, she added, and that thought put a hitch in her breathing. And even if Mrs. Hepplewhite did agree, it would not explain what happened to Kate. Not why she'd decided to run away, nor why she had become so suddenly and violently ill the night she did leave. Was she also poisoned? If so, when and how? It could not be by the same means as Mrs. Leverton. She was dying slowly. Kate had gone from being healthy enough to argue with her family at dinner to collapsing in the street in a matter of hours. This whole matter left Rosalind uneasy in a way that her work seldom did. She did not like the feeling that she did not know whom she had taken into her house or what trouble the girl had brought with her. She might have been tempted to simply let Beatrice take Kate home. But she was not alone in this. 
Amelia and Alice needed answers for their own peace of mind and for peace between them. Rosalind was not prepared to let them down. Mrs. Hepplewhite was adjusting the curtains in the sick room when she saw Miss Thorne leave the house, turn her face toward the high street, and set off at a brisk pace. She turned and contemplated her patient. Mrs. Leverton lay in a nest of quilts and pillows, as pale and still as if she had already died. It was only the faint, ragged wheeze of her breath that gave her away. Mrs. Hepplewhite did not approve of drama. It was the first thing she banished from any sick room where she was given charge. Cleanliness, fresh air, plain food, plain speaking. That was what a patient required. It was harmful to indulge a patient's imaginings. It was doubly harmful to indulge the fancies of nervous relatives. Mrs. Hepplewhite did not deny Miss Thorne was an extraordinary person. She could see through a brick wall as the saying went. The last time Mrs. Hepplewhite had met her, she'd been looking into some letters that had gone missing from Mrs. Cantwell, who happened to be in Mrs. Hepplewhite's charge. The woman had been fretting so about them that she could not rest. For two days, Miss Thorne had been a quiet, orderly presence in the house. By the third day, she found the source of the problem. Mrs. Hepplewhite never knew exactly what it was, but the change in Mrs. Cantwell was undeniable. The source of the drama was thus removed, and with it went the last of the contagion. But now, with this talk of poison, it was outrageous that Miss Thorne should even suggest such a thing. It was not to be taken seriously. Such matters were not what one found in a respectable house, among respectable people. And yet, Mrs. Hepplewhite frowned at her patient, wishing her skin was less translucent and that she had been able to keep more food down today. She wished for any number of things that were simply not the case. Mrs. Hepplewhite strode out into the private sitting room and sat at the table that had been put aside for her use. She wrote a brief note, folded and sealed it. Then, after checking to make certain her patient was still asleep, she descended the back stairs to find the kitchen boy, exactly where he usually was, asleep on an overturned bucket in the scullery. "'On your feet, Jimmy,' she said. The boy, to his young credit, jumped up, rubbing his eyes with the back of one hand. "'Yes, ma'am,' he yawned. "'I need you to take this around to Mr Twining, quick as you can. Bring what he gives you straight up to me.' She gave the boy a coin, and then she added another. "'If anyone asks, you are to say I sent you to the apothecary.' But why? Mrs. Hepplewhite pressed her index finger against the boy's lips. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Off with you. Jimmy looked at the shillings in his fist, tugged his forelock and ran out the back door, quick as a scolded cat. Mrs. Hepplewhite watched him go. Drama was antithetical to healing. However, sometimes when a case reached a crisis, extraordinary measures became necessary. Mrs. Hepplewhite smoothed her apron and returned to her duties. Chapter 15 Doubtful Companions I think her friendship more to be dreaded than her enmity. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Well, that's torn it. Fran Finch watched as Miss Thorne exited the Leverton house and walked briskly from the square. She found she needed to resist a childish urge to stick her tongue out at the woman's retreating back. Instead, she jiggled the pram that held the porcelain baby doll all tucked up under its blanket. She'd been walking back and forth in her nurse's get-up for three solid hours. She hadn't dared do anything else while Rosalind Thorne remained in the house. Thankfully, her contact inside had felt the same. But now, as Fran watched, a parlour-maid in a grey cloak and ruffled bonnet hurried up from the Leverton's area stairs and scuttled towards the tiny green space at the centre of the square. Idiot, thought Fran, as she calmly wheeled her pram about. Gonna draw attention to herself running out like a scared rabbit. The little park was provided with an ornamental fountain with a broad ledge. The parlour-maid sat down, apparently getting ready to enjoy the rare bit of sunshine. 
Fran pushed the pram up to her. Hello, said Fran, cheerfully. Do you mind if we share your spot? She jiggled the pram gently, as if soothing a baby. Not a bit. The maid slid sideways just a little. Fran sat down. She also checked on the doll, in case anyone was watching from any of the houses. The square around them remained quiet. No one was working on the stoops, and no one was lingering about on the cobbles. What can you tell me? she murmured to the maid, whose name was Talmage. About what? asked Talmage. Fran resisted the urge to sigh or pinch the little idiot. That Miss Thorne, for starters. The girl shrugged. Not much. Came in asking for the old lady. Was almost turned away at the door. Miss Beatrice stopped her, though. Seems to think she can help find where Miss Kate's got herself to. Seems the old lady agrees. Miss Thorne saw the old lady. Fran struggled to keep the worry out of her voice. Old lady insisted on it, said Talmage. Let her look through the girls' rooms and all. Mr Davenport talked with her too, and Mr Everett and Miss Beatrice was with her for nearly half an hour afterward. Considering that Miss Thorne knew exactly where Kate Leverton was, that was all very strange. Or maybe not. Miss Thorne might well be looking to see just how much money she could wrestle out of the family. That she'd got into Kate's rooms was a worry. No telling what that fool girl left lying about. How's the old lady doing? asked Fran. Talmage shrugged. Who knows? It don't look good, you ask me, but that nurse they've got up with her, she's a tight-lipped thing, says it's in God's hands, which don't sound all that hopeful, does it? No, it does not, agreed Fran. She reached into her buttoned apron pocket, pulled out a coin and laid it on the fountain ledge for Talmage to pick up. Thanks, Tally. Tell Fran. And just like that, the coin was gone, and Talmage was on her feet and on her way. Fran stayed where she was until Tally was safe back in the house. Then she got up herself and started walking, pushing her pram and thinking furiously all the while. It certainly looked as if Miss Thorne had considered all the angles when she snatched little Kate off the street. The question was, how much had she convinced Kate to tell her about Fran and their business? Is Kate stupid enough to spill her guts? Yes. Fran decided she was, especially if she was given tea and sympathy by a plausible, genteel lady with a reputation for helping little rich things in trouble. Kate had always made a habit of crying on other people's shoulders. This thought left Fran disquieted and more than a little angry. She needed to get herself home. She had to think and to plan before Kate and her new friends were able to make any real trouble. London was a patchwork place. Fine neighbourhoods existed cheek by jowl with sprawling marketplaces and the anonymous mazes of slums and rookeries. Fran made it her business to know all the alleys and mews that ran alongside any house she picked as her target, including Old Lady Leverton's. Within minutes, Fran had left behind the quiet square and entered the bustle, noise and stink of the open market. Along the way, she tossed her apron and cap into the pram and covered them and the doll with the blanket. Now she just looked like a harassed mother hurrying home, no different from the hundred others shouldering their way between the stalls. On impulse, and because being suspicious and annoyed tended to make her hungry, she stopped at the cookshop and bought a couple of pies. She had no idea when Jack would be home tonight. If he was late, she'd leave his out for him. She could get a jug of cider as well and... Hello, Franny, drawled a familiar voice in her ear. Don't look frightened, Fran told herself as she turned. Hello, Jenny. Fran pasted a friendly smile on her face. How's things? Jenny Cranston was a slim girl with dull yellow hair and blue eyes as sharp as bottle shards. Her plain dress had grimy hems and threadbare sleeves... Anyone who saw her would look right past her, unless perhaps they happened to notice her slender hands with their long, slim fingers. They were an arresting feature on an otherwise entirely unremarkable girl. They also were stunningly good with window latches. Jenny C., as she was known around the alleys, could scale a wall like a spider, 
and get into windows on the second and third stories that the family would swear had been locked up tighter than the Bank of England. Saw you was coming from the squares. Jenny folded her arms and lounged against the wall. Any good pickings there? Fran cursed herself several times over. Nobody should have been able to follow her, especially not Jenny C. But she'd been too busy with her own thoughts and not paying proper attention. She kept all this out of her face and just shrugged. Maybe, at a word with a girl I know, there's a house belonging to a sick old lady. Might be there's a few bits and bobs there that no one would miss. The idea of those bits and bobs caused a greedy leer to spread across Jenny's grubby face. And of course, you wouldn't think of making a try without your friends now, would you? Fran looked Jenny straight in the eyes. Never in life. That's good. Only some of the girls was wondering, seeing as how you still owe us all from the last job. And there it was. The real trouble Kate caused with her little midnight flit. Fran felt her teeth begin to grind. Listen, Jenny, she said. It's been a long day. I was just heading over to Madame Geneva's. What would you say to a quick nip of gin? Just to cheer the heart, eh? Jenny's eyes lit up at the mention of gin, as Fran knew they would. All right, then. She pushed herself away from the wall. No harm in a little nip. Madame Geneva's wasn't even a proper shop, just a window in the back of a house that looked onto a courtyard surrounded by three- and four-storey tenement buildings. Fran dropped a few pennies in Madame G's greasy fist and in return got a jug of gin, another of water and two crockery mugs that might have been clean once upon a time. Jenny had kicked a couple of urchins off a bench made from two barrels and a board. Fran put down the bottle and jug between them. Fran filled Jenny's mug first, so the girl was drinking and not paying attention to see that Fran poured only a drop of the stuff into her own cup before topping it off with plenty of water. Ah, oh, that's better. Jenny slapped her empty mug down. We'll say this for you, Franny. You always had an open hand. Well, where would any of us be without our friends? Fran poured Jenny out another healthy measure of gin. Jenny downed this too. When she finished, her cheeks were flushed red. That's what we don't understand, me and the girls. Why would you hold out on us? Now me, she tapped her chest, I stood up for you. We can trust Franny, I said. Depend on it. Something's gone wrong. But Franny will put it to rights. You just watch. And what did the girls say to that? They wanted to know when. She leaned forward. No offence, Fran, eh? You know how it is. Times is hard for everybody, and the girls ain't asking for nothing they ain't earned. I know it. Which was the worst part. And if you'd just tell me who it is talking that way, I'd explain it to them myself. No need for you to get in the middle. But Jenny wasn't falling for this line. Oh, now, no need for you to bother yourself, she grinned, showing all her crooked teeth. You just tell me when the girls can expect their share and I'll let them know, and that'll be that. Which meant the girls didn't want her to know which of them had been grumbling. They still feared her and still felt like they needed her. That was a good sign. But if they'd sent Jenny to start making threats, it meant their patience wasn't going to stretch much farther. Well, there's the problem, Jenny, Fran said. I can't say for sure when I'll get the cash. The runners have been sniffing around the shop. We've had to lay low for a bit. That is a problem. Jenny pushed her mug forward for Fran to refill. But what say you put up a little something, eh? On account, like. I can take that back to the girls and let them know what you told me. Her eyes turned dark and dangerously clear, despite the amount of gin she'd just drunk. I'd hate to have to tell them you were holding out. Or maybe that you and that fancy man of yours were thinking about getting yourselves out of town before you pays what you owes. She grinned again. This time the look reminded Fran of one of the stray dogs that wandered through the rookeries, the ones that had got hungry enough to be dangerous. As if I'd ever do a runner on me girls, said Fran. You know you can trust me. She held up the jug. 
We can drink to it. Not two hours later, Jenny had keeled right over onto the cobbles. Fran collected the empty crockery and took it all back to the window. She tossed Madame G an extra penny. Let her sleep, will you? The old lady grunted, and Fran grabbed her pram and dragged it out of the yard behind her. What a bloody mess! If Kate Leverton wasn't dead already, Fran might just finish the girl off. But she couldn't admit to Jenny she'd been robbed. Certainly not by milk-faced, high-toned Kate. There wasn't one of the girls would ever go along with her on a job again if they'd learned she'd been played for a prat by a schoolgirl. But it had happened. And now that schoolgirl was in the hands of Rosalind Thorne, who looked all set to try to make off with the money that rightly belonged to Fran and the girls, but mostly to Fran. Well, let her try. Fran would see that everything wound up exactly where it belonged. Chapter 16. A Family Portrait. She was a great dabbler in politics, for she was almost as fond of power as of money. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. The temptation to return home immediately was strong. Rosalind wanted to sit with Kate, to speak to her plainly and hear what replies she had to make. The pawn shop receipts in her reticule invited a dozen different questions, but so did the Levitons themselves. Rosalind had not had time to learn anything about them before she entered into this business. She must make up for it now. Fortunately, she knew where to begin. She would call on Honoria Amesworth. Strictly speaking, it was too late in the afternoon for paying calls. Thankfully, Rosalind and Honoria were on such terms as to make it easy to set such formality aside. They were not precisely friends, but they were also more than simple acquaintances. Honoria's brother had died under unfortunate circumstances, and Rosalind had helped discover the person responsible. Honoria, in turn, became one of Rosalind's most reliable conduits for news and gossip among the haute ton, because she did not care whom she might offend by speaking the truth. When Honoria's footman answered the door, he recognised Rosalind, greeted her by name, and asked her to step up into a rather imposing sitting-room, hung with burgundy silk. Honoria herself arrived a few minutes later. "'Well, Rosalind,' she said, "'and here I was thinking we were to have a dull evening. "'Tea, if you would, Robinson,' she added to the footman. "'How are you, Honoria?' Rosalind asked, as they settled themselves. "'How is your father?' "'Burrowing away with his blueprints,' said Honoria, with an air of weary patience. "'He wants to build an observatory.' Honoria's father was a keen amateur architect. Unfortunately, he possessed far more ambition than skill. Since the loss of his son, his plans had become grander, but his abilities had decreased, partly due to the fact that he sought solace for his grief in a bottle of brandy. And how is Alice? Honoria asked Rosalind. I hear she's written a novel. Should I be concerned? Rosalind smiled. Alice admires you. There's nothing in the book that will cause you an instant's worry. Honoria's smile indicated she intended to withhold judgment. Well, you may tell her that I shall reserve my copy at the bookseller immediately and inform my acquaintance they should do the same. The tea arrived and they both busied themselves with the minutiae of cups being fixed and slices of cheese and onion tart being cut. At last, Honoria leaned back and regarded Rosalind. It seems that Alice is not the only one making a name for herself. Frankly, I would not have expected it of you. It was not my decision. I dispute that, but I'm tired. I spent the entire morning closeted with Father's solicitors. So, tell me, to what do I owe the honour of this visit? Rosalind set her own cup down. Honoria, do you know Mrs. Marianna Leverton? Honoria's brows arched. Marianna! You've crossed her path, have you? Whatever for? I can't say, but you do know her. We've found ourselves in the same circles on occasion, Honoria admitted. Political circles. Here and there, but other interests as well. She's a businesswoman, you know, and I find I aspire to be. I had heard something of that. It was, in fact, part of the reason Rosalind had chosen Honoria to speak with. Yes, 
Despite all attempts on the part of the men of the United Kingdom, there are a number of ways that a woman with a competence can expand her fortune quite beyond marriage or the stock exchange. Mrs Leverton, for example, owns interests in a brewery, a bakery and a carting concern, not to mention several livery stables. There's a mining concern as well, I believe, said Rosalind. When she finds the time to sleep, I have no idea. There was the warmth of admiration under Honoria's words. But there are more women like her about than one might think. Certainly more than we were allowed to know about when we were girls. And you're following her example. Which is also yours, although I think you won't care for my mentioning it. It was a mild rebuke, but it still stung. I was never as comfortable with defiance as you, Honoria. Very true, she agreed easily. And yet here we both are. So it would seem. And while I've no notion of your plans, I do not see myself marrying. And father's money won't last forever, especially if I want to maintain this house and keep my mother at bay. So something must be done. I'm looking at investing in a print shop, she said. London will always need its broadsheets and handbills, and a woman may purchase an interest in a business with much less trouble than she may purchase a piece of land. Rosalind nodded. The rules of land purchase were much more formalised than the process of investment. Those rules frequently turned into barriers where a woman was concerned. I understand Mariana is, or was, the late Mr Leviton's second wife, said Rosalind. Yes, she captivated him when he was on holiday in Bath, or so the story goes. He was there to take the waters and bury his grief, or to escape his creditors, depending on whom you listen to. She was a bright star that beckoned to him, or some such nonsense. Of course, it may have simply been her money that beckoned. She had her own money. Honoria nodded. Her family inheritance, and she'd already been dabbling in business. I hadn't realised. I thought she'd just taken over her husband's mines after the marriage. She did that too. I've heard, in fact, that it was the mines she married him for. She wanted scope for her talents, and he provided her the opportunity. How did her husband die? asked Rosalind. Honoria's brows arched. A very interesting question coming from you. However, it was entirely unexceptional. A pair of drunken idiots driving hell for leather down a narrow road caused his carriage to overturn. His neck was broken and he died on the spot. Rosalind was silent for a moment, acknowledging the tragedy. He seems to have left her much of the estate. He left her the whole of the estate. There was no nonsense of entails or any of that, so he could do with it as he pleased. Throws the rest of the family out entirely. It is my understanding the eldest nephew was a bare inch from taking the matter to court, on the grounds that he was the nearest male relative, and as such, he should be allowed to oversee the family affairs. Marcus, thought Rosalind. What stopped him? The younger nephew, as it turns out. Everett Leviton pointed out that it would make the entire clan look ridiculous, especially as there was not a leg to stand on other than Marcus Leviton's masculinity. Even in these times, it seems that was not an entirely reliable argument, especially as Mariana could afford a whole host of very clever attorneys. What about their mother, Beatrice? Honoria shook her head. Unflaggingly conventional. Mariana's brother was a stern and upright man, and he sought a pretty woman who could be counted on to make no stir at all. He died just a bit over a year ago and is survived by Marcus and Everett and that daughter no one wants to talk about. I've never met any of them, she added. It is very safe to say we do not move in the same circles. Is Mariana still involved with the radicals? One of their most popular hostesses, said Honoria. She pushes them to try to secure the vote for female smallholders as well as male. Goodness, Rosalind murmured. The broadening of male suffrage was a subject of argument in the Commons, and the motive behind the popular uprising at Peterloo. But hardly anyone was so radical as to call openly for the franchise to extend to women. Yes, goodness, said Honoria dryly. So many of us say we should be running things, but so few of us actually go out and do something about it. But Mariana has a great deal of nerve. What else has she? Honoria considered. She's very stubborn, 
as you may imagine. She's very sure she's correct in nearly all circumstances, and also that those who do not agree with her must be shown that they are wrong. Rosalind thought of Marcus and his stern demeanour and personal certainty. No wonder he and his aunt did not get along. What of the rest of the family? Honoria sighed. I do hope you're planning to tell me what this is about one day. As soon as I can, I promise. I'll hold you to it. Also, you owe me a dinner. I have a couple of bankers I need to impress, and their wives were all a twitter when they found out I knew you. Oh, dear. Honoria smiled. The price of your success, she said airily. Then she paused, started. Good gracious, Rosalind. Are you blushing? Rosalind's hand flew to her cheek. It felt distinctly warm. Honoria laughed. Heavens, what is the world coming to when I can draw a blush from Rosalind Thorne? Honoria's words only deepened the warmth on Rosalind's cheeks. I do apologise. Honoria sobered. No, I do. You know how I am, Rosalind, all sharp corners and disdain. But what's the matter? Surely you want to be a success. Yes, yes. I'm simply being ridiculous. In what way? Rosalind frowned. She rarely spoke of her uneasiness with the changes she had initiated in her life, and yet she would still lie awake at night. There's a much larger world beyond the ballrooms and the drawing rooms that I was raised to, she said slowly. And the more I see of it, the more I want to run back inside that other world, shut the door and draw the curtains. Honoria waved this away. You'd stifle inside of a week. I'm not so certain. You would. Besides, it's too late. You can't go back any more than I can, or Alice can. Surely she's pointed this out. On more than one occasion. Rosalind admitted. And she's right. So are you. She frowned at the tea things. I don't even know why I'd want to go back to the girl I used to be, but the feelings won't leave me. You can miss a life that never came to pass, you know, and it always looks simpler. I believed myself to be more practical than that. You are. The proof is that against all temptations and expectations, you did not stay in the drawing room with the drapes closed. I suppose. Rosalind took a swallow of her cooling tea and set the cup back down. In any case, said Honoria, I do hope this unexpected timidity will not keep you from my dinner party. You're in fashion this year, and as I said, I need these bankers in good humour toward me. For your print shop, and one or two other things I've in mind. I wish you luck. Wish me a good enough cook to impress these men. I may know of someone who could help there. Honoria's eyes lit up. If you can find me a French chef, all is forgiven, and I will tell you anything you wish to know from now until eternity. Rosalind smiled. I'll write to my friend immediately. And once again you show me how you manage so well. Her eyes lit with humour, but she quickly turned serious. Rosalind, if you're involved with Mariana, I'd advise you to be careful. She's shrewd. She puts on the genteel mask as well as any of us, but she's tough as nails, and she does not like to be disappointed. I will be on my guard, Rosalind said. You should be, because she also knows how much other people value their reputations. And if she thought she had reason, she would not be above destroying yours. Chapter 17 The Other Side of the Story it is too late for me to think of being a heroine. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. When Rosalind returned home from her call on Honoria, Amelia was there to help her off with her things. She looked better, Rosalind noted. She was still pale, but her eyes were no longer swollen and her manner had regained some of its usual energy. How is Kate? Rosalind asked her. Much better, answered Amelia. The doctor has been, and he said she was out of danger. He left a list of instructions and said he will be back tomorrow. Is she strong enough to talk with me, do you think? Amelia bit her lip, and Rosalind watched the unfamiliar wariness flicker behind her eyes. The doctor said she shouldn't be tired. I will be as quick as I can, Rosalind promised. Where is Alice? Gone to visit her brother's family. George's wife, Hannah, was expecting their first child soon, 
and Alice went to see them both on an almost daily basis. She was, she confided to Rosalind, helping George with his writing assignments, because, as an expectant father, he was having a great deal of trouble concentrating. She was also, she said, taking him out on walks so that Hannah could have a moment without him hovering over her. Tell her I'm home and would like to speak with her. Yes, miss. Is there anything else I should know? asked Rosalind. Amelia met her gaze easily. No, miss. Rosalind nodded and took herself upstairs. She received a soft reply in response to her knock on Kate's door. When she entered, it was to see Kate sitting up in her bed with a book in her hands. She laid it aside as soon as Rosalind entered. Kate was still pale, and the dark circles under her eyes looked like bruises, but her gaze was clear and alert, if not entirely easy. Hello, Miss Leverton. Rosalind closed the door behind herself. Miss Thorne. Kate pushed herself up straighter, or at least she tried to. I cannot thank you enough for all you have done for me. I'm only glad we were able to help. Amelia tells me you are doing better. Uncertainty flickered behind Kate's bruised eyes at the mention of Amelia's name. Yes, I am much better. I hope I will not have to trouble you much longer. We'll discuss that later, said Rosalind. May I sit down? Yes, of course. Rosalind drew up the bedside chair. I was hoping to talk with you about how you came to be here. My own foolishness, Kate said. I wanted to see Amelia after, well, everything. I wanted to be sure she was all right, she swallowed. My family dismissed her and it was my fault. I expect you know about that. Amelia's told me, said Rosalind. Kate smoothed her hands over the bedclothes. Rosalind would have given a great deal to know what she was thinking in that moment. I didn't want anyone to know where I was going, Kate said. I was afraid there would be a row if my brother found out I wanted to see Amelia, so I left the house early in the morning. I didn't realise I already had a fever, and I think that must have affected my judgement. And that is all there was to it, asked Rosalind. Yes, Kate said. It was simple foolishness, you see. Foolishness and lack of proper boots. She smiled a little and even managed to raise a faint blush. Rosalind watched this display of girlish innocence and had to squash a surge of anger. Miss Leverton, I have said I wish to help you, and I do. Rosalind spoke carefully, keeping her voice even and measured. Obviously, this is for Amelia's sake and for Alice's as well as for your own. But in order for me to be able to help, you must trust me. I am trusting you, Kate protested. I... You are lying to me, said Rosalind. Kate's mouth shut like a trap. I went to see your aunt today. You... But... You promised you... I needed to know whom I had in my house and what sort of person my friends and my staff were dealing with. She paused to let that sink in. I did not tell your aunt where you are yet, Rosalind went on, or your mother, or your fiancé. Oh, said Kate. You met Harold? Yes. And he and your aunt and your mother all asked if I could help find you. You? The incredulity in her voice stung Rosalind's pride. I am becoming not only notorious but vain, she admonished herself. As I believe you have been informed, I occasionally help society's ladies with their difficult problems. I know Amelia said something about it, but I did not realise... Kate swallowed. I did not realise... I had become one of those problems. Rosalind felt her patience begin to fray. I suspect you know you have, and that you knew before you came here. Because I'm engaged, said Kate, and Rosalind heard the bitterness in her voice. Or because... She looked at the door again. Rosalind did not bother to answer. Why did you run away from your aunt's house? Kate was watching her and judging her. Rosalind could see the calculations flickering behind the girl's eyes. Kate might believe herself to be canny and closed off, but Rosalind had a great deal of experience in judging the quality of people's silence. Kate was trying to decide what Rosalind would believe and how much she could safely hold back. Anger sparked again. 
The possibility that this duplicitous young woman held some sway over Amelia, and through her over Alice, was enough to make Rosalind forget herself entirely. She clamped down hard on the surge of emotion and forced herself to listen and to watch. Kate must have felt the change in her, because her cheeks paled. I left because I couldn't stand the idea of marrying Harold. The words came in a rush. I thought I could. He's not bad, not really. I just... I couldn't stand the idea of spending the rest of my life lying to maintain appearances and keep my family happy. I had to do something. This certainly had the ring of truth, and it fit well with what she'd learned. Setting aside the matter of her personal preferences, Kate would hardly be the first young woman who saw the approach of her wedding and realised that the bargain she'd made was not one she could live with. But there was something else, possibly a great deal else. Rosalind thought about the pawn shop tickets so carefully hidden in Kate's room. She thought about how very ill Mrs Leverton had been and the chance of poison, and about Kate's attempt to lie to her. Rosalind reminded herself that she did not have the facts yet. She had suspicions, but there were many of them, and they were dangerous. How long had you been planning your escape? she asked. Not long, she said. A month, perhaps. I might not even have gone through with it, but Harold was insisting. He wanted to be sure Mariana could be at the wedding, and she was so ill. We all thought she was going to die soon. She stopped. How was she when you saw her? Not well but I am told she is very strong. Kate's smile was faint but genuine. Oh, yes, stronger than anyone would credit. There was a world of meaning behind those words, and Rosalind wondered at it. Anyway, Kate went on, I realised that I wouldn't be able to put Harold off much longer, so I knew my only option was to leave. Did you finally realise this at your brother's dinner party? Oh, you heard about that as well. Kate sighed. No, it was before that. But it was the dinner that convinced me I couldn't wait any longer. Everett meant well. He always does. But like most of his plans, it was a disaster from beginning to end. Marcus wanted me to grovel. Mother wanted me to be a good girl. Everett wanted me to keep on blaming Amelia for everything. What did Mr Davenport want? A second helping of fish, as near as I can recall. He did not try to support you. Or the match. He listened to Marcus rant for a few minutes and then turned to me and said, Doesn't matter a bit so long as Mrs. Leverton approves of us. More wine, my dear. Rosalind actually found herself impressed at this display of sang froid. And he was not wrong. If Kate was of age, her brother could not stop her marriage. And if it was Mrs. Leverton who was going to set the couple up in life, Marcus had no leverage beyond his anger. What about Marcus's wife, Wilhelmina? What did she have to say? Did you meet Wilhelmina? Not yet. Well, when you do, you will see she has very little to say when Marcus is in the room. My brother is a jealous man, and Wilhelmina has learned to tread very carefully around him. What about when he was not in the room, when you two went out to take tea after dinner? Kate shook her head. I can't even remember what was said. All I could think was I had to get out of there as quickly as possible. That's why I was in the market, she said. I was two days earlier than Amelia and I had agreed upon. Do you remember when you began to feel ill? Not really. I was fine at dinner. I was uncomfortable as I was getting ready to go. At first I thought it was nerves, and then... She shook her head. I don't remember much after that. I must have fallen into a delirium. Rosalind agreed this was quite likely. Where did you plan to go, ultimately? Edinburgh, she said. I have some friends there. Are they expecting you? No, admitted Kate. Not entirely, but they won't turn me away. A journey like that takes money. Yes, I've been saving my pin money, and I sold some of my jewellery. Sold? Kate blinked. Yes, there are jewellers who will buy such things, you know. Rosalind considered. If she told Kate about the pawnbroker's receipts, she might shock her into saying more than she intended. On the other hand, she might also anger her into running away again. Rosalind had met very few people who could react calmly to news that their personal things had been rifled by a stranger. 
Do you still plan to go to Edinburgh? Yes, said Kate. I have enough to last for a bit. I don't know what I'll do, but at least I'll have some time to think. Your mother is very worried about you. Kate looked away. Will you write to her? You do not need to tell her where you are, just that you are well. Do you know she did not write to me once after my father packed me off to Aunt Marianna? Not once. There was a genuine bitterness in Kate's words. Rosalind remembered Beatrice in her black dress, describing her late husband. My husband was a stern man, Miss Thorne. Marcus took his example very much to heart. It may have been she was prevented from writing, suggested Rosalind. Yes, well, she has friends she could have trusted a letter to if she'd wanted, and it wasn't as if she didn't know where Aunt Marianna lived. Kate stopped, remembering herself suddenly. I'm sorry, I know I should forgive her, but I can't do it. Not yet. She took a deep breath. But yes, I will write. Good, said Rosalind. Now, if you were to stay, we will need to get you some things. Kate smiled. But I have some things. You do? Oh, yes, she said, obviously pleased that she had managed to surprise Rosalind. You know I came here to Amelia. I don't suppose she told you I left a bag with her? No, said Rosalind. She did not tell us that. It's not her fault. I asked her not to. I know I've put her in a very bad spot, she added. I just didn't want to leave a packed valise about the house in case anyone found it and started to ask questions. So I brought it here and asked her to hide it for me. Well, that is convenient, said Rosalind. I'll make sure Amelia brings it to you. Thank you. For everything. I really did not mean to impose on you this way. Rest. Rosalind got to her feet. We will talk again later. Rosalind closed Kate's door behind her and went quickly to her own rooms. She did not want Alice or Amelia to happen on her before she regained control of her features and her faculties. She now knew that Kate Leverton was a liar. But what sort of liar? Did she simply not trust Rosalind, who was, after all, a stranger to her? Or was she holding on to deeper secrets? Chapter 18. Plans Discussed Over Dinner She begins by saying she is determined to think for herself, and she is determined to act for herself, and then it is all over with her. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda By the time Fran got back to the flat, she was tired and in a fine temper. After leaving Jenny snoring in Madame Geneva's yard, she'd set about making the rounds of all the girls' usual haunts, she found Polly and Nan easy enough in old Mrs Prescott's boarding house. She'd given them a jug of cider and a few pounds, on account, just as Jenny had suggested. They toasted and talked readily enough, but neither one of them gave any hint as to who sent Jenny to talk to her. Pinky was a bit harder to track down, but Fran eventually found her down in Drury Lane, taking her chances, dipping into pockets to see what she might come up with. She was a fair dip, was little Pinky, but she was a better housebreaker. Fran treated her to a pie and a dram of pale ale, but got exactly nothing for her trouble. Which meant either the girls were united in their suspicions, or Jenny had spun a line of talk and was acting on her own. Uncertainty in an empty purse always put Fran in a foul mood, so when Jack came breezing in all smiles, she just eyed him from the table, where she sat with the remains of her pie, and a mug of strong tea. He had been bending to kiss her, but he saw the sour look on her face and stopped. What's the matter? I've had a little visit from Jenny C. She followed me. Oh. Jack tossed aside his hat and coat and drew up a chair. Wanted money, I'll wager. And wanted to let me know the other girls did too. I spent the rest of the day and the rest of our coin... She gestured to the deflated drawstring purse that slumped beside the teapot, keeping them all quiet. She glared again. So you better have some good news for me, Jack Beecham. Well, you can cheer up then, my love. He kicked his long legs out and poured himself a measure of the thick black tea. Because we are not going to have to worry about money for a fine, long time. Since when did old Stafford become so generous? 
Jack took a long swallow of tea and smacked his lips in apparent relish. Not Stafford. Oh, no. You and me, Miguel, are about to be in the pay of the High Sheriff of London himself. Have you been drinking? Fran demanded. Not a drop. He held up his right hand in promise. But listen here. You know that MP I told you Stafford wanted watched? Yeah, said Fran warily. Well, it turns out he's Sir Richard Phillips, ex-sheriff and now noted radical. He's put up a reward for finding the man he says is the government spy responsible for all that mess round in Cater Street. The word reward had a warm and lovely sound, but Fran wasn't about to let herself get too excited. How much? A thousand pounds, my love. Jack leaned back, grinning and waiting for her exclamations and praise. A thousand pounds, your love, she sneered. But didn't you say this MP met up with a runner? What's to keep him from nabbing the little spy first? Won't be a problem. I'm already two steps ahead of him. Fran stabbed her knife into the remains of her pie. How could you have gotten ahead of a Bow Street runner? Jack laid his hand over his breast. I'm wounded, Franny. Haven't I been keeping ahead of those clod poles all me life? Isn't that how we got together, you and me? He smiled fondly at her. Now, I'll admit this particular fella's got a reputation. I did some asking around about him. He's got a fancy nickname in the papers and all. Watchdog Harkness, they call him. Friendly with the king and all sorts. But that just makes my job easier. How's that then? Because he's got something to lose, Jack said. I'm going to find Mr Edwards, but I won't nab him straight away. Oh, no. I'll keep watch on him until Mr Harkness shows up. Then I'll make it clear to Harkness that if he does not turn Edwards over to me, I'll tell his boss that he took money to try to muck up the government's own case against the Cato Street men. Fran didn't answer immediately. She looked at Jack's lovely grinning face and made herself think through everything he'd said, not once, but twice, looking for the flaws. Why would you wait for him? Why not just take Edwards to the MP? Because once Harkness is in my net, I can not only sell Edwards off to the MP, I can sell Mr Stafford the fact that it was Mr Harkness who handed Edwards to the Radicals and their defence committee. He raised his mug in salute to his own cleverness. Even if it wasn't. Even if it wasn't, he agreed. Unless, of course, it happens that Mr Harkness can afford to pay better than Stafford. Very nice, said Fran. If it happens. Of course it will happen, Jack waved his mug. We're covered, coming and going, so cheer up, me girl. He leaned forward and chucked her under the chin. And give us a kiss. We're about to be very rich. He gave her a peck on the cheek and tried to shift to kiss her on the mouth, but Fran turned away. Not harsh, though. When's this blessed event set to occur? Shouldn't be more than a day or so. Harkness is sure to be in a hurry. He's got to round up Edwards before the trial. What do we do until then? she asked. I handed out everything I had to keep the girls quiet, and it wasn't enough. Soon as Jenny's through with her hangover, they'll all be back looking for more. Jack pulled a wallet out of his coat and tossed it down. That'll hold us for a couple of days, and you can put the girls off for that long, I'm sure. Fran sighed. He was not in a mood to listen to her worries. Sometimes she wondered why she stayed with him especially times like this. But then he was so good at the game and so pretty to look at. And if he was right, oh, then they could be in clover. And this could work, just like he said. Maybe. A thousand pounds was certainly worth a bit of a gamble. In for a penny, thought Fran as she took up the wallet and leafed through its contents. In for a pound. All right, we'll play it your way. She closed the wallet up again. But in that case, I'm going to have a little word with our Kate. 
She watched Jack roll this around in his head for a moment. Are you sure? From what you've said, this Miss Thorne is a clever one. All the more reason to make sure Kate's keeping her mouth shut, said Fran. If she takes it into her head to start telling tales, we could both end up in the nick before you have a chance to put this fine plan of yours into action. Mmm, I hadn't thought of that. No, you never do, do you? Fran sighed again. I'll just go make sure she knows to keep quiet. And while I'm at it, I'll get what's ours. That way, I'll be able to settle accounts with Jenny and the girls. She raised her mug. And then you and me, we keep all the rest. Chapter 19 A Proposal Then why persist in the same kind of life, you say? Why, my dear, because I could not stop. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda There were many advantages to sharing a house with Alice. The spirited company, the pooled resources, and, of course, Alice's acquaintance were of added assistance when Rosalind needed to reach into the various levels of London society. But the greatest advantage, although Rosalind might blush to admit it, was the fact that with Alice sharing her residence, Rosalind could receive calls from an unescorted gentleman without risk of serious censure. Rosalind descended the stairs to find Adam in her front parlour. He smiled to see her, and her heart thumped. She closed the door and let herself be pulled into his arms. His warmth surrounded her, and she allowed herself to luxuriate in the sensation. "'I'm sorry I could not come earlier,' he said when they separated. "'The day was more complicated than I hoped for.' Even if you did come, you would not have found me at home, Rosalind told him. My day also became complicated. Have you eaten? Mother will have something for me at home. But do you actually intend to go home from here? Rosalind inquired. Adam held up his hands in defeat. Rosalind rang the bell for Amelia. Please tell Mrs Singh that Mr Harkness will be joining us for supper. Rosalind and Alice both preferred an early meal especially during the season when either of them might be spending their nights at routs or balls. "'How does your guest?' Adam asked. "'I am guessing she's better.' "'Much,' said Rosalind. "'The doctor believes her to be out of danger.' "'I'm glad to hear it.' "'Yes. It raises a host of questions as to what's to be done next, but I would rather have to answer them than not.' Adam nodded his agreement. "'Has she told you anything of her circumstances?' She's told me a great deal. I'm just not certain all of it is the truth. Rosalind told Adam about her visit to the Levitons, and then with Honoria. He listened with patient attention and made no interruption. Rosalind went on to describe what Kate had told her about her reasons for leaving. She also showed him the pawnshop receipts. What will you do? asked Adam. What I can. She shook her head. I've never been in such circumstances. I do not like feeling so uncertain. I sympathise, said Adam. Deeply. What happened with your defence committee men? She asked, grateful for a chance to change the subject from the unsettling events surrounding so many Levitons. The man I met was Sir Richard Phillips. The Member of Parliament? Adam nodded. And radical and former Sheriff of London. He and his friends are the ones attempting a defence of the Cato Street men. They've even engaged a barrister, from what I hear. Is that allowed? Recently, Rosalind had been forced to become more closely acquainted with the proceedings of the criminal courts. According to law and custom, defendants could seek legal advice, but they were not always permitted to have an attorney in court with them. In cases of treason, it is allowed, said Adam. But what they want is for me to track down a missing man, one George Edwards. They think he's the real instigator of the plot and that he is in the pay of the government. What do you think? I've spent the morning going through the witness statements, at least some of them, and I think it's possible. He paused. But I might not be thinking straight. Why not? Rosalind arched her brows in genuine surprise. Adam met her gaze his blue eyes serious. Sir Richard offered me a reward for finding Edwards. A thousand pounds. Rosalind sucked in a quick breath. 
Three hundred of that would take care of my mother until the youngest were grown, even if my brothers were not able to help her with the housekeeping. The rest, that's an income, for life, if it's managed carefully. And I imagine you know someone who could help with that. Yes, murmured Rosalind. Louisa's husband would be glad to help, I'm sure. So, you see, said Adam, quietly, if I find this George Edwards and I bring him to Sir Richard, I could afford to marry, if the lady was willing. Rosalind felt her throat constrict. A strange energy spread through her. She'd resigned herself to the impossibility of marriage to Adam. She had accustomed herself to waiting and managing. Now, he told her marriage might be possible. Her faith in Adam's skills as an officer ran deep. If this man, Edwards, could be found, Adam would find him. He could claim that reward. And then... And then... If the lady was willing. Rosalind found herself filled with hope, but lying just beneath it was another feeling that was nothing short of terror. And that terror was quickly, horribly dissolving into shame. She had no idea what Adam saw in her face, but he quickly took her hand. I'm sorry, Rosalind. I shouldn't have said it like that. We haven't had a chance to really talk. I never asked you what you wanted. She pressed his hand. The shame deepened, leaving her sick. Her stomach, her heart, her whole body was suddenly clenched tight. I love you, she said, plainly. I loved you from the moment I first saw you on the stairs. He smiled. And I you. That's not what frightens me. What then? he asked. Rosalind meant to speak, but the words would not come to order. There was only a fragmented jumble in her mind. She did not understand herself in this moment. She did not understand why she could not speak sensibly or quiet the emotions that roiled inside her. In the blink of an eye she had become a stranger to herself, a weak, incomprehensible stranger. She did not want Adam to see her this way, not when he was offering her what she should want most. Marriage, she blurted the word out. There's so much loss in it, for a woman. For you, said Adam. For me, she agreed. And, and then, when the children come, she bowed her head. This isn't something I've said, she whispered. Not even to Alice. Tell me. She wanted to, but the words choked her. She'd never spoken this way. She did not know for sure that she could. Even to Adam. Especially to Adam, who saw a future for them and had moved to make it happen while she dithered uselessly. Adam, I'm not certain that I want children. To go through labour, to risk my life for that possibility. I know my time is limited. I know I am unnatural, Rosalind. She looked up at him, looked into the deep eyes that had never failed to see the truth of her. I love you, Rosalind, he said. You. Not some theory or possibility or ideal. I love the unique, astonishing fact of you. And that is what I will always love. He kissed her. She clung to him, returning the kisses with all the force she had, driven past words, past her own understanding. It was all she could do. A soft knock sounded on the door. Adam and Rosalind sprang apart like guilty children. Rosalind put a hand to her blushing cheek. Adam smiled and smoothed a stray lock of her hair behind her ear. His touch burned. It was astonishing. It was deeply unsettling. She did not know what to do. He was still smiling, his expression gentle and full of understanding. He stepped back and bowed ever so slightly. Rosalind found herself able to straighten up, her mind quiet, at least on the surface. Come in, she said. It was Alice. She strode into the room, the hems of the old blue wrapper she habitually wore over her plain day dress flapping behind her. Rosalind, this came for you by hand. She held out a lumpy package wrapped in brown paper. Thank you. Rosalind took the package. 
She met Alice's gaze. Her friend kept her face admirably straight. Neither of them remarked on why it might be Alice who brought the package into the room rather than Amelia or Mrs Singh. The boy said he was told not to wait for a reply, Alice told her. Oh, and Mrs Singh says supper will be ready in ten minutes. Alice sailed out and closed the door. Adam looked at Rosalind, and she looked back. He raised his brows and she raised hers. In the next heartbeat, they both burst out laughing. Oh dear, Rosalind dropped onto the sofa, short of breath from laughter and feeling infinitely lighter. I can't think what's so funny. She wiped at the corners of her eyes. Adam pulled a clean handkerchief out of his pocket and handed it to her. Does it matter? I suppose not. She wiped her eyes and her nose. Were you expecting this? He nodded at the package. It was soft and had been tied at its mouth like a pudding ready for steaming. If it's what I think, I've been praying for it, Rosalind told him. Allow me. Adam pulled out his pocket knife, slit the string on the package and opened the paper. Inside was a pile of loose tea leaves. Rosalind sucked in a careful breath. She also closed the paper again, twisting the mouth tight. She met Adam's gaze. He said nothing, waiting for her to open the note that accompanied the package. Dear Miss Thorne, somewhat against my better instincts, I have enclosed what you requested. It has now been two days since my patient has partaken of the aforementioned... Her doctor believes her heart has steadied some, but that it is too soon to tell if this is a genuine improvement. I shall consider all that you have said and remain vigilant. Yours, Constance Hepplewhite. What is it? asked Adam. Rosalind closed the paper carefully. When I visited Mrs Leverton, I was able to speak with her nurse. I know her slightly, and I raised the possibility of poison. It seems that Mrs Leverton keeps a private stock of tea for her own use and that the whole household knew about it. She held up the package. The skin on her hand seemed to shrivel from touching the paper. She told herself to stop being ridiculous. This was not entirely efficacious. I asked her to freshen the tea and send me what there was in the caddy. Until this moment I was not sure that she would. It was, after all, a rather outrageous suggestion and I have no proof. She frowned at the package, as if willing it to give up its secrets. Is there any way to make certain, if it is poisoned? Can you leave it with me? Adam asked. I have some ideas, and Sir David might as well. Sir David Royce was the coroner for London and Westminster. He and Adam had worked closely together on more than one occasion. And if Mrs Leverton and Miss Leverton both continue to improve, that will certainly be a sign that our fears were correct. Rosalind could not fully suppress her shudder. Yes, said Adam solemnly. I agree. He pocketed the package and took her hand and kissed it. Despite her uncertainties, Rosalind felt herself smile. But only for a moment. Adam, you said before that you were not sure you were thinking straight when it came to this Mr Edwards. Was that because of the money? Adam nodded. Do I see that a paid spy led eleven vulnerable men to disaster because that is what the facts reveal, or do I see this because I am offered a reward I very much want? He pressed her hand gently. And right now I don't know. Then you will do what you have always done, she said. Find out. Find this Mr Edwards, hear what he has to say. In the meantime, I might be able to learn something about Sir Richard and his defence committee that will help clarify matters. He touched her cheek. And the rest? Her answer was cut off by a knock at the door. Rosalind, called Alice, supper's ready and I'm starved. Mrs Singh is already put out and if you don't both come and eat a good meal, we'll all be in serious trouble. Rosalind looked at Adam and he rolled his eyes and she nodded and they both laughed again. Rosalind rose and brushed down her skirt. Adam stood and bowed elaborately and let her precede him out the door. Rosalind tried not to think too much about the fact that he had proposed marriage to her and that she had not yet answered him. Chapter 20 Unwelcome Revelations
What a simpleton to know so little of the nature of curiosity. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. There you go. Amelia laid the supper tray across Kate's lap. Best eat it while it's hot. It smells delicious, said Kate. Amelia had to agree. It was one of Mrs Singh's special stews, full of vegetables and spices that Amelia had never even heard of before the cook came. Mrs Singh asserted that the proper food could heal better than anything in the apothecary's shop. Looking at Kate now, Amelia wondered if there wasn't something to it after all. I wasn't sure I'd ever really be hungry again. Kate took up a healthy spoonful of the rich broth. Heavens, that's good. I leave you to it then. Amelia? Yes? Can you bring me my bag? She asked and smiled. I'll be ready to get up soon, maybe even tomorrow, and I've got to have something to wear. All right, agreed Amelia. I've been keeping it upstairs. It seems it's just as well I left it with you, doesn't it? The way things have turned out. Kate's smile turned just a little bit cheeky. Now we don't have to make shift to get me clean things. Right, said Amelia. You eat that up, I'll go get it. Thank you. Amelia smiled and bobbed a quick curtsy, more as a joke than anything else, and tried not to feel too much warmth as Kate winked at her. Just like she tried not to see the flicker of something in her eyes when she pointed out that she had a very good reason for wanting her bag. Amelia McGowan, you have a nasty, suspicious mind. Kate had already explained about why she'd run away and how she'd decided to go to the market to meet Amelia instead of coming straight to the door. I didn't want to be seen, she said. I know your Miss Thorne knows absolutely everybody and I wasn't sure if she knew my mother and might say something to her if she found out. Of course, neither one of them had been able to predict that Miss Thorne would choose that day to come to the market. It was all perfectly reasonable. There was only one problem. Kate was a liar. She knew nothing about Miss Thorne except what Amelia had told her. And this lie was hardly the first or the worst. Still, it made Amelia's heart and her head ache. She wished that she could just tidy away all those old feelings for Kate and get on with her life. How could she even think about running off with someone she didn't trust? How could she even want to? Amelia's stomach grumbled, bringing her back to more everyday concerns. Supper would be waiting for her below stairs, good and hot. Then she had the kitchen to clean and the beds to turn down and a dozen other tasks before she'd even get a chance to sit down again. And the Mrs and Mr Harkness would probably want tea and heaven knew what Kate might want next. She should just hurry and get the bag and then take her chance to get off her feet for a few minutes while she had it. Amelia uttered a few words she never would have said out loud if anyone was near and climbed the narrow back stairs to her room. One of the best things about working for Miss Thorne and Miss Alice was the room. True, there was no hearth, but there was a chimney to give off enough heat to keep things snug. She had a good rug on the floor, and if the chair was worn, it was comfortable. There was a footstool to go with it and a stout table and thick curtains on a window that looked out over the square, not to mention a lock on her door. Not that there was anyone in this house that she needed to keep out in the general way, but it was nice to have the possibility, if she ever needed it. Probably she should not be picturing Miss Alice standing beside the bed while Amelia turned the key just to make sure no one came in to find them. Certainly, Thoughts of Miss Alice had nothing to do with the reason she turned the lock now. Amelia had kept Kate's valise in the back of her little closet, underneath the winter quilts and the extra pillow. She hadn't looked in it, not once. She'd told herself she must trust Kate. No, that wasn't even true. She'd told herself that if there was anything out of the ordinary about that valise, she was better off not knowing. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies, her mother had always said. Well, the questions were being asked, and Amelia had already lied. But Kate had lied more, and there had been something in her eyes, something in the way she watched Amelia that Amelia had recognised, even if she hadn't wanted to. 
It was the look Kate got when she was trying to judge if she was likely to get her way. Amelia took a deep breath and opened the valise. What confronted her was nothing more suspicious than a jumble of clothing, a couple of badly crumpled gowns and petticoats, a nightdress, a pair of half boots, some handkerchiefs. All of it had been tossed higgledy piggledy into the bag, along with a beaded reticule that proved to contain a few banknotes and some coins, all amounting to the princely sum of twenty pounds, six shillings, and ninepence. Amelia lifted up one badly wrinkled day dress, looking it up and down in disgust. And who's going to be left wasting an entire day trying to salvage that, I should like to know? Amelia McGowan, who else? Her jaw clenched. Well, I'll be blowed if I will. Not without orders. I'm not her maid any more. She made herself shove the dresses back into the valise and snap the latches shut. She grabbed the handle with every intention of walking back to Kate's room, dropping it by her bed and walking out. But as she hefted the bag, she stopped. Something was wrong. She hefted it again. It's too heavy, she thought. Amelia set the valise back down on her bed. She stared at it, her heart in her mouth. Don't be ridiculous, she sneered at herself. She threw the valise open and in a single motion dumped all of Kate's belongings onto her faded quilt. She hefted the bag again. She was right. It was far too heavy. Amelia shoved both hands into the empty valise up to the elbow and felt carefully about the black silk lined inside. It took a minute, but her experienced fingertips caught on the bulk of a clumsily stitched seam that ran all along the bag's bottom. Someone had cut out the bottom lining and then re-sewed it. And judging by how uneven that seam felt, it wasn't anybody who had any kind of skill with a needle. Kate had always hated fancy work and mending. Amelia went to her work basket and yanked out her sharpest scissors. She paused for a moment, listening for footsteps or rustling cloth that might mean someone was listening at the door. But there was no sound. She gritted her teeth, reached back into the bag and carefully slit those clumsy seams. She folded the flap of black silk away to reveal a layer of thin board. Amelia took a deep breath and lifted the board out to reveal the space underneath and a pile of old rags. Amelia stared at them, her heart pounding hard in her throat and an odd mix of disappointment and relief surging in her blood. Well, that's that, she tried to tell herself. Nothing to see. Best put it all back and go get your supper. But she didn't move. She swallowed and gathered her nerve and reached back into the bag. The rags proved to be an untidy nest. Inside waited six brown paper packages, tucked up like eggs in straw. Amelia hefted one of the packages, squeezing it as if it was a piece of fruit she needed to check for ripeness. She felt sharp edges shift inside the paper, and her breath caught. Quickly, Amelia sliced through the string and unrolled the paper. As it opened, the fading daylight caught sparks in a riot of dark blue and ice white. Glass, she thought. But it wasn't glass. It was a heap of gemstones. Diamonds and sapphires set in brilliant gold. Amelia lifted the necklace and stared. Oh, Kate, she thought, you bleeding idiot. Chapter 21 A Guest at the Breakfast Table I have nothing worse than folly to conceal. That's bad enough. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Rosalind, as usual, was the first down to breakfast. The dining room had a lovely nook formed by the bowed windows and was furnished with a small table and chairs. It was an ideal place for a light breakfast. This morning the world outside was shrouded in fog. Grey droplets speckled the window panes. It was so dim that the lamps were all lit, lending the room a cosy glow, 
As Rosalind came in to find the table already laid out with a pot of tea for her and one of coffee for Alice. The Morning Post waited on a salver on the sideboard, alongside a stack of the day's early papers. At the very top of this stack waited a hand-delivered note, addressed to her in Adam's hand. Her heart in her mouth, Rosalind opened the note. It was brief and very much to the point. Took that package to a rat catcher I know. He says it's arsenic for certain, and that there's three fewer rats in the cellars at the Brown Bear. A.H. What's the matter, Rosalind? Alice came into the dining room. You've gone quite pale. Rosalind passed her Adam's note. Alice read it in silence and then handed it back. Part of me had hoped this was all going to prove to be a suspicious fancy. Rosalind folded the paper tightly, as if she could prevent its news from escaping. What will you do now? asked Alice. I must go to Mrs Leverton at once. At least give yourself time to eat something, said Alice. Waste your morning egg and Mrs Singh won't speak to either of us for a week. Yes, all right, agreed Rosalind reluctantly. She sat, poured out the strong tea and sipped. Or she tried to. Her stomach felt curdled. Alice was looking at her own coffee. Hearing about poison first thing in the morning does rather spoil the taste, doesn't it? Rosalind nodded absently. Mrs Singh arrived then with a lightly boiled egg for each of them, along with a rack of toast. While Rosalind carefully sawed off the top of hers, Alice knocked hers open with a single expert stroke of her spoon and immediately set about dipping bits of toast into the yolk. Will you tell Kate, Alice asked, around a mouthful of toast, about Adam's note? I don't know. Rosalind spooned some egg onto her toast and made herself eat. She told herself she would do no one any good if she was fainting with hunger throughout the day. I confess I'm still not entirely sure what to make of Kate. Would it be too much to ask you to keep an eye on her today? You still think she might try to run away from us? Yes. She's stronger now, and she's very obviously been lying about what drove her out of Mrs Leverton's house. Last night, over Mrs Singh's chicken and root vegetable ragout, Rosalind had relayed the details of her conversation with Kate. Alice spooned some extra sugar into her coffee. I won't pretend to be the most disinterested observer in this case, she said, but I'm certain this business about running away to avoid marriage is far from the whole story. She paused. Do you think Kate had anything to do with this attempt on Mrs Leverton's life? I mean, I know it's possible she was poisoned too, but... No, said Rosalind, and it was a relief to be certain about one aspect of this unsavoury business. If she was poisoning Mrs Leverton, why would she plan to run away before she knew she would succeed? And what would she gain by it? She had a promise of a large settlement when she married Mr Davenport. Why not marry him, take the money and run away afterward? No one is hanged for simple desertion. Well, you leave her to me, said Alice. I'll soon have our answers. Now, what about you? Rosalind paused in the act of spooning out some more egg. What do you mean? What of you and Adam? Something's happened between you. If I'd had to watch one more caring glance or faint blush last night at dinner, I would have screamed. You may now praise my discretion and restraint, she added primly. Your discretion is always appreciated. Rosalind scraped her spoon delicately around the inside of her shell and heaped the last bit of egg onto her toast. But you're not going to tell me what's going on? Rosalind ate her toast and egg. She swallowed. She added some more tea to her cup and sipped. Alice narrowed her eyes. Rosalind set her cup down. Adam proposed to me, she said. Oh, said Alice. Did you answer him? No. Why on earth not? You love him. You turned down a duke for the man, a duke you'd been pining after for years. She might be simplifying the exact circumstances, but Alice was not entirely wrong. Rosalind had turned down an invitation to be courted and married from Devon Winterbourne, who was the Duke of Castlemaine, and her feelings for Adam had been a major consideration in that decision. I don't know if I want to be married, said Rosalind. Not even to Adam.
she added in a forlorn whisper. Oh, Rosalind, Alice took her hand. I'm sorry. Rosalind pressed her friend's sturdy fingers and then drew back. It's my own fault. I cannot separate what I've lived through from... She realised she had no idea how to finish that sentence. You will find your way, Rosalind, said Alice. I wish I could be so confident. You will, Alice told her firmly. When has there been a problem set in front of you that you failed to solve? You'll be through it quicker than... than a three-minute egg. She crunched her toast. And please don't tell Mr Coburn about that particular metaphor. I'll come up with something better after breakfast. Rosalind could not help but laugh. Oh, Alice, what would I do without you? Well, how convenient you will never have to find out. Won't I? No, replied Alice promptly. I'm a confirmed spinster after all. I shall write my books and my gossip and make so little money that no one will bother to pay any attention to me and live exactly as I please. That includes being your very best friend in the whole world. And Amelia? For a moment, Alice's confident cheer faltered. Amelia is making up her mind. We still have a few things to say to each other, but I expect that... The door to the dining room swung open. Alice and Rosalind turned their heads to see Kate Leverton walk gingerly into the room. She wore a rather wrinkled dress of blue-sprigged muslin, trimmed with ribbons and three tiers of ruffles. She looked pale but seemed steady on her feet. Good morning, said Kate. I'm sorry if I'm intruding, but I really could not stay in bed another minute. I'm afraid I snuck out while Amelia was busy. She smiled, and Rosalind had the feeling she was trying the expression on to see how it was received. Well, it's good to see you on your feet, said Alice, before Rosalind was able to speak. However, you'd better sit now. Alice got up and brought another chair to the breakfast table. We don't want any dramatic slumping to the floor and so on. Thank you. Kate sat and Rosalind rang the bell. Amelia appeared a moment later. She stared at Kate, very surprised and more than a little accusing. Kate tried to cover her blush by helping herself to the last slice of toast. Can you tell Mrs Singh we'll need another egg, please, said Rosalind, and some more toast. Yes, miss, murmured Amelia. She retreated quickly and let the door slam behind her. Kate winced. I'm delighted to see you so much better, said Rosalind. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Tea, if you please, answered Kate, with sugar, if there is any. Rosalind poured her a cup, and Alice pushed the sugar bowl toward her. We're a bit informal here in the mornings. So is my aunt, said Kate. I'm very used to it. She helped herself to three large lumps of sugar. Rosalind felt her teeth begin to ache in sympathy. As she stirred, Kate asked... I was wondering if I might borrow paper and pen. I need to write to my mother. Excellent, said Alice. You can use the table in my book room. Thank you, said Kate, with only the slightest hesitation. There might be some other letters too, to my friends in Edinburgh to let them know I've been delayed. Is that still your plan? inquired Alice. To go to Edinburgh? It's either that or go home, said Kate. And I'm not ready to go home. Rosalind watched Kate in silence for a moment. She could tell Kate felt her scrutiny and was trying not to squirm or blush. Will you leave without speaking to Mr Davenport? Rosalind asked her. I'll enclose a note for him when I write to my mother. Kate spoke quickly, as if she'd expected the question and had her answer all ready. And your aunt? Kate swallowed. I don't know what I would tell her. It was, Rosalind thought, the first unguarded thing she'd said since she'd come to the table. But I'll write her as well, to thank her for all she's done. Well, that seems to be settled, said Alice. If Kate heard the undercurrent in Alice's words, she ignored it. Yes, I hope to be on my way within a few days, a week at the most. Edinburgh is quite a distance, said Rosalind, and you will be alone. I've made the trip before, Kate assured her, I'm familiar with all the stages, and I made sure I had enough money before I left. So, she took a deep breath. I know it's not the done thing, but there's really nothing to worry about. I'm only sorry to have imposed upon you for so long. Amelia's friends are more than welcome here, 
said Rosalind. At this, Kate's cheeks turned bright pink. Of course, Alice noticed as quickly as Rosalind did. Have you let her know your plans? We have not had much of a chance to speak, murmured Kate, clearly disconcerted to be in the company of people who would refer openly of her association with a parlour maid. Well, as long as you're tidying things up, I think you'd better, said Alice, frankly. That is, unless you plan to take her with you. Kate started badly. Tea sloshed from her cup. Oh, dear! Alice passed her a napkin. My own fault, murmured Kate. Rosalind rose from the table. You will excuse me. I also have some correspondence I must attend to. Miss Leverton, once you have written those letters to your family, Miss Littlefield will see that they are delivered. Oh, I wouldn't want to, began Kate. But Alice was already waving her words away. You all...